I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area and pay respects to the elders, past and present, of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Senators, I invite you, as I read the prayer, to pray or reflect in your own way on your responsibilities to the people of Australia and to future generations. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament and that thou would be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. <coughs> Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? Call yes, the clerk. President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on the dynamic red. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Yes, President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item four of today's order of business. An additional proposal has been lodged by the Joint Standing Committee on Migration for private meetings um, today and on Wednesday, the 30th of November. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. The question is that the committees be authorised to meet during the sittings of the Senate today. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Uh, senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. Uh, I move that the following bills be considered this week at the time for private senators' bills. A. The Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the indoctrination of children, Bill 2020, today, and the uh, <coughs> Restoring Territory Rights, Bill 2022, on Thursday, uh, 24th of November 2022. Put the question. If the question say aye, against no, the ayes have it. Clark. Private Senators' Bills, Order of the Day number 15, Australian Education Legislation Amendment Prohibiting the indoctr Indoctrination of Children, Bill 2020, Resumption of Second Reading Debate. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I rise to speak on One Nation's Australia Education Legislation Amendment Prohibiting the Indoctrination of Children, Bill 2022. The purpose of this legislation is to give parents the legal right to protect their children from indoctrination at school. This bill is aimed at ensuring schools and teachers do what they're supposed to do rather than what many of them are doing today. They are supposed to educate our children. They are not supposed to indoctrinate them with Marxism. They are not supposed to groom them into believing they can be a boy one day and a girl the next. They are not supposed to recruit them as warriors for climate change or social justice. They are, these are not decisions that Australians must only make for themselves when they are old enough. At school age, they are not old enough. But they are very easily influenced and with their education system thoroughly infiltrated by activists and disturbing concepts about race, climate and gender grounded in disproven neo-Marxist theories, our kids are leaving school without the education they need. The system is infiltrated by teachers who themselves have been indoctrinated in woke universities. Only last week we saw a story in which university students' assignments were marked down just because they haven't included an acknowledgement of country. And it's hurting our kids. During COVID lockdowns, when schools closed down and parents had to help educate kids with the assistance of education departments, many parents were shocked to discover the indoctrination going on. They discovered their children were being indoctrinated with values and concepts that could not they could not possibly share. They discovered their children were being told they were evil, racist oppressors just because they were white and that they should feel shame and remorse for it. 
They discovered their children were being groomed into believing they could choose their own gender at a whim, at a whim biology be damned. They found their children were being terrorised by cl climate change prophecies of doom. And this is what is happening, and I'll refer to an article here. What was happening in schools? Colouring in posters given to year one students at a New South Wales primary school accusing Australians of genocide have been called indoctrination and propaganda. The posters, promoted as part of NADOC week at a primary school in central west New South Wales and displayed on a school's hall, sparked a complaint by a parent and were raised by New South Wales Parliament by One Nation's Mark Latham. The posters depict raised fists and state, white Australia has a black, black, um, a black history, no pride in genocide, stop the lies, stop stealing our kids, black lives matter. This is what's been told, taught in our schools by these people pushing their own ideology and their own agenda. In another school, a mother was concerned that um, at uh, sending her child to um, these childcare centres until she realised, and then her feelings were feeling sideswiped by the news of Ida Hobbit Day at the daycare. I called the centre manager. I was informed that not only was Rainbow Day on the agenda, this is children we're talking about, under five years of age. But that LGBTQ material was a part of the children's curriculum. Give me a break. We're talking about a person's sex or their sexual preferences, and we're, we're teaching the kids this. Let the children grow up and be adults before yeah. they decide what we're, they're imposing. As I said, you know, we are opposed to pedophiles grooming children for what they want to um, do to our children. Why is this any different? Why is this not grooming our children at a very young age into what we are going to— we are confusing them of what they should be or shouldn't be, whether male or female, their sexual preference? I'm sorry, that doesn't happen to a child in school age or at five years of age or even younger. That is something they will decide later in life. It's not up to our educators or babysitters or childcare centres or anyone to actually do, um, do this. And this has been pushed by the Greens for years and years. These, this is all Greens. And the Labor Party has done exactly the same, headed down this path. And what I was told years ago, 20, nearly 30 years ago, by people who came to see me in my office, lecturers at the university were told that being conditioned, they had to teach a certain way, otherwise they wouldn't have their jobs. And that is exactly what is happening. Apart from this student who actually had to welcome to come country, acknowledgement to country, which has been rammed down our throats every time you turn around at a meeting, on the aeroplanes, this is all being rammed down our throats. And the fact is that Australians are fed up with it. So until we actually change what is happening, these people are destroying our children's little minds. Childcare centres are there to look after our children, not indoctrinate them, and in our school system, not to indoctrinate our kids with this garbage that you fed to them. Schools are there to teach um, social services, geography, history, and they're there to actually teach the kids most of all, which they are failing, is how to read and write. And it's absolutely disgraceful that you want to push this agenda. And as his mother said, she went on to say, now I'm very supportive of adults making their own decisions about how they live their lives, but it is wholly unacceptable to use children to make a group of adults feel validated about their own decisions and sexual way in life. And that, how true is that? We are allowing these adults to validate their own um, feelings, their own sexuality, and we're pushing that on. Even here in Australia, where we have seen the debate about transgender, in the 2016 census, there was only 1,200 people in Australia who identified as transgender. 
But no, we've got to change our whole society. Those people feel transgender or well, they have their, um, their issues. You don't change what is the normal, the norm, with the rest of the world or the country just because we've got to make a few people feel good about themselves or make them inclusive. This is about a common sense approach that we don't change the way of thinking for a few out there. We don't change the way that because you, you don't know whether you're male or female, so, no wonder that so many kids are confused. I was just talking to my eight-year-old grandson and I said, are you told at school that you can be a boy or a girl? And he's an eight-year-old boy, I can tell you. He said, oh yes, we're told. We can actually choose whether we want to be male or female. We actually had a, a kid come to school five years in grade five and he dressed as a girl. And I said, how do you feel about that? He said, we all know he's a boy. We don't know why he dressed as a girl. So he said, and he said, I'm totally confused by it. That's what you're doing to our kids and you're allowing this to happen. And what I would say to, to parents out there is um, parents need to start to wake up to themselves. I think they are. Parents are, are sort of saying to me, what can we do about it? That's why they're contacting Mark Latham, who's a voice for this. I'm a voice for this. Malcolm Roberts has been a voice for this. Very few people are actually speaking out about these things that really are standing up to, to try and push back. They had a real issue in the UK about all this that's going on, indoctrination of kids in school, even the climate change debate that's going on at the moment, the lies, the absolute lies, the agenda that's been pushed. And you're not actually um, telling people the truth to give them uh, an, um, a balanced view about this. Critical race theory has been brought into our educational system. Psychologists' training must actually learn about critical race theory and they have to acknowledge that they are white and they, are you know, they have been the suppressors of the black race in this nation. That's what they have to tell them. And, they, and this is what's been taught in school. And like I said, are oh, the interaction from the Greens and they're saying, yes, they should. You know, this is, all oh, right, this is really good. Thank you for the interaction because I've been pushing this. You are misleading the people of this nation. You are teaching them stuff that is not the real truth. You're not giving a balanced view with it. You're pushing your own ideology and your own agenda, which is destroying our nation. Hansen, no wonder the Senator people. Hansen, through me, through the chair. To the chair. Thank you. So. Educators argue there is no need for legislation to protect children from indoctrination because school children can use their critical thinking skills. That's a cop out because students are no match for an adult using their position of power to instruct and the children can't answer them back. Parents have the responsibility to decide how the children will be educated, provided it is in the best interests of the children. Parents want their children educated, not indoctrinated. Firstly, the bill seeks to prevent indoctrination by placing an obligation on the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority to develop a balanced curriculum for states and territories to adopt. This is currently not the case in many subject areas, including climate. And I'll tell you why. The teachers are complaining they don't get the assistance or the help from the education departments and what curriculums. They are struggling to come up with curriculums. That's why they are, need help from the education departments. We need a broad-based curriculum for the schools to actually ensure that they are teaching um, our kids correctly. Yeah. We've, got, we've got teachers coming out of the universities that can't even read and write properly themselves. They're putting into the educational system and they, they are not up to the standards. And this is why we have a failure with many kids not being able to read and write. Our teachers need assistance, they need help, but we have to ensure they are up to the job of teaching the kids in our educational system. If they were up to the job, we wouldn't have the failure that we are having at the moment. Nearly half of our kids at 15 years of age are more than two years behind in the educational system of our counterparts in Singapore and China. Why? Why is that the case? Because they are not being properly taught. We have changed our curriculums from the years gone by when I attended school 
and it has, has now failed our kids. It needs to change. And I call on parents, get some backbone about you. It's your children we are talking about, the future generations of this nation. They must have the, the right to critical thinking. They must have the right to question this. We must have a balance of both sides of the argument. And as I went into this with the about the especially about climate science. Now the curriculum says most agree that human activity is responsible for the majority of measured global warming. Climate science is far from settled, however, and with no one knowing the climate sensitivity to increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Secondly, the bill seeks to tie federal education funding to the existence of state and territory legislation and prohibits indoctrination in schools. The gender fluidity theory is widely taught in schools, even thought, though it is a medical and scientific fact that inheritance from your father of a Y chromosome makes you a biological male which can never be changed, and inheritance of an X chromosome from your father makes you a biological female. So no one can actually change that. Even today, for people who ask, what is a female, and they're you know, tripping over their bloody lower jaw because they don't even know how to answer the question, what is a female? How ridiculous have we got to? The bureaucrats sitting there, uh, um, oh, look, I'm not going to answer that question. It might actually upset the Greens or the Labor Party or those, those ones who are my bosses that have got their jobs here because we pushed this ideology and this agenda. That's how stupid it's got to. So, you know, it's, it's up to us as legislators, and if we sit here and listen to the claptrap that comes out of the Greens' mouth with all this bloody rubbish that they're pushing about gender fluidity and identity and LGBTIQ and 39 plus, I don't know how many there is, I can't believe it, um, how many um, sexual identities they want to um, impose on people, but that the bottom at the end of the day, we are male, we are female. We both play our own roles in our society, and that's who we are. Let the children grow up. Let them decide their own sexual preference, uh, whether it's or whatever they want, at an age. Don't even put them under the knife for this castration of destroying their bodies. That's allowed. And if you speak out against that, you actually can be taken to the courts or fined. Well, that's a ridiculous point as well. Children, let them be children. Parents, you know, grow up yourselves and be parents and take responsibility yeah. for, your, for your own children and what they're taught. And if you know, don't like what they're being taught, then go and visit the schools and the teachers and the principals and have your say. Yeah. Yeah. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Uh, thank you, Acting um, Deputy President. I rise to speak to the Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the indoctrination of children's bill 2020. And I will keep my remarks brief because we have already wasted enough time on this disgraceful bill. Senator Hansen, honestly, give it a rest. You are making a fool of yourself. And you are, what you are Senator doing Faruqi, is despicable. Senator Faruqi, through me, please, through me, let's keep yes. the debate respectful. Through you, Chair. Senator Hansen first introduced this legislation back in 2020. The Senate inquired into it then, and its conclusion didn't leave, leave room for any interpretation. The committee said it was poorly drafted, vague, inconsistent. In short, it is bad legislation. But in addition to being bad legislation in a technical sense, this bill is just vile. It is transphobic. It is anti-science. It is an attempt to force a rewrite of the curriculum to require teaching of climate denialism and harmful, outdated ideas of gender and sexuality. Exactly. In the dying days of the Scott Morrison government, the then education minister shamefully also took a leaf out of Pauline Hanson's One Nation playbook and started waging offensive, pathetic, toxic history and culture wars. You know what one of my favorite things about the 2022 election is? And there are many. One of my favorite things about the 2022 election is that along with the coalition, the 2022 election has rendered Senator Hansen and One Nation irrelevant. Like the coalition, 
Senator Hansen has failed to self-reflect on why one nation has become irrelevant. And I'll save her the time. They are irrelevant because their racist, divisive politics are there for everyone to see. And if you need evidence, just look around in this chamber or the other chamber. Both places are more progressive and more diverse than ever before. Senator Hansen is irrelevant because the Australian public realizes that it's not immigrants that are making their life hard. The Australian public realizes it's not trans people that are making their life hard. It's not climate science that make, that's making their life hard. It's not First Nations people that are making their life hard. It is unscrupulous big corporations, fossil fuel giants, billionaires, and far-right politicians like One Nations sitting here that are making their life hard. Going back to the bill, the bill amends the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority Act 2008 to require ACARA to ensure the school education, that school education provides what Senator Hansen considers a balanced presentation of opposing views on political, historical, and scientific issues. It also amends the Australian Education Act 2013 to make financial assistance to states and territories conditional on them prohibiting what Senator Hansen calls indoctrination in schools. Such complete rubbish. Students should be encouraged to think critically and they should be exposed to diverse viewpoints and perspectives. But that's not what this bill seeks to do. This bill is a vile, unsubtle, blatant attempt to force schools to spread ridiculous and cooked One Nation beliefs, which would harm trans and gender diverse students and introduce anti-science concepts into classrooms around the country, and not be able to tell people in this country the history of how violent settlement took place and how we need to reconcile with that history. All trans people and children want is the right to live their lives with respect and dignity, to be who they are, like other people are able to do in this country. The restoring of this bill is a sad reflection that after all this time, Senator Hansen remains a peddler of sad and hateful politics inside and outside this chamber, spreading ignorant prejudices. This bill and Senator Hansen's outdated hateful views should be comprehensively rejected by the parliament. They should both go in the bin. It's vital that every child learns the realities of the climate crisis, the truth of Australia's settler colonial past, and how to have respectful relationships in context of comprehensive sex education. Senator Farrell. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Acting uh, President. Um, just see if I can. Deputy President, yes. Just it is. Thank you. Um, this is the uh, reintroduction of a bill that Senator Hanson introduced uh, two years ago. At that time, Labor opposed uh, this bill, and the bill does not support <coughs> evidence-based teaching. There remains a question of uh, constitutionality and uh, Commonwealth uh, overreach. <coughs> Acting uh, Deputy, uh, sorry, Deputy President, <coughs> The version of the curriculum signed off by the former government in this April this year supports evidence-based teaching of literacy and numeracy. The bill that has been presented to the Senate today does not do anything to enhance the teaching or learning of the foundational skills parents want for their children. At the time of the initial introduction of the then 
Department of uh, Education, Skills and Employment uh, made a submission to the Senate Education Employment Legislation Committee as part of the committee's inquiry into the bill. The department's submission detailed the operational challenges posed if the bill were to be enacted, citing lack of clarity about core issues, potential legal risks and overreach by the Commonwealth in directing the way that states and territories provide education to students. <coughs> and I quote from the conclusion of the department's uh, submission. The broad scope of the amendment set out in the bill and the limited definition of key terms presents several issues. The submission then goes on to say, and I quote, the requirements of the bill may present unintended consequences. The Senate committee, chaired by uh, Senator McGrath at the time, went on to recommend that the Senate does not pass the bill. Doing so, the committee report uh, says, the committee is concerned that the lack of specificity in the bill could increase the risks of legal challenges and may result in unintended consequences in areas beyond the original intent. <coughs> the committee is also concerned that the bill would result in significant uh, overreach by the uh, Commonwealth Government into the day-to-day -day operations of schools which, under constitutional arrangements, are the responsibility of the states and the territories. Deputy President, uh, we would prefer that the Senate spend its time doing useful work rather than reconsidering a bill that has already been found to present significant legal and operational issues. Senator Orman Payne. Thank you, Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Australian Education Legislation Amendment prohibiting the indoctrination of children bill 2020. I feel like I'm uniquely placed to speak to this bill. I've been a state secondary school teacher for nearly 30 years. I started out my career as a health and physical education teacher, and I also taught sexuality, human relationships uh, and sexual education. I'm also qualified to teach secondary school science as well as humanities. When I left the department, I was a head of humanities and languages. This bill seeks to put restraints on what teachers of health and physical education and sexual education, science and humanities can teach in their classes. It's not about balance. It's about hate and propaganda. Mm. We, as teachers, teach to the curriculum that we are provided. It is a curriculum that is grounded in truth and science. We don't cherry pick the bits of science that we agree with or disagree with. We don't cherry pick the bits of history that we like and are hard to face. And we don't discriminate against the children who are in front of us in our classes. During this debate, I've watched people on the other side of the chamber laughing when we've spoken about education around students' gender. I invite you to come into a school and sit in front of a student who has made several attempts on their life because they have been subject to hate and transphobia. How dare you use our young people as political footballs? They are not wanting anything except to be accepted for who they are. We teach a curriculum that is grounded in human rights and science. 
Young people are generous of spirit, they are accepting of others, and they care about the planet and their future. They are critical thinkers and they are problem solvers, and they deserve an education that is grounded in truth and justice and human rights. They deserve an education that is grounded in science. It is not teachers in schools who are attempting to indoctrinate our young people, a profession that works hard to give every young person in this country the positive future that they deserve. It is the people on the other side of this chamber who are seeking to indoctrinate their hateful and bigoted views in our schools. I will not subject young people in this country to your bigotry and hate. I will stand up every time I see it and the Greens will call it out. This bill isn't about critical thinking. This bill is about legislating a far-right curriculum and individual senators and parties interfering in what is taught in our schools instead of leaving it to the education experts is a very slippery slope. In the US, we see some states banning teachers from teaching about racism or sexuality, and some are even banning books. This bill is dangerous. And as a teacher with over 30 years' experience in our schools, it is an injustice to the young people in our schools and it is an insult to teachers. Thank you, Senator Orman Payne. Senator Antti. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak uh, in relation to the Australian Education Legislation Amendment uh, prohibiting the indoctrination of children, Bill 2020. And I have occasionally taken the opportunity uh, in this building to explore how far the capture of government departments by leftist ideology has gone. Um, in this place, we see all the time that top health bureaucrats can't tell you what a woman is, they can't tell you whether a man can get pregnant or not. It's actually quite surreal coming into this place sometimes. But sadly, it's, it's not just our health department that's controlled by radical leftism. Australia's education system is another domain in which common sense and Australian values are under attack. The education system, of course, has always been of vital importance to the so-called progressively progressive revolutionary idea. The radical left understands that for people to accept their absurd ideas and their ideology, that they're obsessed with power structures and group identity based on race, class, sex, religion, and that they have to indoctrinate children from an early age. To, this, to them, this is the purpose that schooling serves. This institutional capture of the education system by leftist, socialist, intersectional ideology has been devastating to the social well-being of this country, and I'd argue to the lives of young people in general who are tragically more depressed and more worried about the future than they ever have been before. As I've said before, we failed to instil in our young people a sense of meaning, purpose and understanding of their great heritage, and it's wrong that Australian children are denied the genuine opportunity to meaningfully study our past and learn from its wisdom. We've seen Australian British history virtually removed from the curriculum in recent times, and wherever it's presented, it's done so with a sense of shame and a sense of regret. Um, it's almost as though Australians ought to be ashamed of our great British heritage, which brought us philosophy, literature, religion, a justice system, and all the other benefits that European civilisation brought to this country. And yes, of course, there are tragedy and sometimes even cruelty associated with colonialisation, but to guilt trip Australian students into believing that their heritage is a racist one is simply cruel and unjust and untrue, and it's a terrible thing to do to our next generation. Australian students are being denied a true and balanced understanding of their history in, in favour of a false ideological vi vision designed to portray anything that is European as inherently racist and evil. This couldn't be further from the truth. It's because, our Christian because of our Christian heritage that we have the concept of social justice at all. And it's because of our, our Christian heritage 
uh, that the notion, this notion which ended slavery in Britain, that all people are made in the image of God regardless of their race, gender or class. Now, when this bill states that political, historical and scientific issues must be taught in a balanced manner, I take it to mean that the task of teaching is to be done without seeking to indoctrinate our children into a rev revolutionary world view. Um, and I see it as being uh, not trying to present them with this ideology, but rather presenting them with arguments and counter-arguments, teaching students to rely on reason and evidence. In other words, that students are taught how, not what to think. And of course, the, the, the views of resentful revolutionaries can't stand in such an environment because they're not true. They don't hold up when the evidence is presented or when students are actually allowed to think without being guilt-tripped. It's not, a, it's not only the history cur curriculum that's affected. Schools have regrettably become a vehicle for so-called sexual liberation ideology. And again, the left understands that to overcome the stigma associated with their views, they must normalise concepts like gender identity from a very young age. The reason that the left must nor normalise untrue concepts as early as possible is so that they, they can interfere with what children would otherwise learn from their more sensible parents. The left don't respect the authority of parents to pass on traditional common sense beliefs to their children, nor do they view education as a journey of becoming disciplined, competent, flourishing individuals who want to contribute to their society. Instead, to them, schools have become mere training grounds for political indoctrination and the building of a voter demographic for years to come. Now, I've collated seven different complaints from concerned parents around South Australia about what their children are learning in public and, in some cases, private schools. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, there are so many more, but here are just a few. Number one, my nine-year-old daughter attends an eastern suburbs primary school, and the other day the kids learned all about sex with boys in the class. Seriously. Number two, my daughter was in class, year seven, eastern suburbs school, and a teacher played the ABC's BTN behind the news, which always tells them to live in a state of alarm. On one occasion, the presenter suggested the kids should protest for BLM. They should protest for climate change, against misogyny and everything in between, and finish off by protesting at the dinner table, if you don't mind. Protest. Activism. I have a suggestion. It's called education. That's what our taxes pay for. Do this out of school hours. Number three, why should I put my kids in a place where they are taught to hate themselves and see the world through a depressing lens. I never imagined I'd pull my kids out of school. Something is very sick in our children and youth. Someone needs to do something. I'm a mum, number four. I'm a mum with a daughter in year nine at a Christian school here in South Australia. She was in class last, last term and the teacher started talking about anal sex. My daughter was so uncomfortable. Then the teacher said that the students could face each other and ask any question they liked. How is my daughter meant to feel safe? You are teaching kids that there are no boundaries in discussions. What has this topic got to do with education? My daughter didn't feel safe. Her dignity as a young person was not respected. Unacceptable. Number five, my daughter was in a small Catholic school. The grade two teacher asked the kids to draw female and male body parts. She refused to do this activity. If my daughter was at a friend's place or an uncle's, I would be horrified. I pulled my kids out of those schools. Number six, my son was asked to lie down on the ground and imagine he had breasts and female genitalia. Number seven, my son was asked to write an essay imagining that he was a girl. Pointless, woke, rubbish. The education in this system has been taken over by radical leftist revolutionaries like the storming of the Bastille. Your children are being indoctrinated, not educated, and parents in this country need to wake up. Thank you, Senator Antic. Senator Pratt. In today's contribution to this debate, I simply want to put the words of Georgie Stone on the record because they are, as a young person, they're far more relevant to this debate than my own views. So I delivered this speech on her behalf. She's an incredible young woman, an Australian actress, writer and transgender rights advocate. She says, my name is Georgie. I'm a proud 22-year-old transgender woman from Melbourne. I'm here in Canberra to host a screening of my short documentary, The Dream Life of Georgie Stone, as part of a delegation of families, doctors, Transcend Australia, the Gender Centre, LGBTIQ Health Australia and other members of our trans community. 
My documentary, directed by the incredible Mayor Newell, I believe is the perfect catalyst for a trip to Parliament House to invite you to not only stand in solidarity but actively support one of the most vulnerable and marginalised communities in Australia, trans kids. When I was a kid, my favourite thing to do was to play with my brother Harry in the backyard or in the park near our house. Harry and I would run excitedly into the bushes, pretending we were escaping into a fantasy world and going on adventures. Sometimes we'd rope our parents into our games or even our poor old dog, Roxy. As I started primary school, these adventures became even more important to me. I didn't realise how appealing a fantasy world would look compared to the one I was living in. As a young trans girl, I grew up being taught that there was something wrong with me. From the bullying I endured at my first primary school to that same school refusing to support my transition to having to go to the Family Court of Australia three times to access medical treatment. I have spent years trying to convince adults that I was who I said I was and that my gender identity wasn't a fantasy or a game. I spent years carrying out carrying sorry other people's fears and doubts, expected to prioritize their feelings and well-being over my own. I spent years scared of growing up because the trans woman I saw in movies and shows were always portrayed as leading tragic lives. Whenever I watched the news, I would see trans kids being used as a political football, weaponised and dehumanised to generate fear and panic in the community. And all sides of politics can be complicit in this. Surely when people say, let kids be kids, this is not what they mean. There were, however, some key factors that helped me get through the darkest of times. The first is that I had a beautiful, supportive family around me. I always knew that no matter what happened at school, I could always come home safe and feel loved. My family were a constant source of strength and love when I was struggling. In circumstances when I couldn't fight for myself, they stepped in and advocated for me. The second was access to gender-affirming care. Going to the gender service at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne was integral to my health and well-being. I met doctors who were compassionate and listened without judgment. Doctors who knew how to look after me. The medical sector can be frustrating and a sometimes dangerous place for trans people, so access to specialised care is vital. Access to family support services can make all the difference for trans kids. Yet these organisations are severely underfunded Australia-wide. This impacts the work they do and limits the access to the support they provide. Most organisations are run at a gra grassroots level by volunteers and they are self-funded, but we can't do this alone anymore. Without proper funding, vulnerable children are falling through the cracks. Trans youth are much more likely to suffer from mental health issues such as depression or anxiety. Trans people between 14 and 25 are 15 times more likely to attempt suicide. This is not because we're trans. We're not the problem. The problem is marginalisation a lack of family support, lack of access to gender-affirming health care and threats of violence and harassment, which is why we need your help. An urgent boost in funding for specialist family support services will better equip them in supporting families of trans kids. The more support trans kids and their families have access to, 
the further we can reduce the risk factors that are contributing to the prevalence of mental health issues impacting trans youth. With family support behind me and access to gender-affirming healthcare, I was finally able to look to the future and to not be afraid. As I entered my late teens, I was excited by the prospect of not just surviving, but of thriving. That's all I've ever wanted, not to be doubted or shunned, not to be bullied or attacked, not to be weaponised or feared, just to live, just to live happily and safely, to go to school and focus on learning, to be ambitious and excited for the future, to have agency over my own life, to love and to be loved. I think back to myself as a child and my heart aches for her. I wish I didn't have to spend so much of my childhood fighting for my rights. I wish that when I played with my brother it wasn't laced with escapism and longing. I wish I didn't spend so much time trying to make myself smaller for other people's comfort. The solution was really quite simple. If adults truly listened to me and I was able to be myself, then I could have just lived my life. The trauma I've experienced in my life didn't happen because I'm trans. It sprouted from other people's fear and ignorance. Every roadblock and pothole I've encountered on the road to adulthood hasn't been of my own making. Trans people are not the problem. And with your help, I have hope for the future that the next generation of kids won't have to fight so hard, that they can just live. The road ahead is treacherous for families of trans kids, but it doesn't have to be. Together, we can pave a safe one for those yet to come. Thank you, Georgie. Thank you, Senator Pratt. Senator Rennick. Thanks, uh, Acting Deputy uh, Madam President. And I rise to speak to this bill today, and I have to be honest, I haven't even read the bill, um, and I don't really want to be talking about it. But in regards to um, some of the comments, I just want to uh, beg your pardon? Order, Senators. Yeah, sorry, can you not interject, please? Like, you know, do you mind? This is a chamber. There's rules and things. Order, hey? Senators. So, Senator Rennick, please. You haven't heard what I said yet. So, just could you please, with, you know, could you please stop interjecting? Okay. I, I just, you know, look. I, I, you know, some of the comments in here about hatred and all of that, you know, are just, just, it's just totally unfounded. There seems to be a big missing ingredient here in terms of um, transgender children, and that is the role of the parent. Now, I've got children. If they have issues about their sexuality, and I've said this before, I will deal with it with a properly trained psychologist outside of the school hours. Now, with the greatest of respect to teachers, and I have great respect for teachers, they've got enough on their plate. Um, they're not necessarily qualified or trained to deal with issues, because this is not just about sexuality. This is obviously about uh, the way they feel, and the parents need to have a role in this. And when this becomes, you know, something that's dealt with in the school without the actual parents having any um, oversight of what's going on, that's when, in my view, this becomes an issue. Because I strongly believe in the role of parents. I'm a parent myself. So, um, you know, and as I said before, rightly, teachers often follow the curriculum. But the point is, is a lot of this curriculum is actually made from bureaucrats who you know, work in government circles. So it is a government issue. Um, personally, I'd be much happier if teachers didn't have the bureaucrats in the curriculum telling them what to do and let teachers actually deal with the students because they are the ones who know how to deal with the students the best. Um, they know the student, they'll know the parent, uh, and I'd rather keep the bureaucrats in the curriculum right out of it altogether, um, which is why you know, uh, I, I think um, and, I, and I accept the comments over there before because teachers are, are told to follow the curriculum, and I don't like that. I think you know because I, most teachers I know genuinely have the interests of the child at heart. Um, but I, I believe that education is a three-way thing. It's between the teacher, the parent, and the child, and it's very important that the parent has interaction with the teacher as well as the children. 
uh, so that parents know what's going on. Uh, just in reply to one of those other comments that we have to teach them climate science, I disagree with that remark as well. We have to teach them science, uh, and that involves all aspects of science, including mathematics, uh, which underpins a lot of science. So to say that we teach them climate science when most of it's actually based on modelling and not based on the traditional methods of uh, cause and effect and demonstrating cause and effect and quantifying cause and effect. Um, I know myself when I've had to, you know, dig out my textbooks, my own school textbooks, when dealing with climate science. It's actually the science of heat is actually called thermodynamics. Uh, you know, you deal with quantum uh, mechanics uh, with the photons, which comes from the sun. So to teach them all about climate science and how the world's going to suddenly, you know overheat by two degrees in the next 10 years without actually teaching them the foundations of basic science, of basic mathematics, et cetera, et cetera, is a very dangerous thing. So that's why we've got to come back to basics. Uh, and I'm not having a go, maybe that's in the curriculum. I haven't read it. And, and I'll just touch on one other thing. Uh, you know, I, I've often been criticised that I'm in no position to talk about the Bureau of Meteorology and their record keeping and what would I know because I'm not a science scientist. Well, that just goes to show how the, the, the slogan science is used way too often uh, in, um, you know, to justify the, any, any argument, because at the end of the day, taking a temperature measurement and recording that data is actually record keeping. It's got nothing to do with science. It is simply about recording the temperature, storing that, um, and then not going back and changing it 100 years later, because it doesn't suit your agenda. Uh, and now, as you know, the Bureau of Meteorology just admitted in this recent round of estimates, they've got four different data sets. Uh, well, you know, and um, they've homogenised these the three. They've got the raw data set, which rarely ever gets reported anymore. So, long long story short, some of some of the the comments in here today, I think, have uh, tried to um, politicise the very thing that they think that uh, you know that the bill is trying to do. Quite frankly, I, I want ideology out, out of um, education altogether, whether it's right wing or left wing. I, I don't really care. I just want children to be children, uh, and I want the, the, the primacy of the parent to remain in their upbringing. And it's the relationship between the parent, the child, and the teacher that matters the most. And that's something that I, I just, I, you know, I was an older father, and I took a couple of years off to stay at home, and I. And this is why I really believe in, you know, ideally having a stay-at-home parent. Because I know when I used to go up and pick the my, my children up from school, you know, and I saw the teacher not every day, but often you'd see them at three o'clock. Uh, you know, if you ever had an issue, you could just speak to them informally about it. You got to know other parents uh, of the children in the class. Um, you, know, you got to go drinking with some of them. Um, but uh, you know, it, it's so. So, you know, at the end of the day, I, I don't want education to be something where it's it's pushed down from above by the bureaucrats, many of whom you know, who do have um, agendas or, or you know, preset ideology. I want children to be children. I want the, the primacy of the family um, and the interaction of the community, uh, both in— you know, and I, I went up and I read to children. My wife still goes up. She's, uh, and I'll give a shout out to Story Dogs. Um, that's where, basically, you take your dog uh, into the classroom. Uh, so a big shout out to Rocket. Um, she loves that. And, and it basically helps children um, uh, you know, feel comfortable because they've got a pet there. So, you know, and it's that community. I mean, and, and I should acknowledge my own father, who was uh, PNC, a chair of the kindergarten PNC for about four years, and then he was chair of the state high school in Chinchilla uh, there for about another seven years. And it's very, very important to have your community uh, be heavily involved um, with with education. Likewise, with fates, um, with tuck shops. All of those type of things, of course, your PNC meetings. I was myself for a short time uh, president of uh, my own uh, son's PNC, uh, school, PNC there, um, and that's 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 why I wanted to speak today. I mean, as I said, I'm not interested in the bill because it's all about you know. Well, I am to the extent that I want it. I want the bureaucrats and I want government out of education, and I want education to be a grassroots thing where it's driven by the love of both the teachers to their children, and I know teachers become very fond of their children. I have great memories of my own teachers. Um, and I should, should also acknowledge um, you know, my great-great-aunt, who uh, um, got a Bachelor of Arts in 1920 from University of Queensland, and she went on to teach uh, maths and physics at All Hallows 
uh, in, in Brisbane and has now, uh, now got the hall named after him. She taught maths and physics up till 70. My own grandmother, um, my great aunt's niece, who got a Bachelor of Arts in 1930, she went on to be a teacher. She taught before the war and after the war. Um, and of course, my own aunt, uh, who also uh, is, is, was a teacher, uh, became a librarian. And unbeknownst to me, when I went to University of Queensland, I was actually a fourth generation graduate of University of Queensland, um, and it's only realised later on that uh, they are all women above me uh, who got a degree. And unlike my grandfather, who topped maths in the public service exam in New South Wales in 1911, he went back to be a farmer. So I'll just throw that in. So education is very important, but it has to be driven by you know individual needs of the students, um, and 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 you know I think that's what matters. So you know the sentiment of the bill that you know I just want government out of our everyday lives. And I want family and communities and grassroots measures to, be, to, to look after our children, because every child is, is precious and every ch child is an individual. And, that, you know, and this is one of the things why you know, I'm very proud to be an LNP, because it's the dignity and worth of every individual, and it's the family values uh, that the family is the basis of all things here. And that is why um, I don't want any of this talk and we're all doing this for hate and we've got political agendas. I have no political agenda. I want, I want politics right out of raising my children. I want them to have the best childhood they can without the toxicity of politics. And I even say to the young LNP people, you know, kids in the young LNP, I tell them, don't get in the young LNP. I said, do yourself a favour and go and listen to Pink Floyd's 1973 Dark Side of the Moon album, where it says 10 years gone and no one had told me when the starting gun had happened. Even, even in your 20s, I don't want you being involved in politics. You know, when you're, when you're in your 20s, go out and, you know, get, get, get drunk, uh, you know, get Get you know do you know get to understand women better, uh, get rich, travel the world. I mean these are the things you know. Come back to politics when you're in your 40s and you've you've lived the life and you can actually throw yourself into it. Um, and I guess that's the thing. You know it's this slow creep of government, uh, whether it's education or you know whatever it is. It's like we just want government out of our lives and we want the innocent you know the innocence of childhood to stay just like it is. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Stilljohn. Thank you. Uh, in con it, was, it was not my intention to contribute to, uh, to this debate, um, not only because of the fantastic contributions already made uh, by uh, my colleague Senator Faruqi, a proud uh, woman of colour, um, not only uh, that but also the fantastic contribution of my uh, con colleague Senator Alman Payne, who has been a teacher uh, for 30 years and is probably more qualified than anybody in this building to refute the absolute nonsense that has been scraped together in this piece of legislation. Um, but I, I have been moved to speak to this bill as a young person and as the Greens mental health spokesperson because of the content of some of these contributions. Now let's be really clear what this is. This is a bill that has been brought before this chamber uh, by people who wish to uh, force uh, into community debate about some of the most important issues that can be discussed right now in our community, that is being discussed right now in our community the role of race and power in this country, the deep and urgent need to support queer kids, particularly trans kids, in school in this country. These are conversations which our community are engaged with, which our community are grappling with, which people are expending extraordinary emotional labour, educating, informing, healing, helping people to gain new views, taking incredible amounts of time and energy in the process. And these people are coming in here to exploit those conversations for their own political gain. And the worst part of it is, the very worst part of it is, is that these people that have contributed to this conversation so far today, at their core and at their base, don't actually care about these conversations. 
They don't actually care about these issues. They are simply trying to get attention for themselves. And that is why I have sat here so resistant to contribute to this conversation, because these people outside of this chamber, if not by the internal machinations of their own party, wouldn't be considered fit to run a lemonade stand in this country, let alone be one of its political decision makers. And yet here they are right now. And they are making these contributions regardless of what they actually think, but because they see political opportunity in it. So they brought something f here dripping with hate, dripping with transphobia and racism. Well, let me tell you what the reality of transphobia and racism is in modern day Australia. 63% of trans kids report self-harm. 43% have attempted suicide. Have you any idea what it's like to sit with a friend or to look at them across the table and see the scars on their arms? Or to talk with their mum as they share with you what it is like to sit with their kid in a hospital, wondering whether they're going to pull through, or what it is like to sit in a room of people, some of the most marginalised, some of the most courageous human beings I have ever met, as they sit across from overwhelmingly old, white, rich blokes and once again, for what must feel like the millionth time, justify their right to exist as they are and to ask for equal respect and treatment before the law of the community that they occupy. To have this chamber brought low to such purposes demeans it. This should be a space in which people work to support those courageous community conversations that are happening right now. This should be a place that works to support parents talking with their kids about concepts they might not have heard of before. It should be a place where we support communities to engage with the difficult conversations about the reality of our history, about the reality of what racism has done and is doing to communities across Australia. And instead, instead, we get this legislative filth, this legislative hate, contributed to by MPs who, before they made their contribution this afternoon, admitted they hadn't read the bill, didn't know the context, but just wanted to have a go anyway. Now, I will also say that, particularly in relation to the racist elements of this bill, and this is a deeply racist piece of legislation, what is happening here is a bunch of people who have felt themselves, and indeed have been, dominant in the decision-making spaces of Australia since its foundation as a national entity are feeling just a little bit of pressure, a little bit of pushing to not be the centre of attention all of the time, to be the primary decision maker in every conversation, and are terrified that children in schools might now have the opportunity to learn the truth of our history, not only in relation to race, but also in relation to the role that misogyny has played in Australian history and still plays in Australian society. One of these senators made an example. He read to the chamber what he felt was an outrageous uh, case of wokeism. And it was a teacher inviting their students to imagine what it would be like 
to be a different gender than them, to engage in a basic act of empathy. And yet these people, these men, come in here and denigrate empathy. They shame empathy. And in so doing, they reveal the hollowness of their own character. And it would be, you know, you'd be able to kind of write it off as this tiny little fraction of folks. But actuality and reality, these are the ones that are willing to say it out loud. These are the ones that are willing to put it on record. The sad shame of the moment is that in addition to these people, there are many in this place who either share their views or are unwilling when they hear them to challenge them. And that is not okay. Because right now in our community, people are putting their bodies and minds on the line to challenge these narratives. And they have a lot less structural and institutional power than an MP. So I challenge anyone and everybody that would oppose this bill today to do so behind closed doors with your colleagues. And finally, because I am under no illusion, and I am actually very thankful that there will not, I would imagine, be a single trans person in Australia, a single queer person in Australia, there will be very few people of colour that would watch the contributions of these people from One Nation, uh, from the LNP, uh, from uh, whatever le is left of the Palmer Party, and, and see them as a point of reference. So go, oh, we'll engage with these intellectual discussions being made with these individuals. I don't think that that's very likely. But what I do think, what I do think is likely is that these hate-filled contributions make their way onto social media platforms guided by algorithms put together by corporations whose sole purpose is to make profit, and they end up in front of the mums and dads and grandparents, particularly of trans kids. And so if any of those folks are watching along tonight, I want to bring you back to those statistics. 63% of trans kids and trans people have self-harmed. 43% attempted suicide. Now, if we look at prevention, what actually has a massive impact on reducing that figure is if that person has in their life one parent who supports them. The rate of suicide, the rate of self-harm plunges if they can identify somebody in their lives particularly a parent who loves them. So if you're watching these videos, if you've watched these contributions, if you're the parent to a wonderful, fantastic child who may be questioning their gender identity, who may have come fully and beautifully into a diverse gender identity, that may be experimenting and being part of those communities, embracing them with pride, then go and hug them and tell, you that you, tell them that you love them, because that is one of the best things that you can do to keep them safe and happy. Know that your child is fantastic. And if you are a trans person, if you are a person of colour, if you are anybody touched with this hate-filled filth, know that these are views that are not shared by the entirety of this chamber, and they are views which are actively and will be consistently opposed by the Greens every single step of the way. Have you finished, Senator Stewart? Yeah. Thank you. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak in support of Senator Hanson's bill, the Australian Education Legislation Amendment, prohibiting the indoctrination of children bill. I support that because I have been the president of a board 
of a Montessori school. I've been on the advisory board of the International Montessori Council, and I agree that the primacy of the family, but the, the tripartite role between parents, teachers and child in understanding education and supporting. I want to correct something, though. The previous speaker said, seems to be having imagination running wild, because he said, these men come in here. Well, Senator Hanson is a woman. She initiated this bill. She's a woman. During COVID, heavy-handed lockdowns forced children into learning from home, locked away from their friends and suffering through jerky attempts to teach through a Zoom screen. Of course, parents were locked up at home with their children as well, listening to their classes in, the way, in a way they never could before. Many were absolutely shocked as they heard the rubbish being taught to their children for the very first time. This bill tries to steer education back to the basics to give our children critical thinking skills and put the power back in parents' hands to make sure that's all they're being taught. The Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority would need to ensure in this bill to ensure education provides a balanced presentation of opposing views on political, historical and scientific issues. This bill, Senator Hanson's bill, would require that where opposing views exist, the Australian Curriculum Assessment and Reporting Authority is to ensure the teaching profession is provided with the information, resources and support required to provide a balanced presentation to students. Wonderful. Federal funding would be conditional on states and territories requiring schools and their staff to pr provide a non-partisan education to students while consulting with parents and guardians on the extent this has been achieved. One Nation has been trying to keep this in check with motions condemning the teaching of critical race theory and the curriculum erasing history because it's said to be too white or Christian. There are lots of examples showing that stronger action is needed, and I commend Senator Antic and the others who spoke here today on that very point. There is, though, for example, the Parkdale Secondary College, where students were told to stand up if they were straight, white, Christian males, and be humiliated by the class because they were quote, oppressors. Without trial, they're oppressors. Then there's Bow's Brow College, where the, all the boys were forced to stand up at assembly and apologise to all of the girls on behalf of their agenda. No specific crime was mentioned or identified for these boys to apologise for, except that they were the wrong gender. And only today, One Nation New South Wales leader Mark Latham has drawn our attention to Mount Kiringai Public School. They are feeding fiction to ch students about history, forcing them to learn a play where Captain Cook arrives with the first fleet in 1788 as a coloniser. For those who have forgotten history from their schooling, Captain Cook was long dead by the term time of the first fleet. This bill is necessary to stop examples like this infecting our children, return our teaching to the basics, restore balance to the way topics are presented and stop our s schools being indoctrination centres. This bill puts the teaching of balanced, critical analysis and parents in the driver's seat of children's education as they should be. I seek leave, Madam Acting Deputy President, to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator Roberts. The time for this debate has expired, so the Senate will now proceed to the consideration of government business. I call the clerk. Government business orders of day number one, offshore electricity infrastructure legislation amendment bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Dunningham. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Um, it's uh, my pleasure to rise to make a contribution on behalf of the opposition uh, on the offshore electricity infrastructure legislation amendment bill 2022. Uh, offshore energy infrastructure has the potential to create significant investment and job creation opportunities, as well as contribute to Australia's future energy security. That's why, in government, the coalition de delivered on a 2019 election commitment and passed legislation to enable the development of offshore electricity infrastructure and provided industry with certainty needed to invest in Australian offshore electricity infrastructure projects. This bill, the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021, established a regulatory framework that covers all phases of development, from construction through to decommissioning of generation and transmission projects. In the 2020-21 budget, the, government invested, the then government invested 
$4.8 million to, uh, into development of the legislative framework, including providing $2.9 million of seed funding for the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority and the National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administrator to develop policy, regulations, guidelines and advice to industry. Uh, additionally, we have provided $1.9 million to the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and Ge uh, Geoscience Australia for legal advice, marine spatial data collection and public consultation and drafting of regulations. This action was part of the Coalition's energy policy that kept the lights on and, importantly, uh, especially now, kept prices low. Households and businesses rely on affordable, reliable power to grow and to thrive. And as I said, this is more important now than ever. In government, we took decisive action to deliver affordable, reliable energy for Australian consumers, and that means having affordable, reliable, 24-7 supply of electricity. That plan was working. Under the coalition, electricity prices dropped to an eight-year low. When Labor was last in government, household electricity costs had doubled. Labor's back in power now, and electricity prices are again on the rise. Since coming to government, um, the Albanese government have failed Australian people on energy. In less than six months from coming to power, the government has walked away from a promise to the Australian people to reduce household energy bills by $275. I know from my own home state of Tasmania that was an important promise made by the now government, but one that has been completely abandoned. They demonised important gas projects that, uh, rather than competing with renewables, actually complemented them. They guillotined the Energy Security Board's capacity mechanism and took the extraordinary intervention of suspending the wholesale spot market, which shook the market and cost energy users more than $200 million. But what do you expect from a government that doesn't understand the difference between the wholesale price of energy and the retail price of energy? The government's 2022-23 budget shows Australians can expect a 50 per cent increase on their energy bills and 40 per cent increase on their gas bills in 2023 alone. This could be as much as $1,092 for some households, $2,450 for some uh, small businesses and an increase in gas bills of $602. Truly chilling, quite frankly, when you look at those numbers. Wholesale experts are currently $100 more more in New South. Uh, sorry, wholesale prices are currently more than $100 in New South Wales than the same time last year. And our expert energy bodies forecast reliability gaps and energy security risks for the next decade. Industry experts have also called the current energy transition a quote train wreck. Alinta's CEO Jeff Dimery said. I think we're headed for failure unless things change significantly. Energy Australia's CEO, Mark Collette, said, I'm more concerned about a smooth energy transition than a year ago. To deliver Labor's 82 per cent renewable energy target by 2030, Minister Bowen told the AFR Energy Summit that the country will require 47 megawatt wind turbines every month until the year 2030. They'll need also more than 22,500 uh, watt panels to be installed every day and 60 million of these panels by 2030. Labor plans also on uh, carpeting our regions with up to 28,000 kilometres of poles and wires through prime Australian agricultural land to connect these projects to the grid. Every dollar spent on transmission has to be repaid by the consumers, ultimately through higher electricity bills. Labor promised over and over that they would reduce electricity prices by $275, as I've already said. From the launch of their $275 cut policy, Labor made its promise and then repeated it and underlined it 96 times over. On a total of 97 occasions since early December, Labor has made this promise a centrepiece of its bid for government. But Labor is putting us on a path not only uh, leading to huge hikes in electricity and gas bills, but also on a path to less reliability of energy supply. Quite clearly, Labor simply can't be trusted to deliver sensible energy policy. On the issue of uh, social licence, um, the opposition, when in government, 
understood the importance of local communities granting a social licence to build major renewable projects, including transmission lines, that may have an impact on the community, properties and way of life, impact, uh, uh, way of, life of impacted residents. Sadly, though, this government does not understand it. It's good to have Senator Hanson Young Senator here. Senator Hanson Young, your turn's next. So, looking forward to it. Uh, the coalition is deeply concerned. The government is supercharging its renewable vision with little to no regard for Australia's regional towns and communities. On the issue of community consultation, offshore energy technologies such as wind could provide Australia with new investment and jobs growth, particularly in coastal regional communities. It is, however, Important to ensure that this does not come at a cost or negatively impact those regional communities that have been identified and declared as suitable for offshore renewable energy infrastructure. A key part of our legislation was community consultation and, by association, gaining a social licence before an area can be declared as suitable. Careful and ongoing consultation in regulating offshore electricity infrastructure is critical, given the deep connection Australians have with the ocean and existing offshore industries. It's critically important to manage the marine environment in a way that recognises all users. This includes local communities and recreational users. Our government included a minimum 60-day public consultation period on a declared zone to ensure people can have their say on any proposed area. In terms of location, another inclusion was locating turbines and other assets beyond three nautical miles from the coast in Commonwealth waters to help address the amenity concerns associated with some onshore renewable projects. On the issue of uh, the declaration of zones, the minister has reannounced the former coalition government's prioritisation of the Bass Strait for Australia's first offshore wind development. The former coalition government approved Australia's first wind exploration licence in the Bass Strait in 2019 and, in 2021, legislated a framework to unlock investment while ensuring coastal communities and sea users' rights are respected. It's essential that any development has strong community support, and I encourage all potential project developers to put in the groundwork needed to secure that support. While consultation is welcome, Mr Bowen still has no plan to support investment in reliable generation needed to keep the lights on and, importantly, to get prices down. That's why this government has already abandoned its election promise to cut household power bills by that magic number of $275 by the end of its first term. The bill makes a number of minor amendments to the Act, um, and while the amendments are mostly non-controversial and the Coalition supports the ongoing development of Australia's offshore wind industry, a notable amendment is, of course, that the minister, rather than the regulator, will be given the powers to decide what forms and amounts of financial security licence holders must provide and when these obligations must cease under regulations. The Coalition believes the proposed amendment that allows the minister, rather than the regulator, to make decisions uh, um, in relation to matters relating to the financial security of licence holders risks, risks rather, emboldening the government's plan to accelerate the rollout of renewable projects without sufficient community consultation or, importantly, without a social licence, and therefore easier terms for licence holders than otherwise would be granted under an independent authority. This is a matter, of course, that the coalition will be paying close attention to. Thank you. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, I rise uh, today to speak in favour of this bill. The Greens will be supporting uh, this bill put forward by the government because it is an important step forward to ensure that we can transition to a cleaner, greener economy and to ensure that we are investing. Uh, all of our efforts in the uh, production of renewable energy. Um, but let me say at the outset um, just the sheer hypocrisy from the other side. We've just heard uh, the representative from uh, Mr Dutton's side of, uh, of government, uh, the opposition, the Liberal Party, trying to criticise anyone else when it comes to uh, having any energy policy in this country. I mean, these are, uh, this mob were uh, in charge for nearly a decade, and we had 
chop and change, chop and change, chop and change the whole way through on energy policy. And you want to know why Australians' electricity bills are so damn high right now? It is because of the incompetence of those who were in charge for the last nine years. They did nothing to reduce carbon pollution. They did nothing to reduce people's power bills. And in fact, what they did do is stand in the way and make it harder and harder for industry to develop and deliver the cheaper form of energy, which we know uh, the facts are absolutely clear, the numbers don't lie, that new renewable projects deliver cheaper power for everyone, which is why this bill is absolutely essential and important. Um, but it's also important today because uh, alongside this piece of legislation to establish uh, more wind power in Australia offshore uh, is the fact that the Environment Minister, uh, <coughs> uh, Tanya Plibersek, has today released the State of the Climate Report. Now, we should not be surprised at the statistics and the findings in this report, but we should be alarmed. Our climate is in absolute crisis. Climate change is here. It is happening. We are living with it. It is devastating our homes, our livelihoods. It is, it is putting people's lives at risk. It is already uh, wrecking havoc on life as we know it here in Australia. The state of the climate report shows that we've already increased temperatures here in Australia to, one, to an average of 1.47 degrees. That's here in Australia. We have a global effort designed to reduce uh, temperatures or to keep temperatures uh, at 1.5 degrees globally, and already Australia is nearly at that limit. And it is having a devastating impact on our environment, on our communities and on our economy. The state of the climate report shows that we are going to have more extreme weather. There is going to be uh, more damaging floods. There is going to be more worsening droughts. There is going to be bushfires in intensity that we have never seen before. The climate has changed and we have to face up to the realities that we have to drastically reduce pollution if we are to try and hold back the very worst yet to come. Our oceans are in crisis. This state of the, this state of the climate report shows that our oceans, particularly uh, our reefs, our, the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, is one of the most vulnerable reefs in the world. Uh, the bleaching events that are almost that are devastating the Great Barrier Reef, but are making it harder and harder for the reef uh, to recover because how frequent those bleaching events are happening are only going to get worse. Our climate is in crisis, and rather than bickering from the other side about uh, uh, how how fast or slow to move from fossil fuels to renewables, we just have to get on with it. Our climate is in crisis and we have to get off the gas and get off the coal. That is the truth. And we do that by investing in renewable energy. We do that by investing in a smart grid. We do that by making sure that we transition our entire economy to one that is based on uh, ensuring a clean, green outcome. This particular bill uh, is largely technical in the aspects of uh, creating an offshore wind industry in Australia, but it is essential. It is essential for Australia to get off fossil fuels and to make sure we tackle climate pollution. We won't be able to build uh, the zero emissions export economy for Australia that we know we need uh, without offshore wind. It is essential. The scale and potential for clean energy growth is massive. So while we are dealing with this climate crisis that is already devastating homes and livelihoods, we also have a massive opportunity if we are willing to take it with both hands. For instance, the one field the Star of the South proposed for South Gippsland in Victoria will be big enough to replace the Yalorn Brown power, uh, coal power station, the dirtiest coal station in the country. Let's get on with it. Let's do it. In fact, it should have been done sometime in the last decade, but now is no time to delay. 
These offshore wind projects will power Australia's new industries. And that's why Portland in Victoria, the Hunter in, New in Newcastle, Gladstone in Queensland are all target sites. They can transform existing deep water port regions into export green steel, hydrogen, ammonia and fertilisers that have zero gas in them. That is essential for transforming our entire economy, for decarbonising our economy. And if we don't do it, climate change is only going to get worse. The climate cr crisis will become more and more devastating. So let's grab with both hands the opportunity to tr transform our economy, to get more investment in Australia, but to also reduce the pollution that is harming our environment. But it is, of course, important with all of these uh, new industries that we uh, tread carefully to ensure that the public is brought along. And there are already signs of concerns about some of the proposals in Gippsland impacting on uh, existing treasures like, like Wilson's Promontory. I remember as a kid camping uh, at the Wilson's Promontory um, campgrounds over summer. It is a stunningly beautiful area and we need to protect it. We need to balance uh, these areas. We need to make sure we are protecting nature while at the same time investing uh, in the transformation of the decarbonisation that we need. And you can do that. You can talk to community. You can respect local traditional uh, owners. You can make sure you bring people along. But you do it with transparency, you do it with clarity and you do it with purpose. You don't do it with raw politics uh, that we've seen for the last nine years uh, from the Liberal National Party. So we'll be keeping a close eye on the projects as they come through to make sure the communities are being consulted, to make sure the environment is being looked after, to make sure we are getting a net gain uh, on uh, not just um, an investment in renewables and cheaper power prices for Australians and export industry that we can be proud of and that can power our, uh, our, our uh, national economy, but to make sure we're still protecting um, the areas that are so beautiful and that make Australia uh, the great country that it is. We're worried, of course, about the impact on migratory birds, uh, and we'll be making sure that the EPBC legislation, that is the environment laws of this country, are actually strong enough uh, to protect migratory birds and our endangered animals, our wildlife, as these projects are being discussed. Uh, you can uh, do these things in harmony if you do it right, if you do it with transparency, if you do it with purpose. This uh, bill is an important step forward. I'm not going to sit here in, or stand here in this place today and hear the sheer hypocrisy from the other side who have done nothing to protect the environment, nothing to reduce pollution, nothing to reduce power bills. But if they want to step up to the plate now and work on, with all sides of the parliament to make sure we do get a proper decarbonisation agenda running in this country that balances renewable energy, care for the environment and respect of the community, then OK, I'll start listening to them. But at this point, it is sheer politics and it's as if the Liberal National Party think the rest of us have amnesia. Well, we don't. When you read the state of the climate report today, it is shocking. Shocking that we are at a point where we are nearly, we've nearly seen 1.5 degrees warming in this country. And yet we still have the leader of the opposition arguing against proper targets to reduce pollution, arguing against global ambition to tackle climate change, and earlier this week arguing that even, even those in our neighbourhood in the Pacific should be given some assistance to deal with the loss and damage caused by climate change. And if, this is the, if this is the position and the direction that the Liberal National Party are going to continue down, well, they'll lose more seats at the next election. My home state of South Australia, I know South Australians are deeply worried about the 
impact that climate change is having right now. They are worried about what happens when the next drought hits. They're worried about the state of the Murray-Darling Basin. They're worried that the head of the Murray-Darling Basin Authority only yesterday said that there would be 30 per cent less water in the Murray-Darling Basin because of climate change. South Australians know that we have to take this issue seriously and we cannot delay it any further. And when they hear members of the Liberal Party thinking that it can still just get kicked down the road or playing grubby politics over climate change, to hear the Leader of the Opposition, Peter Dutton, suggest that our friends in the Pacific can simply drown on their own without the support and help of Australia in terms of a global effort to combat climate change and to help fund a loss and damage contribution. I wonder how many Liberal members uh, in South Australia will continue to hold their seats. The Liberal Party have totally missed the message from this election. People voted in this election, Australians voted in huge numbers in this election for climate action, more than ever before. And you never hear a peep out of the Liberal National Party since then about what they are doing to change their policies that reflects the will of the Australian people. All you hear is petty politics, gutter politics and some excuse that it was somebody else's fault. You're in charge for 10 years and you did nothing. And now we have the worst state of the climate report that this country has ever seen because our environment and our climate is in crisis. So I'm glad you're finally voting for something to help reduce carbon pollution. But boy, oh boy, it's taken you a long bloody time to get here. Thank you, Senator Hanson Young. Senator Grogan. Thank you, Acting Deputy Chair. Um, I rise to also support the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Amendment Bill, um, strangely enough. And we, um, we've had a lot of uh, conversation this morning, some contributions. Let me just be really clear about what this bill is actually going to do. Um, the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Legislation Amendment Bill amends the Customs Act 1901 to ensure that following the recent commencement of the Offshore Electricity Act, the goods and vessels that enter or exit the coast in relation to offshore electricity infrastructure are appropriately regulated. Um, the bill is also amending the Act, the OEI Act, to primarily accommodate a recent change in the administrative arrangement orders which might otherwise impact the powers and identity of the offshore infrastructure registrar. Now, while that doesn't sound uh, the sexiest paragraph in the universe, it actually is a significant step towards structural change. Structural change, the kind of change, as Senator Hanson Young was referring to previously, we have seen a significant period of time, close on a decade, of challenges in this area, of lack of action. And so we are making this change to ensure that we can build this industry that we know has the opportunity to be quite transformational. It is a quite a transformational piece of work. We've seen a lot of activity across Europe and now the United States are also investing very heavily in offshore wind. These changes allow us to invest in that industry, to open up the opportunity for the building of those wind farms offshore to build into our electricity grid. Now, our commitment to an 82 per cent electricity in renewables by 2030 um, is, a, is a solid commitment that is going to make a difference. And this kind of change, opening up this industry to new jobs, to new investment, to a greener, cleaner future, a future where we know that there are better jobs, we know that this is the pathway we need to take, um, not just for ourselves in Australia, but as a global citizen addressing issues of climate change. We cannot 
keep acting the way we've been acting, but we can do it building new opportunities, new industries and new jobs. And this is exactly what this kind of legislation will open up the opportunities for. Um, offshore wind, um, like I say, is, is, is very popular across Europe and is building significantly year on year. Um, it, is a, it has a stronger, more consistent wind source and it's more abundant than the onshore wind. It also deals with a lot of the issues um, that people have raised regarding onshore farms, which absolutely have a place and have a role to play. But the offshore wind farms provide an extra, as I say, stronger, more consistent source of electricity that will be able to pump into the grid, the new grid, the grid that we are upgrading and making more efficient so that we can provide cheaper, cleaner electricity to households across Australia, while also boosting jobs and building new industry areas, new industry areas that we can be proud of. We can transform our economy. We can transform our energy system. We can move towards a clean energy future. And we can embrace the opportunities that our natural environment has and work, as Senator Hanson Young pointed out, in partnership in partnership with anybody who wants to play and in partnership with our environment. We can make a better future and this bill takes us part of the way there. And like my colleague uh, Senator Hanson Young, we'd be delighted to work more closely with the opposition on these plans for a stronger, a stronger renewable energy future and a cleaner energy future. So we'll be looking forward to that. Senator Dunningham, thank you very much. Um, and with that, I will commend the bill. Thank you, Acting Deputy. Th thank you, Senator Grogan. Senator Van. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise to speak on the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Legislation Amendment Bill 2022. Like many things in this place, it is a great piece of coalition legislation that the out-of-touch out Labor senators opposite want to transform into something that hurts communities more than it helps. And don't get me wrong, Mr Acting Deputy President, nobody is a bigger supporter of offshore renewable electricity than myself. Unlike the Prime Minister, I went to COP27 in Egypt last week, uh, where I heard firsthand how offshore wind will be one of the many technologies required for Australia and other countries uh, transition to a net zero economy. And I welcome Minister Bowen's move to join the Global Offshore Wind Alliance, which aims to see 380 gigawatts of offshore infrastructure built around the world by 2030. Right now, there are only 60 gigawatts of offshore wind capacity around the world. Of those 60 megawatts, uh, gigawatts, not one is produced in Australia. However, we did enable the legislation for that to commence in the last parliament. Despite being a country that boasts of our bountiful beaches and one of the largest shorelines in the world, there is not one oper operational offshore wind project in our whole country. And the research about this is conclusive. We have an exceptionally strong capacity for offshore wind, especially in my home state of Victoria, where the first project is likely to be built. According to recent studies, the technical offshore wind resource was estimated to be 2,233 gigawatts, a mount far in excess of current and projected electricity demand in Australia. If we exploited just 2 per cent of Australia's technical offshore wind resource, we would provide nearly double the entire generation capacity currently in the NEM, according to leading experts. Offshore energy infrastructure has the potential to create significant investment and job creation opportunities, contribute to Australia's future energy security and is key to our path to becoming a country that reaches net zero emissions by 2050. More importantly, it doesn't disrupt communities and destroy usable agricultural land or the, nat or the natural environment. And that is why when in government, the coalition 
coalition de delivered on a 2019 election commitment and passed legislation to enable the development of offshore electricity infrastructure and provide the industry with the certainty needed to invest in offshore electricity infrastructure projects. The Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Bill 2021 established a regulatory framework that intended to support the development of this sector in Commonwealth waters. It established a regulatory framework to enable the construction, installation, commissioning, operation, maintenance and decommissioning of offshore electricity infrastructure in the Commonwealth offshore area. The bill included the key offshore um, electricity infrastructure instruments, including offshore wind farms, as well as tidal, wave, rain, solar and geothermal powered generation, as well as the necessary transmission facilities to bring it ashore. In the 2021 budget, the former coalition government invested $4.8 million to develop the legislative framework, which included $2.9 million as seed funding for the National Offshore Petroleum Safety and Environmental Management Authority NOPSEMA, and the National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administration to develop policy, regulations, guidelines and industry advice, as well as $1.9 million to the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources and Geoscience Australia for legal advice, marine spatial data collection, public consultation and drafting regulations. This action was part of the Coalition's en energy policy that kept the lights on and the prices low. Households and businesses rely on affordable, reliable power to grow and thrive. In government, we took decisive action to deliver affordable, reliable energy for Australian consumers. And by that we mean having affordable, reliable 24-7, 365 days supply of electricity. And I might say our plan was working. Under the um, Morrison government, uh, renewable energy generation grew by 360 per cent, that's both wind and solar. As well, we reduced annual carbon emissions by 77 million tonnes. So you can see, and power prices were going down. But of course, as we're seeing again now, prices are going up again. And it's no surprise because power prices always go up under Labor governments. Let's not forget that under the last disastrous six years of Labor government, power prices doubled and went up each and every year. Since coming to power, Mr Albanese and Mr Bowen have failed the Australian people on energy. In less than six months of coming to power, the government has walked away from its election promise to the Australian people to reduce household energy bills by $275. Now, those opposite might have forgotten, but I'd like to remind them again that this wasn't a once-off promise. The Prime Minister promised Australians 97 times before the election he would reduce power bills by $275 a year. But, of course, budget estimates show power prices rising by 56 per cent. That's 56 per cent, Mr Acting Deputy President a price that many Australian businesses and families simply will not be able to afford. These numbers aren't just statistics. The increases in energy prices and gas prices have been estimated to cost $1,092 for some households, $2,450 for small businesses and an increase in gas bills of $602. They have been spending their time in government de demonising important gas projects rather than competing, that, rather than competing with re renewables, complement them. And let's not forget taking the extraordinary intervention of suspending the wholesale electricity spot market, which shook the market to its core and cost energy users more than $200 million. With all of these massive failures in such a short amount of time, it would appear the only truthful thing the Prime Minister has said is that his government has hit the ground running. Don't know about. But don't just take my word for it. Energy experts from across Australia are calling the Albanese government's energy trans, uh, transition 
a train wreck. Alenta CEO Jeff Dimery said, and I quote, I think we're headed for failure unless things change significantly. Energy Australia's CEO Mark Collett said, and again I quote, I'm more concerned about a smooth energy transition than a year ago. Offshore energy technologies, such as wind, could provide Australia with new investment and job growth, particularly in coastal regional communities. It is, however, more important to ensure this does not come at a cost or negatively impact those regional communities that have been identified and declared as suitable for offshore energy infrastructure. A key part of our legislation was community consultation and, by association, gaining a social licence for these projects before an area can be declared as suitable. On the road to net zero, we need to be working with our communities, not working against them, if we want to meet our targets. Careful and ongoing consultation in regulating offshore infrastructure is critical. Given the deep connection Australians have with the ocean, and existing offshore industries. It is critically important to manage the marine environment in a way that recognises all users, and this includes local communities and recreational users. The Coalition Government included a minimum 60-day public consultation period on a declared zone to ensure people can have their say on the proposed area. Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, another inclusion was locating turbines and other assets beyond three nautical miles from the coast to help address the amenity concerns associated with some onshore re renewable projects, that is, not being an eyesore in our great environment. It is critical to the maintenance of our environmental and cultural capital that the wind turbines we build aren't going to impact people's day-to-day -day lives which is one of the key benefits of offshore wind, I should say. For a lack of a better word, it's out of sight and out of mind. The constituents of the sunlit, undulating hills of beautiful regional Australia are right to worry when they hear of wind energy projects going up in their backyard. As much as they are important for our energy transition, they can be very ugly. And, it, and this brings me back to my original statement, working with our communities, not working against them. The government is also intent on spending its billions of dollars on rewiring their nation project. They should, however, be focused on building solar projects closer to where the energy is needed, rather than spending billions on changing the power lines just to get a product to market. The government is intending on making a few amendments, most of which are uncontroversial and don't greatly affect the core intention of, of our previous bill except for one important one. The government wants it to be the minister's, not the regulator's, power to decide what forms and amount of financial security licence holders must provide and when these obligations must cease under regulations. Not to mention that this move leaves the process wide open for corruption. Um, our biggest wind energy companies in Australia are also some of the biggest donors in the country. When onshore wind and power projects often cost billions of dollars, there is the potential for misdealings. Now, I'm not going to try and impugn the intentions of any minister or company, but with such lucrative projects going up, the Coalition has always believed that the power to decide the levels of financial security licence holders need should be in the hands of independent regulators, not the partisan and political hands of the minister. And I remember all the lectures we got from that, the other side on integrity when we were in government. So it's strange to see that they're walking back from that now. Furthermore, when it comes to building our largest energy projects, it's important that the government gains a social licence from the community they plan to build it in. Simply put, these projects are going to be going up in backyards and communities, and they deserve a say in how they are built, where they are built, and the safety precautions that need to be put in place. An independent regulator would ensure that communities have a say in these projects and that they are truly listened to. It would prevent a minister from firing off a project right before a by-election or delaying a project until it was politically advantageous to release it. 
what would matter would be the energy needs of the country and the local needs of the community. And that's what matters, Mr Acting Deputy President, making sure that we are working with our communities, not working against them. Thank you. Thanks, Senator Van. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, this legislation before us deals with two amendments to the Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act, which was passed in this chamber in 2021. Uh, the Greens supported that legislation uh, and the principle of offshore wind energy with, with caveats. Uh, and I'll deal with uh, those two amendments in a second, but just to provide the very important backdrop or um, background to this, this legislation today, which is designed, I suppose, to help uh, grease the wheels of this, of this legislation and develop a, an offshore electricity industry uh, in this country. Um, it's very important that we rapidly transition to 100 per cent renewables, not just in Australia but all around the world. And of course, um, wind is going to play a major role in that. And wind in the ocean, wind onshore, uh, of course, is going to be a critical component of our grid going forward. Um, but I will say the Greens do have caveats on where we put wind farms, including in the ocean, and these things have got to be done the right way. Um, there's no doubt at all that uh, wind farms do have some environmental impacts and their footprints, uh, for example, the recyclability of the products are things that we should be considering right here, right now. But I do want to, I do want to talk about the context of that rapid transition to renewables, uh, Acting Deputy President, because I, I think there's sometimes in your life and sometimes in your career where you might look back on a moment and, and you look back on that moment and it hits you between the eyes and you say, wow, you know, did that really happen? Uh, what did we do about it? What was my role in, 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 in changing that? And I think the release today by the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology, the state of the climate report for 2022 is going to be one of those moments, I think, in my life and I think in the life of a lot of people, because uh, it shows that we are in a deepening, a deepening climate emergency, and things couldn't be any more serious. And the reason why I think today is so significant, Acting Deputy President, is um, I've been part of a movement, a political movement, that's been about 50 years old, that got people into parliament to fight for the environment and, uh, and, and a whole range of uh, social uh, justice and equity issues. And one of the key things we've been pushing for is to try and keep global warming to one and a half degrees on this planet, based in, uh, in line with an international protocol, uh, the Paris Agreement. And today we hear in the State of the Climate Report, we hear that in Australia, we're already at 1.4 degrees of warming above levels from 1910. Now, the Paris Agreement is trying to limit warming across the entire planet to 1.5 degrees based on pre-industrial levels. But here in Australia, we're almost at that level. And it is 2022, not 2050 or 2100. It's 2022 and we are nearly at 1.5 degree warming on this continent. And when we look at what's happening, in our backyards, three La Nina events in a row, with two in negative Indian Ocean dipoles in a row, never been recorded before. Some of the worst bushfires this country's ever seen in the last couple of years. Just about every temperature record you could think of broken. Marine heat waves, the loss of biodiversity on places like the Great Barrier Reef and off the coast of my beautiful state in Tasmania, where we've lost most of our giant kelp forests, critical habitat for our fisheries. And I could go on. Droughts, pestilence, disruption to our supply chains in our agricultural communities. These things are all happening at 1.4 degrees of warming. And the State of the Environment report, and I want to I want to step through just a couple of very quick things that it said today. It said that these 
And there's some great uh, articles that I recommend people read, inc including uh, both in The Guardian and The Age today, that sea levels are rising at an accelerating rate, day and night time temperatures are rising, we're seeing record downpours or deluges in our rainfall patterns, glaciers in the West Antarctic are destabilised, glaciers and ice around the planet is melting, and in our oceans we are seeing longer more frequent heat waves and the acidification of our ocean from carbon dioxide is happening ten times faster than any time in our recorded history. We are seeing more heat, more droughts, more intense rainfalls. And what about the outlook? What do we know about the outlook from this report? Expect more misery, more suffering, more loss of biodiversity, more economic damage if we don't act. And it was good to hear the government today in these reports, Mr Husick in the other place, Ms Plibersek in the other place, our environment minister, talk about taking climate action. But talk is cheap. What about the action that this government and previous governments have taken. Well, we've seen one piece of legislation since this parliament, this new parliament, has convened to set a 43% emissions reduction target. That the science tells us will limit warming to one to two degrees. So, an analysis by think tank Climate Analytics earlier this year said the government's commitment to cut emissions by 43 per cent by 2030 and reach net zero by 2050 found it was consistent with two degrees of warming. And Mr Bowen at COP27 in Egypt uh, specifically said that the difference between 1.5 and 1.7 degrees of warming for the planet was enormous and implored other nations to up their efforts to cut emissions. Mr Bowen also said, if we're not trying to keep to 1.5 degrees, then what are we here for? What are we here for? Well, I would like to know why we only have legislation and ambition in this country to cut emissions that equates to two degrees of warming. You see, you can understand why Mr Albanese yesterday when he went to visit flood-affected communities in New South Wales, was asked where he was, why he wasn't there earlier, supporting them in their darkest hour. And he said, I was overseas at international meetings. You can see why people are getting sick and tired of talk fests. If the Paris Protocol was set well over a decade ago, why are we nearly exceeding that temperature in 2022, when we were supposed to be able to hold this planet's warming across all countries to 1.5 degrees by 2050, and we're there nearly 30 years early. It's because we talk and we don't act. We know we need to cut emissions by 75 per cent by 2030 to have any chance globally of meeting these targets. What is half a degree, you may ask? And this is where I think it gets lost in the mire. If, if we're globally at one, one degree or 1.2 degrees, a two degrees warming is a 100 per cent increase, a 100 per cent increase of trapped heat in our atmosphere. And somehow we think 1.5 degrees warming, which is a 50 per cent increase, is a good thing. Well, it's not. And you can look at a whole range of scientific information, and it was interesting that uh, Mr. Husick was quoted in the papers this morning as saying, uh, we listen to the science and we act. Well, the science tells us that the difference between one and a half and two degrees for coral reefs, for example, is if we limit warming in our oceans and around the planet to one and a half degrees, we're going to see a, an expected 70 to 90 per cent decline in our coral reefs. If we limit warming to two degrees, 
expect to see a 99 per cent decline in the Great Barrier Reef and in the world's coral reefs. It couldn't be any more serious. So that is the backdrop to the legislation that we are debating today to facilitate offshore renewable energy and an offshore electricity industry. And we support the rapid transition to renewables. We support stopping all new fossil fuel projects and phasing out fossil fuels. It's estimated we have around 3,000 gigatons of fossil fuels already discovered on this planet, uh, acting D deputy president. And if we were to meet our carbon budget for Paris, we can only subtract 500 of that gigatons in the next 50 years. And yet we're still out exploring for more oil and gas in our oceans. We're still giving public money to open up new fossil fuel projects in this country. At the same time, our leaders are overseas talking about keeping global warming to one and a half degrees. It is bullshit. Absolute uh, and Senator utter Wilson, bullshit, Deputy Senator President. Senator Wish Wilson, I'd appreciate it if we use parliamentary language. Well, it's there, all are, that there, are other, there are other words you could use to express your, your passion. It's a, I appreciate that, President, but as you know, Odgers says it's about the context of how you use language. And I think at this time in history, I'm allowed to be bloody angry like many other people around this planet, with a lack of action from people like we have in this chamber, leaders and politicians. Now, one thing that we know is good for the environment is recycling. And the government's talking a big game on recycling. And I note that recently Minister Plebisek talked about putting the solar panel industry on a, a pathway of action of recycling. Today we have an opportunity before us, uh, Deputy President, to also talk about recycling in the offshore renewable energy industry. Because everything we produce should be produced for its end of life, and we're seeing a number of turbines around this country coming to the end of the life that will likely be sent to landfill if we don't do something about it. And of course, we should be actually stipulating in legislation today. We should be stipulating, and I would, would like to have moved substantive amendments to do this, but I understand the politics of this uh, this week and next week is to get through a lot of legislation. So I will, be, uh, I will foreshadow, uh, Deputy President, that I will be moving a second reader amendment, which I will now. now move. I'd ask you to move. Thank you. Which I move. So moved. Uh, which at least, I suppose, puts some structure around the government, uh, <laughs> making sure that we work with the offshore electricity industry to make sure that uh, the infrastructure that we see in our oceans is properly recycled and especially the blades of these wind turbines, which are made from a number of composite materials, aren't sent to landfill. They are designed for their end of life. And there are companies out there like Siemens in Germany that are producing uh, fully uh, recyclable wind turbine blades. So the, the renewable energy industry, whether it's uh, the impacts they have on wildlife, uh, biodiversity, communities, uh, or uh, on climate action themselves, of course, they're part of a solution to tackle this rapid transition to zero emissions that we need, but they also need to take their environmental responsibility seriously. Uh, in fact, I think they should take it more seriously than other industries because uh, they are out there setting an example of what we need to be doing. So um, my, uh, the Greens amendment here is fairly simple. Um, it adds uh, a motion uh, that uh, the Senate is of the opinion that building a circular economy is a key component of climate action. Decommissioning of infrastructure must be taken, undertaken in a way that is environmentally sustainable, and the technology to recycle and reuse the components of wind turbines exists now, and calls on the government to develop robust regulations for the safe and sustainable decommissioning of offshore wind turbine infrastructure and ensure that future regulations prevent the decommissioning of wind turbine infrastructure to landfill. So, so pretty straightforward. I would hope that uh, many of the wind companies out there, renewable energy companies, would agree with the Greens. And I think most of you in here that now would be the time to be doing this, especially on a bill uh, where one of the amendments to the Customs Act actually looks at anti-dumping and how we issue licences and the conditions attached to those licences uh, associated with operating uh, in these new areas that we're opening up in our oceans. And I have a very strong personal view, as does my party. Uh, that we should actually be leading uh, in here when we pass this kind of legislation on building a circular economy. And I would like to see 
the offshore uh, renewable energy uh, electricity industry uh, as a shining light and leading on that, showing that they are actually thinking about a circular economy, they are thinking about a zero waste economy, they are thinking about designing their products for the end of their life, uh, and they are setting an example for so many other industries that also need to do this. Um, so uh, we'll be no doubt voting on that, uh, Deputy President, um, and uh, the Greens will be supporting this legislation today. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Act Deputy President. I'm proud to rise to support uh, this piece of legislation. I do so as a former Minister for Resources who had some involvement in, uh, in kicking off uh, the, uh, the, the process which has led us uh, to this piece of legislation. This is a, a, a largely a, a bill that's uh, been reintroduced from the, the previous parliament. The previous government uh, had been working for a number of years in updating. Uh, our regulatory framework to specifically cover uh, for uh, the, the investment in and creation of offshore wind turbines. Uh, until uh, we passed this legislation, there was a bit of a gap about exactly where and how uh, any investment in offshore wind would be uh, regulated. Uh, we do already do have uh, significant regulatory arrangements in place for offshore uh, oil and gas uh, developments. And as Minister for Resources, I was responsible for those. Uh, they didn't specifically, though, uh, cater for uh, offshore wind. And of course, there's our generic environmental legislation where offshore wind investments could potentially come under. Uh, despite what you might read in reports, I'm not uh, against uh, wind or solar energy. Uh, I'm more than happy uh, to support investments in all types of energy. I just believe in energy abundance. We should have lots of different types of energy. We should have wind, we should have solar, we should have coal, we should have gas. Uh, and yes, we should have nuclear too, because it's only by having lots of energy that will bring energy prices down and protect our, 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 our heritage as a manufacturing nation, have a future for that manufacturing industry too. Uh, so I'm more than happy to support this bill, uh, which would provide a, a stable and and proper, a consistent uh, regulatory framework for offshore wind investments. Of course, as uh, Senator Wish Wilson has expressed, it's very important that they are regulated. Uh, our marine environments uh, are largely pristine and need to be protected. Uh, there needs to be significant regulation on any uh, uh, large-scale uh, investment uh, in our marine uh, areas. Uh, and, uh, those seeking to build offshore wind turbines are probably going to have an environmental effect on our marine areas greater than the oil and gas industry. Potentially what we're, what we're, what we're, we're told, and I'm yet to be convinced that they will necessarily see all of these investments, but what we are told by the government here is there are investments in the Gippsland, there are investments right across our ocean territories, and, and given the lower, lower intensity of renewable energy, of wind in particular, uh, there will need to be more turbines than there are gas, oil and gas platforms uh, around our, our country. And again, um, don't believe what you read. The environmental performance of our oil and gas industry has been stellar, absolutely stellar. Uh, very few uh, and limited environmental issues in our marine environment from those investments. But of course, these larger, larger, potentially larger footprint of investments of wind turbines do just create risk. Uh, they do potentially create risk to, to uh, marine wildlife, especially through their construction and drilling. Uh, that has an impact uh, potentially on seafood stocks. I was just talking to someone from the fishing industry the other day, and they are very concerned uh, about the potential for uh, fishing vessels to be locked out of large areas around uh, wind turbines. And again, given their larger footprint, that would have a much bigger impact than our oil and gas uh, infrastructure does on our uh, fishing industry. So all of those things have to be taken into account. I have great confidence, though, in our regulators, in the National Offshore Petroleum Safety uh, and Environmental Management Authority, NOPSEMA, and our National Offshore Petroleum Titles Administrator, NOPSEMA and NOPTA, are both uh, uh, exemplars uh, of our uh, public service in this country. They have very committed uh, individuals uh, who I had uh, the great privilege of working with as the Minister for Resources. They do a great job in regulating our oil and gas sector. They are a large reason why we've had that great, straight, great and strong environmental performance on oil and gas, and I'm sure they will do an excellent job under this new regulatory framework, once this legislation is passed uh, to regulate the offshore wind industry. It was the former government that did provide funding to both NOPSEMA, NOPTA and their, and their responsible department. Uh, it was then the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources uh, to, to, to create this framework, to get geared up uh, to do this. And I'm glad that, this, uh, that the new government is progressing these 
uh, these initiatives and continuing with the great work they had done. Uh, and so, as I say, I, I, I would hope that one day perhaps we do have investments in offshore wind here. I, I don't know if the grand plans that are being suggested will be realised. Uh, uh, even if you take the CSIRO's uh, latest GenCost report, and I think there are a lot of questions in the rigour of that report, which I think will be exposed in the months ahead, especially in regards to nuclear. But be that as it may, uh, be that as it may, uh, even according to the CSIRO, who are fairly pro-renewables. Uh, they put the costs of offshore wind at around $150 a megawatt hour. Uh, that, that is uh, at least 50 per cent higher than, than coal and, and solar and wind, or onshore wind, I should say, uh, that they have in their cost model. So that's, that's a lot higher. And, and, and uh, uh, given the high prices we see at the moment, obviously we'd like to s attract investment in. In, in sources of energy that can, can lower the cost, can lower costs for families and especially lower that cost for our manufacturers. Offshore wind probably doesn't promise that. Let's be, we've got to be real here with people. Uh, we've got to stop telling them fairy tales. Uh, offshore wind is a very expensive type of power, especially when you add on the fact that on top of that $150, of course, it's not available all the time. You've got to back it up. You've got to firm it in the jargon of the energy industry. And so, and so it'll actually delivered cost to deliver 24-7 power with some component from offshore wind would be much, much higher. You'd probably at least get into the order of 200, possibly more dollars a megawatt hour. And when you compare that, compare that to nuclear, let's say the CSIRO report's got a lot of problems with nuclear because, number one, it only looks at small modular reactors which aren't even commercially deployed yet. I'm not sure why the CSRI won't or are unwilling to publish figures for light water nuclear reactors that are commercially available and used right around the world. In fact, we're the only settled continent in the world without nuclear energy. It's us and the penguins in Antarctica that are holding out here against nuclear energy. Uh, but, but consistently you get estimates around the world of nuclear energy being delivered below that $150 a megawatt hour. Some countries in Scandinavia and in, in Asia are much lower than that, lower than $100 a megawatt hour. Other Western European countries have struggled recently with their costs of nuclear energy. But if you, if you, are, if you want zero emissions, if you want uh, to get to this mythical net zero land, uh, and you want cheaper power, why won't we consider nuclear power? Why don't we have some legislation here that alongside uh, this offshore wind bill actually legalises nuclear. It's given me an idea. Perhaps I should draft some amendments to put <laughs> to legalise nuclear energy in this bill, but I won't hold up the good work of those public servants. So I'll let this through. There, are, there is other legislation, if I can fore foreshadow something on the notice paper, uh, um, Mr Acting Deputy President. There is other legislation that uh, is, is considering that particular effort. I do think, though, what we do, as I say, need most importantly need to do here is be or tell the truth to the Australian people. Uh, this, this government, in particular, has already been caught lying uh, to the Australian people. They've already been caught uh, breaking a massive political promise only six months ago, suggesting that uh, their uh, renewable energy plan, which included offshore wind, uh, their renewable energy plan would save Australians $275 a year on their power bills. That was what they put to the Australian people. Indeed, their leader, Anthony Albanese, promised that to the Australian people 97 times before the last election. We don't hear the, the, the words 275 from this government anymore. They won't repeat that promise. They've walked away from it. They walked away with it within, from it within weeks of being elected. They just dropped it as if no one would remember. But I don't think the Australian people are mugs. I do think they will remember that they were promised. They were promised. They were, there was no ifs and buts. Uh, you know, there were no caveats. They were promised that, the, that by voting for the Labor Party on May the 21st this year, they would get a $275 saving in their power bill. And they haven't got what they promised. Now, there are no refunds. Uh, on a newly elected government, but there is another election coming up, and I don't think the Australian people will forget that lightly. Uh, now, the reason the Labor Party have not been able to deliver on their promise is because we are investing too much in renewable energy. If you would believe, you, you can't believe their promises, but if you would believe what the Labor Party says about our energy system, they walk around saying, oh, the problem is that terrible, dastardly former coalition government did not invest in renewable energy enough. Did not invest in it enough. We didn't do enough. We had 10 years of, of no action. Well, obviously the Labor Party doesn't read the Australian Energy Market Operators' reports. Obviously they do not get across the detail of what has been happening in our energy market because Australia has been investing in solar and wind at a record well above any other country in the world. Well above. 
And that's not my figures. You go to the last Australian Energy Market Operator quarterly report, and they say that Australia has invested in solar and wind at a rate four times higher per person than North America or Europe. Higher than any other country in the world. Four times higher, by the way. Not just a little bit higher, not just uh, marginally above. We have been installing solar and wind energy uh, four, at the rate of four times that in other developed countries in the world. Now, what has that delivered us? What has that delivered the Australian people? It has delivered us skyrocketing energy prices and it has delivered crushing power bill increases for Australian families who this Christmas are facing a very difficult decision about how many toys to buy the kids under the Christmas tree because they have to pay for high power bills. That's what it has delivered. That is, the, that is the clear and direct evidence. In fact, it's also the evidence in other countries overseas, every other country that's gone down this path of investing in unreliable, weather-dependent energy ends up with higher power bills. Every country in Europe that's done it, Germany, Denmark, every country that's done that has ended up with higher power prices. We are not, no different. We're just doing it a little bit faster uh, than those other countries right now. And it's about time we get off that track and invest back in reliable power so Australian families do not get crushed uh, by their, their higher energy bills. We've actually had, we, 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 well, I do give thanks today to the Reserve Bank Governor, Philip Lowe, who, consistent with what I'm saying, we've got to tell the truth. We've got to be upfront with people. As hard and as painful as that might be, our job should be to do that. And I do give credit. I've been very critical of Dr. Philip Lowe and on his management of monetary policy, but I give credit for him overnight for bellying the cat on our energy crisis. He has plainly said this morning, or overnight, I should say, yesterday in a speech to CEDA, he has plainly said that investing more in, uh, in green energy will lead to higher power bills. That's what he has said. And I, and I would just hope that it's about time the Australian Labor Party and the federal government uh, be as upfront and honest with the Australian people as, as Philip Lowe has had the courage to do yesterday. Uh, because right now they're telling us fairy tales. You have to make choices and trade-offs in life. And if you want to invest in a power system that is less dependent, that is less reliable, uh, uh, that costs billions of dollars to invest in, you are going to get higher power prices as a result uh, if, you, if, you, if we are effectively uh, going to invest tens of billions of dollars. Uh, the Australian Labor Party wants to spend uh, 60 odd billion dollars, I think it is, on transmission lines, uh, untold amounts on wind and solar. If you invest in all of that, if you invest in all these billions of dollars of, of new infrastructure and you get exactly the same energy system we had before, that's what they're proposing. We're not going to get a better electricity system. It's not going to deliver uh, power and make our fridges colder. It's not going to make our factories run more efficiently. It's going to, if, if, if everything works out, it's going to be exactly the same as before, but we'll spend tens of billions of dollars getting there. That means you're going to be less productive. That means you're going to have higher prices and higher costs. That's the way business works. If a business spends billions and billions of dollars uh, on new equipment, new, new, new gear, uh, uh, new technologies, and gets exactly the same output as they did before, they're going to make less money. <laughs> Their profits are going to go down. And that's what's going to happen to our country if we continue on this path, because we are spending billions and billions of dollars and not getting a better energy system in, in return. We're going to shut down our existing uh, coal-fired power plants early when they still could be running. Uh, they've been invested in. Their sunk, costs are sunk. And we're going to replace them at a very, very high cost, and that is going to cost our economy, our society, dearly. We have to realise uh, right now that uh, the world is waking up to this fraud of, uh, of, of the idea that we can run an industrial economy on renewable energy alone. You, we just saw last week, Senator Wish Wilson men mentioned the complete failure of COP27. I mean, surprise, surprise. But the rest of the world is not signing up to phase down fossil fuels. They're not doing that. There was no agreement to do that in Egypt. To all the people that went there, Chris Bowen that went over there, uh, think this would ha thinking this would happen, the rest of the world didn't agree. They didn't agree because they can see what's happening in Europe right now. They can see that. They can see that those countries that have become dependent on solar and wind, like Germany, Germany's been the, at the forefront of this. They call it the Energiewende, the, the green, energy, green Energy Scheme. They, they can see the disaster that is Germany now. And there's another German word we should all remember or, or learn right now. It's called Dunkel Flauti. Uh, that means the dark doldrums. They've got a word. Germans got a word for everything. And they've now got a word for the, 
the, the terrible consequences of an obsession with renewable energy. Dunkel, flouty means the dark doldrums. It's the periods that happen now in Germany where there's no wind uh, for weeks at a time, and at that time they've got no power, <laughs> they've got no energy. Now they're lucky they can import it from France, the nuclear energy and plants can import it from the coal-fired power plants of Poland. Uh, they used to import it from Russia, of course. They can kind of get by. We don't have that. We're an island nation. So when a Dunkel flouty hits this country, it will really be dark. It will really be the dark doldrums, and we will not have factories. We will have the lights out, and of course, we will have Australian families who cannot afford uh, the basic costs of living. We cannot do, uh, do that in this country with so many energy resources. I support this bill, but I support investing in all Australian energy. Minister, please sum up the debate. Uh, thank you, Deputy President, and I thank senators for their contribution to what is a characteristically wide-ranging debate here in our chamber. Um, sometimes, Deputy President, discretion is the better part of valour, and I am always intrigued by decisions from uh, opposition senators to come into this chamber and uh, provide commentary about national energy policy, because. The most significant characteristic of the last decade of Liberal government, in coalition with their junior, uh, their junior partners, the National Party, was an entirely chaotic approach to energy policy. And unhappily for Australians, we are reaping the benefits of that chaos. And it is worth just stepping through the just a handful. I mean, the 22 policies. It's actually uh, more policies than I'd have time to go through. None of them landed, of course. Not a single one of them landed. And senators here who are honest with themselves will recall sitting on Senate committees when the energy industry, rather desperately, would come before Senate senators and Senate committees and say essentially this, for heaven's sake, could the government, could the Liberal national government please deliver a coherent, consistent, predictable energy policy so we could get on with energy decision-making. Any, any energy policy of any kind, because we would like to make final investment decision about this project or that project or another project. But during that long decade of Liberal and National Party government, none of that could happen, because there was no energy policy. Under Mr Abbott, we had direct action. He was then, of course, replaced by Mr Turnbull, who set Professor Finkel to work labouring over a long and quite coherent report where he recommended a clean energy target, which, of course, wasn't adopted, produced enormous infighting and ultimately uh, was transformed into something else, the National Energy Guarantee. Mr Turnbull sought to legislate that. That, of course, was overwhelmed by infighting, bickering within the Liberal and National Coalition, and I suspect between Liberals themselves. That saw the demise of Mr, uh, Mr Turnbull. We ended up with Mr Morrison as the Prime Minister. He, of course, had a big stick policy, a policy which was strangely unconnected to any of the actual challenges facing the energy system at the time. Uh, we had Mr Taylor in the chair as the energy minister. He now wants to be the, the treasurer, of course who suggested that taxpayers should indemnify new coal projects. That, of course, then produced more fighting between the Liberals and the Nationals, and we ended up with the UNGI, the billion dollars that was going to produce a whole lot of new investment in energy projects that never eventuated. Then we had a technology roadmap. It's actually quite unclear what the policy of the Liberal and National Party is at the moment on energy policy. It seems to have something to do with nuclear. Of course, they had a decade where they could have pursued nuclear energy, could have enlivened that option for the country. They didn't do that. And now, as far as I can tell, the only policy they have on the table is a policy to put a nuclear reactor in every coastal community. Um, so an intriguing approach to a group of people who'd like to come in here and talk about social licence, an absolutely intriguing set of propositions. But more generally, an interesting political approach, because I think honesty does matter. And actually, thinking about the legacy of the previous government in relation to energy policy, just having the tiniest bit of insight about the problems generated by your approach over the last decade might actually be appropriate as you commence a period in opposition. Because the legacy of all of this, of course, was that four gigawatts of capacity was retired from the system. Four gigawatts of capacity left the electricity system and only one was constructed. 
and that was a direct consequence of the chaos and dysfunction in the government led by those three Liberal Prime Ministers, the chaos and dysfunction which led to an exit of very significant volumes of capacity out of the system with very little to replace it. And the Labor government is setting about remedying, remedying those challenges and those problems created by your mismanagement and incompetence. This bill, of course, is actually an essentially technical bill, um, and I will return to the substance before us because the establishment of offshore renewable energy will promote regional development by enabling sustainable investment in Australia's coastal areas, creating jobs and growing local economies. This bill makes some quite small administrative amendments to the existing Offshore Electricity Infrastructure Act 2021 to reflect machinery of government changes. The bill also makes some technical amendments and closes a regulatory gap in the Customs Act 1901 to ensure full coverage of customs obligations for new renewable energy infrastructure projects offshore. And this regulatory framework for offshore renewables will contribute to delivering cleaner, cheaper renewable energy for Australian households and businesses. This underpins the acceleration of energy transition and decarbonisation in Australia, and we're sending a clear signal that we are open for business when it comes to new energy investment and we are giving certainty to the market. I thank the Senate Environment and Communications Legislation Committee for their inquiry into the bill and their recommendation that it be passed. The government is committed to a sustainable offshore wind industry with a strong social licence for its operation and benefits to the community. It's important that this new industry for Australia not only cuts emissions but is environmentally sustainable in its operations. I note the comments from Senator Witt Wilson and I thank him for his contribution to the debate. We do expect that these projects will take all reasonable steps to deliver on this important part of their social licence, including through the reuse and recycling of any components that are being decommissioned. The department is developing further regulations about management plans and the operation of offshore electricity infrastructure and will take these issues into account in that process. So while we do not support the need for a second reading amendment, we are committed to an environmentally sustainable industry in Australia. Thank you. Honourable Senators, there is a second reading amendment moved by Senator Wish Wilson. I intend to put that question. I put the question that the second reading amendment be agreed to on sheet 1751. Those for the question say aye. Against no. I think the noes have it. I hear two voices. A division required. Ring the bells.
Lock the doors. The question before the chair is at the second reading amendment to the offshore electricity infrastructure legislation amendment bill 2022. The amendment being on one seven sheet 1751 be agreed to. Those for the question pass to the right of the chair against to the left. I point as teller for the ayes, Senator McKim, teller for the noes, Senator Cadill. Honourable Senators, there being 13 ayes and 32 noes, it's passed in the negative. The question now before the, before the chair is that the bill now be read a second time. Those for the question say aye. Against no, I think the ayes have it. Clark. Bill for enactment, the law relating to offshore electricity infrastructure and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Minister. I move that the bill be read a third time. Put the question that the bill now be read a third time. Those for the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to offshore electricity infrastructure and for related purposes. Government Business Order for Day Number Two: High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022. Resumption of second reading debate. Senator Mackenzie. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Acting Deputy President. And I rise on behalf of the opposition to speak to the High Speed Rail Authority Bill, um, which the opposition will be supporting. Uh, and I will flag during this contribution that we will also be seeking to move an amendment uh, to this legislation. The government has bill before the Senate today is to establish a high-speed rail authority as an independent body to advise on, plan and develop a high-speed rail system in Australia. It was passed by the House of Representatives uh, with the same amendments that are before the Senate. Um, the coalition supports the bill, but will move our amendments that improve the accountability and transparency of the authority to ensure there is representation on the authority's board from rural and regional Australia. As we roll out a raft of infrastructure projects across this great country, whether they be road, rail, uh, shipping or indeed airport infrastructure, it's very, very important that anybody's charged with rolling out that infrastructure take the time out to consult with local communities. The types of 
towns and regional capitals that Senator Cadell and I represent as proud members of the National Party need to be able to have a say in how these projects will impact our communities, how they will be um, beneficial uh, to our communities and also what governments, local, state and federal will do to mitigate some of the negative impacts as we roll that infrastructure out. Obviously, um, the coalition uh, in our period in federal government is a strong proponent um, of rail infrastructure throughout our country. Um, we actually indeed released a 20-year national faster rail plan in 2019. And at the 22-23 budget uh, in March, committed a further $3.72 billion to deliver faster rail, bringing total commitments to faster rail projects to $6 billion. Now, the bill before you today doesn't provide billions of dollars required to actually build faster or indeed fast rail track in our country. No, it's a bill to set up an authority to have some discussions and to plan out um, the trajectory of fast rail under the Labor Party. What we'd obviously like to see is a continuation of our own commitment of in excess of $6 billion of real money on the table to actually build track to ensure we are moving not just people but goods right across our great country and we know in this chamber how important rail infrastructure will be to a low emissions future of which we in the National Party and the Liberal Party are committed to. In our March budget prior to the election we committed $1.6 billion for the Brisbane to Sunshine Coast extension, $1.12 billion for the Brisbane to Gold Coast rail upgrade and $1 billion for the Sydney to Newcastle upgrade. The New South Wales government also made $500 million commitment to provide a quicker and more reliable connection between Sydney, the Central Coast and Newcastle. Coalition parties very much understand how critical it is to expand our rail network in partnership obviously, with uh, state governments and to ensure that the best technology is being employed to ensure that not just those that live in capital cities uh, get to access um, this fantastic um, mode of transport, which is constantly changing. And, you know, I've had the benefit of travelling abroad and uh, travelling on Shinkansen, um, which really transform what it means to put your population outside of capital cities, and it's something we in the coalition very much believe in. One of the great um, tragedies of our country is our urbanised nature. 80 per cent of our population live in three places, which is unheard of anywhere else around the globe. And those of us in the Liberal and National Party obviously believe in spreading our population out, and, and thanks to COVID, so many more Australians uh, chose to come out into the regions and experience not just a great way of life, but indeed high-paid, rewarding careers in 21st century industries. Uh, which is part of our government's commitment to ensuring that the prosperity of this nation is shared right throughout our country and not just concentrated in the city. So any moves to improve the rail network uh, we're um, really keen to take a look at. We remain committed to faster rail because of its benefits to improve services, stimulate regional growth and improve access to job services and affordable housing and, indeed, um, accessible education. High-speed rail along the Australian East Coast has been examined by both sides of politics since the 1980s, and the most comprehensive analysis of the feasibility of high-speed rail in Australia was undertaken from 2010 to 2013. And the cost at this time was estimated to be $114 billion, and that's in 2012, uh, equating to approximately $131 billion in 2020. 
There have not been any more detailed costing since this time. A National Faster Rail Agency review um, reviewed the high-speed rail policy and found that the 2012 cost is considered to be low and current estimates are likely to be uh, between $200 and $300 uh, billion dollars in today's dollars. The major barriers to high-speed rail in Australia are the cost of construction and I note uh, the Infrastructure Minister and the Labor Party are using the high cost of con construction in this country to actually um, delay and cut a lot of critical infrastructure projects across the portfolio and the 10-year pipeline that we would put in place, um, which is of great concern to so many businesses and communities right around uh, the country who would thought the pipeline uh, of projects that were going to be bid on and delivered over the next decade um, was uh, going to be a lot more bipartisan than it seems to be the politicised efforts of the Labor Party thus far. And uh, we don't need to go into the suburban rail loop in Melbourne any more uh, than we have recently in this chamber. There are long distances. We are um, sparsely populated. And uh, the distance between our major cities is also one of the barriers uh, identified. Once operational, though, high-speed rail would be expected to reduce carbon emissions relative to air travel, but it would increase carbon emissions in the construction phase, and construction would most likely take several decades. Uh, now, whilst there are the barriers, um, we want to just touch on some of the issues in our amendments. We want Infrastructure Australia to undertake economic assessments and cost-benefit analysis of this project. Uh, we want that. We thought you, the Labor Party, uh, Mr. Deputy President, Acting Deputy President, wanted that too. But unfor we took uh, the Prime Minister at his word when he said major projects under a government that he would lead would actually go through an Infrastructure Australia methodology and process prior to approval and funding. That's just unless they're the pet projects of Premier Daniel Andrews a couple of weeks out from a state election. And you won't see any more politicisation of the infrastructure funding under this government than that decision in the October budget that didn't have to be made. We know that the funding isn't going to be flowing for that project uh, till the 24-25 financial year. They could have taken the time and put it through appropriate processes like Infrastructure Australia, but they chose not to because they would have lost the political opportunity that that gave Daniel Andrews in a state election campaign. It's absolutely appalling. Absolutely appalling. Um, so the coalition wants to make sure that this, these projects do go through an Infrastructure Australia process. We do want to make sure they stack up. We do want to make sure that we increase the transparency on decision making. And you know what we also want to do? Make sure that this agency, when they actually look at planning out uh, potential routes of uh, fast rail, that they bother to consult with local communities. Because that's something we have learnt, that unless you actually task these types of agencies to do that work, uh, the bureaucrats in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, Canberra will get their maps out, they'll draw their lines. It all looks tiggity boo, and nobody bothered to check with the locals. Uh, and it, you know what? It ends up happening: a lot of angry people on the ground, a lot of difficult conversations, too late in the process about compulsory acquisitions. Uh, and you might actually learn something that would facilitate better planning. So we, our amendments will ensure this agency does consult with local communities. And our amendments also ensure that one person, just one, just one person of this agency will be from rural and regional Australia. That, because this is where this agency will be looking at delivering these types of projects in the country. And we talk a lot about identity in this place, who's got it, who hasn't, what types of identity they have and what they don't. Well, I tell you what. One of the key parts of my identity is that I am from rural and regional Australia. There's a great song. Um, I think it was the 80s, Mr. Acting Deputy President. But I could be wrong. Great 
Um, but you can. You, uh, um, might be might be earlier. I, I stand to be corrected. I'd help. I'd love some help on that if anyone's got their Google handy. But you can take the girl out of the country, but you can never take the country out of the girl. So no matter if you're living in London, if you're living in Milan, if you're living in Beijing, if you grew up in country Australia, that stays with you your whole life. And we would like that perspective, that um, view of the world to be held by just one person on this agency that will be tasked with delivering these projects into these communities. We will, um, this is as a stark example of why there needs to be greater transparency on the bill. The original um, explanatory memorandum released before the vote in the other place said that there would be no financial impact of the passing of this legislation and that any uh, financial impact of this legislation and this bill would actually be offset in the explanatory memorandum that all of us use as legislators and policy thinkers to inform ourselves about the government's uh, offerings. And yet in the budget in October, the cost of establishing the High Speed Rail Authority was re revealed to be actually 18 million bucks. So it's not zero. Now you on the Labor Party might think that you know, 18 million bucks is a lazy accounting error and doesn't require to be mentioned in the explanatory memorandum um, that it's actually no financial impact. Well, I tell you what, I could do a lot out in country Australia and across our communities with $18 million. I could build some childcare centres. I could actually uh, fund some places uh, for childcare. The budget papers do not say how many years the $18 million will be over or if it's a one-year cost. So the government is not being transparent, even from day one of establishing the authority. It's not clear in the budget measure or in the explanatory memorandum how this cost is being offset. Have they cancelled another project, another infrastructure project, to pay for this? These are the sorts of questions I'll be examining in committee stage. This in and of itself is a breach of trust by the Labor Party that likes to uphold itself as somehow the custodians of accountability and transparency when nothing more uh, could be wrong, as we've seen in the brief time they've uh, held the Treasury benches thus far. The new Labor government has pledged $500 million uh, to the agency, which does not constitute a serious commitment to even the first stage of fast rail project between Newcastle and Sydney. And as I outlined, the former Liberal and National government put $6 billion of actual money into actual track to projects that would actually deliver something out in the community, not half a billion dollars of talk fests. So if the Labor Party was actually serious about delivering this project, rather than delivering for Dan Andrews' $2.2 billion election commitment, they would have put billions of dollars on the table in this budget towards that, rather than the $500 million towards setting up an agency. The coalition amendments will also um, require interaction with the Productivity Commission for more transparency and accountability and, as I said, uh, Infrastructure Australia. And I look forward to the committee stage. Senator Rice. Thank you, Deputy President. High-speed rail represents an incredible opportunity for Australia. We are the last continent that hasn't got high-speed rail, other than Antarctica. And we're, you know, it's good to see that we may be moving away from the station, because there is a real threat that the penguins will get to high-speed rail before we do in Australia. <laughs> the Greens have been advocating for high-speed rail for a very long time, and it's for a whole range of reasons. High-speed rail is critical to be reducing emissions from air travel. High-speed rail will connect our regional centres with the capital cities. It will connect the capital cities, the big cities, with each, other, with each other efficiently and allow us to have zero carbon transport between those cities. And it also enables us to deal with the issue of unsustainable flight noise around airports in our big cities. As I said, 
We have been campaign the Greens have been campaigning for high-speed rail for a very long time, so we are pleased to be supporting this bill to be setting up an authority to actually get those wheels turning and sort of move us away from the station. At the 2010 federal election, we took policy commitments on East Coast high-speed rail to the electorate as part of our vision for a 21st century transport system. And following that election, the Greens made support for high-speed rail a part of our minority government agreement with the Gillard government, and we secured $20 million for the feasibility study for high-speed rail. That wouldn't have happened except for the negotiations with the Gillard government in 2010. And so we know from that feasibility study that high-speed rail really does stack up for Australia. So it's been very frustrating to see that high-speed rail actually has been stopped at the station since then. So we're very pleased to see action happening. At the 2022, the last federal election, our platform had a policy of committing $17.7 billion over the next four years for the initial stages of high-speed rail development and construction, actually spending the money, setting up the authority, yes, but then committing to start spending the money. And this is a critical investment in the future of Australia. It's the type of investment that we need to be making that is going to have transformational impacts on the shape of East Coast Australia. So the Labor government now in setting up this authority have only and and their commitments to high-speed rail have only so far committed half a billion dollars rather than our commitment of 17.7. The 2010 feasibility study estimated that the cost of the overall project from Brisbane to Melbourne would be $114 billion, which is, in 2022 terms, $135 billion. And there's a real concern with this bill that there's no provision for ensuring that this project stays in public hands. This high-speed rail authority could end up overseeing uh, developments that mean that you've got a privatised system, deliver it through public-private partnerships that put the interests of those private investors ahead of the public. And with, that, with Labor only committing at this stage $500 million for a $130 billion-plus project our fear is that most of it, in fact, will be delivered through private financing operations that will undermine the project. I mean, crucial infrastructure like this should remain fully publicly owned, from construction to service delivery. Partial or wholesale privatisation of high-speed rail will lead to chaotic and slowed project delivery, higher prices for passengers, downward pressure on rail workers' wages, and cost-cutting and cost-cutting and corner-cutting on regulations on environmental and social impact, and will mean that the project is not necessarily being delivered in the best interests of good regional planning. The last iteration of high-speed rail that we saw from the private sector, the Clara development, which was all going to be paid for by property uplift, was a case in point of what can happen if you have a private sector approach to high-speed rail. That project, and I'm not sure where it's got at at the moment, I hope that it is now in the dustbin of high-speed rail history, was going to establish, basically take land that was rural land and turn that into the, the, the centres of those cities and pay for the development by the uplift in the value of that land. The big problem with that is, is that those centres were some 15 or 20 kilometres away from the major regional towns. And so what would happen? You would have this centre that, for example, was 20 kilometres away from Shepparton, which would end up in complete devastation and downturn in the existing regional centres. So you might have the private developers doing very well out of the property development costs of the new regional centres, but how about the people that have got their successful businesses, that have got their, their property, their whole town that's been, set, that's been set up in the regional centres that are being bypassed? So we want to see high-speed rail that have developed that's publicly owned and is developed in the public interest that makes sure that the stations of those regional centres along the route are right in the heart of those regional cities. So that it really is, becomes then a very efficient way for people from Melbourne to be able to get to Shepparton and to Albury, for people in the regional centres in New South Wales, the regional centres in Queensland to be able to reach their capital cities. It will transform 
the decentralisation agenda, transform the development of those cities, really mean that the east coast of Australia will genuinely um, have those really thriving, vibrant cities that are then well connected with fast, efficient, zero carbon transport to connect them with each other and to connect them with the capital cities. It will be transformational. It's a wonderful vision to hold that relies upon making sure that this development occurs in the public interest, which is only going to be guaranteed by maintaining public ownership of high-speed rail. And we, I mean, Elizabeth Watson Brown moved an amendment in the House calling on the government to ensure that the whole project remains entirely in public hands, that it's delivered with green steel as much as possible to cut down on emissions in the construction phase and to ensure that local manufacturing is used. And unfortunately, this amendment, and I think all three of those things are incredibly important and would be really valuable additions to this bill, they were voted down by both the government and the Liberal Party. I mean, the cost, yep, $130 billion sounds like a lot of money, but we can afford it. And in particular, you know, the yardstick of what we can afford. We have this government that is committed to implementing the Liberal government's policy of tax cuts to the very wealthy. Which are going to, those stage three tax cuts are going to cost $250 billion over the next decade. Just imagine. You can have $250 billion of tax cuts over the next decade to the rich, to the billionaires, to people earning massive amounts of money who basically wouldn't know what to do with an $11,000 a year tax cut other than just sort of let's have another flight to have a holiday somewhere in, in Europe. Or you could be delivering high speed rail. $130 billion to deliver high speed rail. That's the choice. These are the choices that need to be made. And I know where I would prefer to be spending my money rather than giving $250 billion in tax cuts to the very wealthy. I would prefer to see high-speed rail being built, thanks very much, and I think the majority of Australians would think the same. So, as I said, I mean, our support for high-speed rail it isn't just because we are gunzels, you know, train and tram enthusiasts for people that don't know the word. It's because of those benefits. It's because of the benefits for planning and development, and it's the benefits of having really fast, efficient, zero-carbon travel across the country. I mean, we have some of the busiest flight routes in the world. Melbourne to Sydney is the second busiest domestic flight route in the world. Melbourne to um, Brisbane to Sydney is the world's eighth busiest domestic route. And pre-COVID, these routes had close to 100,000 flights a year, producing enormous carbon emissions. I mean, carbon pollution per passenger for flying is estimated to be 90 kilograms per hour, which means, let's take as an example, trips that we all know well here coming to Canberra. I live in Melbourne. And getting to Canberra requires me to jump on a plane and to fly here. So at that rate of 90 kilograms per hour, my estimate that it's about a cool 75 kilograms of carbon emissions per passenger. So for me, you know, my carbon footprint for flying here to Canberra, 150 kilograms return, which means it totally wipes out all of the efforts I make to reduce my carbon pollution from my travel at home. I ride my bike, I catch public transport, I hardly ever drive my car. I've got a car, it's a very fuel efficient little car that sits in the driveway most of the time. And I estimate that by riding my bike and, and catching public transport, I probably do about 100 kilometres a week that you know, my next door neighbour might otherwise do, um, do by driving. So that 100 kilometres a week, it avoids around 11 kilograms of carbon emissions. I have to wipe out those carbon savings every time I fly to Canberra. 150 kilograms of carbon to have a return trip to Canberra, wiping out my 11 kilograms that I you know, very faithfully do on my bike and my public transport getting around town um, every week in Melbourne. But there is no reasonable option for me. There is not high-speed rail to get me from, Canberra, from Melbourne to Canberra at the moment and back again. I mean, I've tried public transport from Melbourne to Canberra. I did it in the early years of being a senator. Caught the train from um, Melbourne to Albury, and then it's a bus from Albury to Canberra, and I had to leave home early on Sunday morning to get here on Sunday evening. 
The alternative was that I could catch a train and I'd have to change trains in Goulburn at 4 a.m., which I decided probably wasn't a good idea for the beginning of a, a busy Senate week. Basically, there is no option. High-speed rail would give us that option, and not just for us politicians. It would give the option for people to be able to travel between our capital cities, zero carbon, fast, efficient travel. Melbourne to Sydney in under four hours, Sydney to Brisbane in a, in a similar amount of time, which would mean it would slash the amount of air travel. It is an absolutely critical factor in reducing our carbon pollution from flying. And it's there. It is possible. It is economically viable. It is achievable. And we need to be doing. We need to be fast tracking it. We need to get that high speed rail happening at the speed of that high speed rail. And the International Energy Agency has shown that the introduction of high speed rail around the world has led to significant reductions in air travel on many um, specific routes. Paris to London and Seoul to, to Busan, for, for instance. And in these cases, air travel was halved when high speed rail was introduced. And so high speed rail in Australia can do the same thing, massively decreasing our transport emissions and providing people with a high quality, comfortable and enjoyable transport alternative to flying. And I think you know, if you consider all the delays and chaos at airports at the moment as well, people would are begging for that convenient and reliable alternative. And the other issue of reducing air travel is actually reducing the issue of airport noise around cities. And the whole time I've been in the Senate, I have worked with the communities around Melbourne Airport who are really, really affected by increasing airport noise in the suburbs around Melbourne Airport, which is set to increase. We've got Melbourne Airport now proposing a third runway, and the whole city of Brimbank are going to suffer from a massive increase in airport noise, which is not only unpleasant, it actually has demonstrated impacts on people's health and well-being and it has demonstrated impacts on, on childhood development and the ability of kids to, to be learning at school. These have been documented in terms of the noise of, of excessive air flights flying over residential areas. But when people complain about airport noise around Australian airports, they're basically just told to suck it up. That, oh, well, you live close to an airport, so there's nothing we can do about it. And the people of Brimbank are basically being told the same, that, yep, airport noise is going to increase above their whole municipality, and bad luck, that's how it is. Well, there is something that we can do about it. We can be reducing that amount of air travel. As I said, Melbourne to Sydney is the second busiest domestic air travel route in the world. If we had the number of Melbourne to Sydney flights halved, and I think it would probably be more than that if we had high-speed rail, it would have a significant impact on the noise being experienced around Melbourne Airport. So, I mean, high-speed rail is crucial to cutting flight noise and this pollution long term. So, the, I mean, the only way to truly reduce domestic flight noise in the long run is to reduce the overall number of domestic flights in Australia, in Australia and high-speed rail will be able to achieve that. So, in summary, we welcome this bill. Um, it's a beginning, but there is so much more that needs to be done. And for our future, for our carbon pollution, for, for tranquil, pleasant cities, um, high-speed rail is absolutely essential. Thank you, Senator Ross. I will call Senator Davey, but just let you know we have a hard marker at 12.15. Oh. I could call it now. I could call it now if it makes you feel better. No, it, okay. it's okay. I will, I will continue my remarks because um, this is an important issue. High-speed rail is something that um, this country has been talking about since at least the 1980s. I remember when we got the first XPT between Canberra and Sydney as a uh, boarding school student. I used to jump on the XPT. Still took three hours to get from Canberra to Sydney, but in those days that was actually quite fast. And the XPT was going to be the f front runner for what we were going to develop, which was high-speed rail. And just like the best episodes of Utopia, uh, this is a continuing drama. When you look at Wikipedia and, and look up high-speed rail in Australia, um, it highlights the various fast, faster, fastest, high, higher and higher speed pipe dreams that have captivated various members of this place for almost as long as since the first railway line was built. We have had 
concepts for the very fast train or the VFT, uh, the tilting train speed rail proposal, the East Coast very high speed train scoping study, which I think as a consultant I actually did a desktop um, audit to, to help for. The High Speed Rail for Australia, uh, an opportunity for 21st century Western Fast Rail magnetic levitation line in Melbourne, another VFT between Sydney and Melbourne, which was the study of which was announced by the Rudd government. And at that time, in 2013, it was estimated the cost would be $114 billion. What we now have is $500 million to set up another agency. Now, our side isn't totally innocent on this. In 2019-20, we established the National Faster Rail Agency. We did a lot of work through that agency to look at business cases for higher speed and faster rail between capital cities and regional centres. We allocated $40 million to assess five fast rail corridors. Um, on top of three business cases already underway at the time of establishing that agency, uh, which included the Sydney to Newcastle. In our budget of 2021-22, uh, we set aside one billion, a one billion commitment for the Sydney to Newcastle, Tuggera to Wyong, faster rail upgrade. And this is where the utopia part of it really comes into play, because what is the difference between faster rail and high-speed rail? I would have thought if it's faster, it is ergo higher speed. Um, but when I asked at estimates about the new high-speed rail authority legislation, um, which is the 500 million commitment, I asked, you know, we've got the National Fast Rail Agency already and the High Speed Rail Authority, so which is which and what is what? And the response was, the National Faster Rail Agency is intended to have part of its functions rolled into the High Speed Rail Authority and part of its functions rolled into the department as the High Speed Rail Authority is established. And then they went on to say some of the projects identified and developed through the Nat National Faster Rail Agency are on the books between the Commonwealth and the state and will continue to be on the books until such time as they've either been built or the government makes a different decision. Which is why we are where we are today, Mr President, still talking about it and not doing it. Because we have a change of government, so we change the name of an authority or an agency. We reduce the funding available to that agency to give half of it to the new agency and half of it will get absolved back into the department and we will continue to go round in circles because no government has actually made the hard decision. We had the funding set aside for the Sydney to Newcastle, Tower to Wyong, faster rail upgrade. Why is that business case not being adopted. Why do we have to rename a new agency, go through all of the palaver to rename an agency um, and have the agency that, as I was told by Mr Hallinan from the department, he said, and I quote, I don't think there's enough in the budget to do substantial construction activity, but there's certainly enough in there for detailed planning. So we're setting up an agency with $500 million so they can do more planning, more desktop surveys, more reviews. They're not even going to be able to afford to purchase the, the rail corridor or easements. They will perhaps be able to do some corridor protection and negotiation. That's also a quote from, from the department. But they are in no position to actually start work to purchase easements, and I will Senator continue Dave. my remarks. Thank, Thank you. you, Senator Davey. Now uh, we shall proceed to Senator's statements. Senator Ciccone. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The 27th 
United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP27, has just wrapped up over in Egypt. And I want to take some time today to reflect on uh, Australia's representation at the conference and what lessons that we all can take away from what was discussed. First of all, it's great that Australia can finally be taken seriously at these international conferences. The Liberals and Nationals spent a decade tearing each other apart on the issue of climate change and were completely left behind as the rest of the world recognised the necessity of reducing emissions and the economic imperative for investing in new technologies. Minister for Climate Change and Energy Chris Bowen gave our national statement to the COP27 last Tuesday, and I think this quote really sums up why electing a federal Labor government uh, has had such a positive impact on our international reputation. The minister said that Australia is back as a constructive, positive and willing climate collaborator. And unlike the coalition, Labor does not see investing in new technologies and collaborating with, uh, with our allies as contrary to the national interest. In fact, by sticking its head in the sand on climate change, the Abbott-Turnbull-Morrison government put Australia at an enormous economic disadvantage. Uh, they left us with an ageing energy grid that is not ready for new technologies that we know have, have a part to play as part of our energy mix in order to lower emissions and lower prices. We know that we're playing catch up in this area, but Labor is determined to do everything that we can to become leaders in this space, both to tackle climate change, but also to set up our economy for the future. We know taking climate change that taking climate change seriously is also essential for our relationships with our Pacific neighbours. As Minister Bowen told COP27, climate change is a primary economic and security challenge for our region, and it is a threat to the blue Pacific continent. And I was excited to see that the announcement that Australia is seeking to host the COP31 in 2026 with our Pacific family. But what a difference just six months of real leadership has made. Today I, I also want to focus on the actual climate change solutions that were discussed at COP27, because while there is rightly a lot of focus and interest on new technologies as part of addressing climate change, there is so much more innovation and many good practices in traditional industries, particularly in agriculture and forestry, that will be an essential part of reducing our emissions. And I believe it is really important that we talk about these industries when we're talking about climate change. Entire communities depend on agriculture and forestry. And far too often, the climate change conversation feels like that city folk are talking to workers and their families in the regions, usually without ever setting foot on a farm or in a mill. So we should really be proud of our delegation to COP27, included representatives not just from the National Farmers Federation or the Australian Forestry Products Association, but also the CFMU Manufacturing Division. And it was really good to see a whole collective there representing the industry. This shows that the Albanese Labor government understands that these industries are part of the solution to climate change and lowering our emissions requires a collaborative approach between government and industry. Indeed, at the Australian Pavilion, uh, the Australian Forest Products Association hosted an event with participants from Fiji, Vanuatu, Samoa and the CFMEU Manufacturing Division, talking about how sustainable forestry will play a critical role in mitigating climate change and sustaining livelihoods. One of the most significant outcomes from COP27 is that Australia has become a founding member uh, of the Forests and Climate Leaders Partnership, a new international group that's been tasked with accelerating the contribution of forests to global climate action. United Nations research suggests that 33 million hectares of new plantations are needed to meet future demand and our climate goals. And our delegation highlighted how Australia can actually lead the way 
by achieving our 2030 goal of one billion new production trees. I've spoken many times in the Senate about the significant contribution made by our sustainable forestry industry to achieving our emissions reduction targets. It's quite simple when you think about it. We know that trees absorb carbon, so using timber products stores that carbon. And then new trees are planted to replace the timber that is used for the product. It's great to see the role forestry plays in climate action being recognised and encouraged on the world stage. Assistant Minister for Climate Change and Energy, Senator Jenny McAllister, spoke at the Keeping 1.5 Alive through Growing the Climate Smart Forestry based Bioeconomy bio, uh, Panel at COP27, along with representatives from other government and industry bodies. The panel considered new research that urges nations to grow their sustainable forest industries, thereby addressing an emerging global timber and wood supply gap as the world pivots to climate-friendly supply fibre supplies. This research clearly shows that we are already doing what we knew. Demand for timber products is increasing, and if we do not support sustainable forestry, this demand will either be met by unsustainable source timber or by other products that do not have the same climate benefits and may even contribute to high emissions. This is one of the great frustrations that I have with environmentalists. They do everything they can to disrupt the forestry industry in my home state of Victoria. We have one of the most sustainable forestry industries in the world with very strict regulations, but nothing is there enough for these activists, most of whom who live in inner city and have never spoken to a timber worker in their life but are hell-bent on destroying the livelihoods of thousands of workers and affecting dozens of regional communities. But what, but what actually occurs when these people succeed in their goal of disrupting Australia's sustainable industry forests? Demand for timber products is not decreased. Instead, buyers, consumers, have to source these products from forests overseas that are not sustainably managed. And I've been engaged in this debate for years now. I've never heard of one of these activists explain to me how this is good for the environment or lowers our emissions. But it is great to see, Acting Deputy President, that world leaders know better, that they are recognising the need to expand the production of sustainable forest products. AFPA and the NFF collaborated at COP27 to showcase how agriculture and forestry can work together on innovation climate solutions. Just one example uh, I just wanted to highlight here was a Victorian red meat and tree farmer, uh, Mark Wooten, who spoke at the event with these peak bodies. And I just want to read a quote from Mark to the chamber because I think it demonstrates how agriculture and forestry are an essential part of the solution to climate change. Mark said, about 20 per cent of our land has been converted to trees half of that for farm forestry and half for biodiversity. The benefits have been amazing. We are now able to carry a far greater number of sheep and cattle thanks to the shelter that the trees have provided, reducing losses from wind chill. There have been also marvellous biodiversity dividends. We have counted 45 bird species in the late 1990s and now have more than 170. In addition, we are soon to benefit from a major financial gain when our production trees are harvested for timber. So Mark's example is a real wake-up call that environmental interests and industry in interests do not need to be opposed. They don't clash. In fact, they work and complement one another. So far too often we see politicians and activists spurring on this opposition from their own political ends whether it be some political parties trying to boost their support in the inner city by campaigning against the industry in regional Australia or the Conservatives telling voters in regional seats that action on climate change will have a negative impact on their communities. These cynical political tactics don't stack up against the reality that the development of industry in regional Australia is essential if we are to meet our climate goals. This is not Federal Labor's approach. What we are trying to do is bring Australians together 
to confront the big challenges like climate change, not wedging people against each other. And I'm glad this approach was endorsed and reflected at COP27. Loath to interject on you, Senator Ciccone, but thank you very much. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. And I rise today to point out that those calling for the end of mining in this country are also calling for the end of our economy as we know it the end of many small family-owned businesses and the end of high-paying regional jobs, the end of royalties and taxes flowing into government coffers to pay for roads, for schools, for hospitals, and the end of serious investment, $27 billion over which 82 per cent was spent within the Queensland economy alone. These are especially significant when you extrapolate those numbers across the rest of the country. And it is one thing for anti-mining campaigners to tweet angrily about this industry, but they completely miss the point, notwithstanding the fact that their mobile devices wouldn't exist without mining, but it is hypocrisy abounding in such circles. It is a great shame that mining's contribution to our lives is ignored by many of our thought and policy leaders, many who work in this place, giving oxygen to the fears of children who believe mining is destroying their futures and inspiring people to glue themselves to the road. This month, the Queensland Resources Council received, uh, uh, released their eighth Code Effectiveness Report 2021, and this is a review of the code of practice for local content, uh, content expenditure. Now, this is a terrifically important document because it does it measures the very things that, as a community, as a society, we have an expectation that our significant miners, uh, no matter what sector they're in, are contributing in all sorts of ways uh, to this to this country. But in particular, I just want to talk about what's happening in Queensland. Uh, this report shows that spending by mining and energy companies on local goods and services rose by a billion dollars, four per cent, and it's expected to increase this financial year. Now, 82 per cent of the $27.7 billion of expenditure was spent in Queensland. That is money that goes to uh, businesses, small, medium and large. It ensures a private sector employment and remembering that the mining sector has double the average wage of salaries in this country. And average salaries in Australia currently sit at $92,000 per year. So these are incredibly well-paid jobs. And in Brisbane, which is home to thousands of FIFO miners and mining head offices, what would imagine what would happen? to Queensland's capital if you ripped $14.2 billion out of its economy. While the size of Brisbane and its diverse business interests may be able to cushion the blow, transport that loss of spending to places uh, that are in more distant places, such as Blackwater, Capella, Thierry, Dysart, Chinchilla and Oakey. And these towns are filled with family-owned companies servicing the nearby mines and gas works. There are engineering firms, bakeries, service stations, laundromats, cleaners, caterers, tyre businesses and environmental services. I think this is an, a significant part of the, of the mining story that is sometimes lost, that, that mining companies employ more environmental scientists and undertake more environmental research surveys and programs than any other sector in the country. Uh, it is mining that ensures that the high standard of regulation demanded by government uh, at a state and federal level are met. This is something that mining companies, miners, are determined to achieve, and their ESG responsibilities are something that they are incredibly proud of. The Mackay region welcomed $5.49 billion in direct spending across 2020-21, well ahead of other mining hubs across the state. And the Isaac region, home to 27 operating coal mines, welcomed $2.12 billion in direct spending, while Gladstone reaped $2.12 billion and the Central Highlands $1.28 billion. These, this report is an important measure of the contributions 
of these companies supporting local businesses and supply chains in the regions in which they operate in right across Queensland. And the money has enormous flow on benefits, not to mention the royalties and taxes on top of these figures that go, as I said before, to roads, to schools, to hospitals and all of those services that we expect government to provide. Mining companies and businesses are also embedded in their local communities. They sponsor sporting teams, they fund community infrastructure like pools and playgrounds, but most importantly of all, they provide the well-paid, purposeful, meaningful work that allows Queenslanders to have a quality of life that would not exist without the operations of these mining companies. Because in these regions, it is miners that provide the jobs that allow uh, Indigenous kids and, and every other young kid, young family uh, who is in the regions to have well-paid, meaningful work. Well-paid, meaningful work. This is incredibly important because we expect uh, our miners uh, to, to be good corporate citizens, and yet they are doing the thing that allows people right across the state uh, to, to live a great life. One in every six jobs and one in every five dollars spent in Queensland can be linked to resource companies. But what is happening at a government level? Well, in Queensland, the state government has increased royalties. Three years ago, it was an increase in gas royalties and, most recently, completely unconsultative, an increase in coal royalties. This sent a shockwave of monumental proportions, not just through the coal community but through every mining and resource business in Queensland. It sent a level of uncertainty uh, for investment, but in addition, the, the Japanese ambassador uh, and other trading partners have expressed their serious concern about whether or not Queensland and Australia is a secure and stable trading partner, whether or not we will continue to be able to provide the energy reserves and resources that they need to operate their own economies. And we had most recently the Japanese Prime Minister fly to Australia to have exactly that conversation. The Resources Minister uh, was last weekend in Japan having the same conversation with her counterparts to try and deflect from the fact that both at a state and federal level, Labor is determined to kill the goose that lays the golden egg for this nation. BHP and other companies have already scaled down operations in response to royalty hikes. They are very clearly telling, investor, uh, telling uh, these governments that they are now unable to make business investment decisions in these places. They are instead looking at competing jurisdictions overseas. And we know that there will be projects and those billions of dollars that I started by talking about, the 82 per cent that spent in Queensland alone uh, and 98 per cent which is spent in Australia. This is just from Queensland investment. But that money will not be spent in this country. It will go offshore and it will damage our quality of life. Because this government, this federal Labor Party, this federal Labor government and the state Labor government does not have a plan to replace this section of our economy. They do not have a plan to ensure that Queenslanders and Australians will continue to enjoy the quality of life that they have currently. They have no plan. They have a cabinet that's divided. And we know that the uh, renewable sector that they are putting all their eggs into that basket does not employ the same number of people, does not have the same well-paid number of jobs that we are used to in Queensland and in Australia. They certainly do not have them in the regional places with the investments in regional communities that we have got used to in this country. There is no plan to successfully convert our economy, our electricity, our jobs, our royalties and tax regimes in the absence of our resources sector in this country. Uh, I think this is incredibly dangerous. 
incredibly dangerous, and Australians and Queenslanders should be furious that we are threatening the economic prosperity, the environmental prosperity and the future of our children and our grandchildren for a short-sighted rush to change this economy. Senator Shoebridge. Acting Deputy President, I've seen the video of Sydney icon Dan Danny Lim and the police violence he was subject to yesterday, and it is genuinely shocking. Danny, a 78-year-old man, a peaceful man, was tackled by two police officers in public and his face smashed into the ground. He can be heard in the video calling out for help. This is in the centre of Sydney. The last update we received is he has a fractured skull and bleeding on the brain. He's still in hospital as I speak now. Our thoughts are with him. Danny, if you're hearing us, we wish you a speedy recovery. But Danny was wearing his signature sandwich board, which has a misspelled four-letter word on it. One I won't say in this place, but one which is definitely not as offensive as the brutality he was subjected to yesterday. It's the same word that was on a sandwich board in 2019 when police arrested and took Danny to court. And that case was thrown out with the magistrate saying the arrest then was heavy-handed and unwarranted and that the sign was cheeky but not offensive. Smashed to the ground yesterday for a cheeky sign. Seems they've learned nothing. Don't worry, say the New South Wales Police. There's now an independent review happening of yesterday's uh, assault. Well, we're still worried because it's not independent, because we know it'll be police investigating police, and that only works for police. There are never any consequences for violent officers, and nothing seems to change. It's not just a few bad apples, and it's not just one police force. It's a pattern of violence, racist policing, where there are no consequences. In WA, a report just this week shows 61 per cent of the people attacked by police dogs, some kids, were First Nations peoples. In Queensland, another scathing report this time uh, shows in horrific detail the deeply racist and sexist actions of many serving police in that state, but not a single police officer has been fired or faced a serious sanction. There aren't any other jobs I can think of where you can violently assault an elderly man wrongfully, brutally, and be sure to keep your job. Police forces don't just need more training. They need root and branch overhaul and a system of oversight with real consequences for bad behaviour. At a time when integrity and transparency are the flavour of the day, it's time to apply exactly those standards to all police in this country. Four Corners expose of Australia's youth detention centres is a national shame and, and a reminder of institutional abuse in our criminal justice system, a system that seems to condone the routine violation of human rights. Children in jail are our most vulnerable, our most neglected and most marginalised children. And in the first half of this year, there have been 285 instances of self-harm and 20 attempts at suicide at the Banksia Hill Youth Detention Centre alone. Just pause on that for a moment. Just one jail, just one child jail. And in 2016, we all remember when news broke about the appalling violence in Don Dale. And as a nation, we vowed to shut it down and stop abusing children like that. And yet here we stand six years later and it's still open for business. Instead of supporting and funding child prisons that repeat and aggravate the cycle of misconduct and reoffending, we need to turn those billions of wasted dollars towards supporting kids, not jailing kids, rehabilitation and recovery. We must not look away from these disturbing reports, the disturbing, dis disturbing statistics, and, and, and just simply allow business as usual to continue. Australia continues to, perpet to perpetuate its tragic and shameful past of invasion and colonisation through this systemically racist criminal justice system. When we know it targets poor kids and First Nations kids, and some as young as 10 years old. These are systems of institutionalised abuse that incarcerate children, breed inter intergenerational tra trauma, and will take us backwards. And it's not time for more reports or for more recommendations. It's time to take the only action that really matters. It's time to close all children prisons in Australia. And I want to thank Nirvana for these words and thoughts. When it comes to cybersecurity, Medibank must be breathing a sigh of relief this week as it looks at the government's empty promises 
while millions of Australians are reeling from their sensitive information being compromised and shared. The new penalty regime proposed by the Albanese government for, for privacy breaches, after the Optus, Medibank, Woolworths, Vinomofile, the list goes on, probably another one this morning. After those hacks, that new, that new proposed penalty regime will see businesses facing fines of up to $50 million for privacy breaches. Or if the company benefited, they could be fined up to 30 per cent of their annual turnover. Sounds great. However, after we heard from the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner in the privacy inquiry last week, we know that that office does not have the funds to prosecute these companies, even with the new super penalty uh, on the statute books. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner has an annual budget of just over $30 million. And with that, it's got to fulfil multiple roles. FOI, privacy, regulator. And we know that it'll cost five and a half million dollars just to investigate Optus. And yet the OIC has thousands, more than 2,000 FOI reviews that are delayed a year or longer, some as long as four years old. And that's because of their lack of resources. So the $50 million fine is not much use. If the regulator lacks the funding to undertake the investigation and prosecution, then any more than one serious case at a time. The OIC's excessive workload and, a lack, of and, and lack of funding risks the failure of the fines to act as a deterrent. And Medibank will know this. Woolworths will know this. The next major corporate will know this. Without the investment needed in the OIC, these fines are little more than a headline. There is a real danger that corporate Australia will see the new fines and the inability of the regulator to bring a prosecution and just shrug their shoulders. We need joined up policy and public interest law reform that's matched with the funding to make it work. That's how we keep our data safe. And I want to thank Sally for pulling that piece together. How long will Palestinians be forced to wait for the most basic of rights, for freedom and for peace with justice? For decades now, Australia has been telling Palestinians to negotiate with Israel, to be a partner for peace. Let's take a moment to reflect on who the Palestinians have been asked to negotiate with now. Israel has just elected its most far-right government in history, and that's saying something. Australia's foreign minister has said that Australia's position as a friend of Israel will not be affected by the inclusion of far-right parties in the new Netanyahu-led government. So who are our new friends? Israeli Prime Minister-designate Benjamin Netanyahu will form government with parties of the far right, the Religious Zionist Alliance, which now form the third largest bloc in the Knesset. They're explicitly anti-Palestinian, explicitly anti-LGBTQI rights and ultra-conservative. And Jewish Party power leader Itamir Ben-Gavir, who wants to be police minister, was convicted in 2007 for supporting a terror organisation and inciting racism. He said he wants to legislate to strip citizenship from, and I quote, anyone working against Israel from within Israel. He recently attended a memorial of the late far-right movement leader, Mir Kahane, whose violent anti-Arab ideology included calls to ban Jewish Arab intermarriage and for the further mass expulsion of Palestinians. Kahane was considered so offensive that Israel banned his party from running for the Knesset, and the US, amongst other countries, listed it as a terrorist group. Religious Zionism party leader Be uh, Bezalil Smotrich also has a history of racism and he said the murder of a Palestinian family by Israeli settlers was not terrorism. Netanyahu has actively worked to ensure uh, these figures are elected and these extreme elements are likely to be given senior government positions in the new Israeli government. This is, this is all led by Netanyahu, who himself has said there will be no Palestinian state under his watch. And we only need to look to his record of aggressive settlement expansion to know on this point, at least, he's speaking the truth. Make no mistake, illegal Israeli settlements in the occupied West Bank have grown under every single Israeli government for the past half century, despite consistent international opposition. There are now roughly three quarters of a million Israeli settlers living illegally on occupied Palestinian territory. 2022 is also on course to be the deadliest year for Palestinians in the occupied West Bank on record. And that's before this frightening new government has even taken office. The rise of the far right in Israel heralds an even more terrifying and dangerous time for Palestinians. So why is the Albanese government behaving like business as usual? This is the time for Prime Minister Albanese 
and Foreign Minister Penny Wong to explicitly call out an extremist Israeli government. That's the least we could expect from a party and a government that goes on the record and says it wants to be a friend for Palestinians, a friend for peace, justice and freedom. Well, who are they really friends of? Senator Brown. Um, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. Before I begin my, the main subject of my speech, I want to address the debate which occurred in this place this morning over a bill which claims to prohibit the indoctrination of children. And I want to make it clear to young LGBTIQ plus community members who may have been listening that they are loved and treasured and value and know that um, views that are grounded in fear and disinformation, be it loud, will never win. I want to start my contribution with a quote. We now must be weary of wherever we think is our sanctuary." End quote. This is just one of the recent tributes after the horrific shooting of club Q, at Club Q, a gay nightclub in Colorado. It was absolutely heartbreaking to see another hateful attack directed at a vulnerable minority group. And I send my condolences to the family and friends that have lost loved ones so unnecessarily. Like many of our proud gay, lesbian, bisexual, trans, intersex and queer venues here in Australia, Club Q was a safe place for self-expression without judgment. These are places where, where everyone, especially the LGBTIQ plus community, should be able to be themselves and love without fear. In my home state of Tasmania, there is a proud and vibrant LGBTIQ plus community that regularly comes together to celebrate and support each other. This weekend, even, the now iconic Limbo Party will be held in Hobart. This is just one example of a proud and inclusive community coming together to create a safe space where young people are supported to be their authentic selves. At the same time, Pride will be taking centre stage at Limbo. The harmful practice of conversion therapy continues to remain legal in Tasmania. The Tasmanian parliament is currently debating the ban of this practice. But there is a loud min minority that want us to continue this shameful and unfounded practice that harms and traumatises young people across Australia. We have seen state and territory governments of all persuasions ban conversion therapy. As more and more jurisdictions move in the right direction, those left allowing the practice risk becoming safe havens for conversion therapy. Our young LGBTIQ plus people deserve respect and acceptance, not to be vilified. In 2022, it is disappointing and sad that we are even having to have these debates. Mr Acting Deputy President, I extend my sincerest solidarity to the members of the LGBTIQ plus community facing more uncalled for public com commentary about how they express themselves and who they love. Despite its history of discrimination and segregation directed at LGBTIQ plus folks, the Tasmanian community in 2022 is a progressive and supportive community. In the Australian Marriage Law Postal Survey in 2017, nearly 64 per cent of Tasmanian respondents voted yes to allow same-sex couples to marry, a survey which in its very principle gave a platform to those with an inclination of spreading hate, fear and often extreme misinformation at the expense of those simply wanting to express their love through marriage. Although it can be hard, remembering our history is important because without reflecting on our past, we could easily find ourselves back in a place where hate and intolerance finds itself a home in our communities. Before, during and after the public debate about the decriminalisation of homosexuality in the late 1990s, there was a stark and devastating 
increase in young gay men suiciding. In 1988, the Tasmanian Gay and Lesbian Rights Group formed, and within months, the Hobart City Council banned the group's stall at Salamanca Market. Thanks to pro protests, the ban was removed within a matter of weeks, and the group remains active at the market to this day. In 1997, Tasmania also became the latest state in Australia to de decriminalise homosexuality. But these days, it is so great to see local members of the LGBTI community place, plus community hike, uh, hiking together over the weekend as part of the Wellington Wanderers or dancing the night away at Limbo, or both. Ten years ago, I stood, I stood in this place and delivered a speech in the second reading of a Marriage Amendment Bill 2012, a private member's bill sponsored by former Senators uh, Trish Crossan and Gavin Marshall, as well as Senator Louise Pratt and myself. Here is a paragraph that remains true to this day. Having a full life means having the right to love and means having the right to follow your heart. For some people, that does not involve marriage. For others, it must mean marriage. It is the way they declare and swear their love in, to the world. They want to enter into a union acknowledged by the state to which they belong as adult citizens. For me, a marriage is a commitment between two adults who make this choice together. The quality of the marriage will depend on their personal commitment and determination. They were the words I spoke during the second reading debate ten years ago. And not long ago, people believed that people of different religious beliefs should not marry because that could not be a good marriage. In a good many places, that claimed to be civilised. People of different ethnic backgrounds were also forbidden to marry. It was said that civilisations would fall if such marriages were allowed. Somehow, miraculously, Civilization has survived. In 2017, five years later, after I delivered that speech in this place, an act titled the Marriage Amendment Definition and Religious Freedoms Act passed through the Senate on the 7th of December and received royal assent the following day. And I would like to add that the sky, as predicted by some, didn't cave in that night. Australia voted for marriage equality, but a whole lot of people were able to dissent, and a whole lot of people have, were able to de demonstrate their love, how they wanted and deserved through marriage. This weekend, Victorians will have the privilege, I hope, of re-electing a progressive government, a government led with an unwavering commitment to equality and an unwavering unwavering commitment to justice. Under the leadership of Premier Dan, Daniel Andrews, the Victorian government has delivered for LGBTIQ plus Victorians. Through the Victorian Pride Centre, the Victorian Commission, Commissioner for LGBTIQ plus communities and Pacific Grant programs to support LGBTIQ plus Victorians. Instead of governing for government's sake, the Victorian government, in their own words, won't rest until equality is achieved for LGBTIQ plus people. In contrast, the Victorian Liberals campaign has been overshadowed by claims of Pentecostal groups and the hard right infiltrating the Liberals. Not only do some endorsed Liberal candidates subscribe to anti-same-sex marriage, it has been revealed that some of their candidates have said state racist statements about our First Nations community. Rightly, these candidates have been publicly criticised for their, their views and statements. So this weekend, Victorians truly have a choice, and a pretty obvious one if you ask me, to vote for a government which will continue the work so many Victorians have benefited from, or a Liberal Party that is more eager to divide the community. The election in Victoria is a clear choice. Here in this place, the times have changed as well. Australia's voted for a federal government that will care for people, no matter their gender or sexuality. They voted for a government that will not stand by why people are actively discriminated. 
and, they, and you won't find this government budding up with organisations that actively support conversion therapy and believe that someone's, someone's expression of their gender is predatory. We are a government which will stand up against bigots and bullies when they attempt to use sexuality or gender to pit communities against one another. A government which believes that every Australian, without exception, deserves to be safe, supported and equal. It is a government that I am so proud Order. to be part Your of. Your time has expired. Senator Hume. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This Saturday, the people across my home state of Victoria will head to the polls to vote in what is possibly the most important election that Victoria has faced in 30 years. It's been a very dark time for Victoria. The institutions and the services that we have relied upon have been left to fail and to founder. Our health system, our children's education and well-being, our integrity and our justice system, our financial and our fiscal position, all have been whittled away by a government and a premier obsessed with power at the expense of people. For two years, Victorians suffered at the hands of a government whose responsibility it was first and foremost to protect them. Draconian lockdowns, school closures, business closures, travel restrictions, curfews that we haven't seen even in wartime before that saw families torn apart, businesses ruined, lives and livelihoods damaged irreparably. We should never forget that Victorians were forced to carry permits to go to essential work, that playgrounds and skate parks were taped off like crime scenes. The police were tasked with moving on elderly citizens for sitting on a park bench or from dispersing children who were congregating secretly because they had missed the social contact of 186 days of their schooling. They government, uh, they, the police were tasked also with arresting pregnant women from their homes for daring to question government's priorities on social media and, for, and firing rubber bullets into crowds of peaceful protesters. This was my state. This was my state. And it was all done without scrutiny, without scrutiny because Parliament was shut down and extraordinary powers were bestowed on those in charge long after such powers were necessary. This was my state for two dark years and we are changed forever because of it. And on the other side, what are we left with? With skyrocketing debt and deficit, 47 new and increased taxes, cost blowouts in the billions for public works, a failed health system that quite frankly brings fear into the hearts of any Victorian who is elderly, who is injured or who is unwell, and the stench of corruption from countless inquiries into government members and to government decisions and the office of the Premier, bloated and contemptuous, surrounding their leader with spin and ring-fencing him from scrutiny. We cannot continue like this. Yeah, Victorians yeah. deserve so much better. The people of Victoria have the opportunity to vote for change, for integrity, and vote to fix our health crisis. Matt Guy and the Liberals have put forward a positive agenda that will deliver real solutions to the problems that Victoria faces, and it is a comprehensive plan that fixes the health care crisis without raising taxes. It puts the end to Daniel Andrews' era of spiralling debt and higher taxes, rewarding hard-working Victorian families, helping small businesses, Order. restoring integrity and accountability in government and building stronger communities. Victoria needs new government now more than ever before. Under an Andrews Labor government, state debt has increased to more than New South Wales, Queensland and Tasmania combined. The projected deficit for 22-23 has blown out from just below $8 billion to more than $10 billion. This is a 30 per cent blowout in just six months alone. And the lagging household disposable incomes of Victoria mark a decade of financial decline. The Andrews government is focused on entirely the wrong priorities. Indeed, Dan Andrews himself can't say how much his signature project, the Suburban Senator Rail Loop, Senator will cost. Hume. I will Senator call him by Hume. his correct Thank name. You. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. But the Premier says whatever it is, he'll pay for it. That's fine. The Victorian Parliamentary Budget Office has estimated that for the first two stages that might blow out 
to as much as $125 billion. Now, that would make it the most expensive infrastructure project in Australia's history. And this is despite the fact that an Auditor General, the Victorian Auditor General, has said it will only return just over 50 cents in every, every dollar spent. This is a project that does not stack up. It's a vanity project. It's an exercise in ego. But we have a Premier in Victoria that refuses to change his mind. Matt Guy, on the other hand, has committed to end this waste by shelving the Cheltenham to Box Hill rail line and diverting every single dollar available from this project to fix Victoria's health crisis. Ambulances are ramping. Surgery wait lists remain at stagnant record highs, and children needing vital chemotherapy treatment are being turned away from hospitals. The new Guy government will fix this crisis. The, the Liberals have committed to providing an additional 50,000 surgeries, halving elective surgery time wait lists and halving dental wait lists, training an additional 40,000 nurses, building or upgrading 20 hospitals and fixing the triple O so that when you are ill or when you are injured, somebody, somebody comes to help. These are real solutions that will put an end to Labor's health care crisis. Daniel Andrews has been in charge, sorry, the Premier has been in charge of uh, Victoria's health system as minister or premier for the last 11 of 15 years. And as much as he tries to wriggle out of it, he cannot escape responsibility for this crisis. Victoria has a premier who deplores accountability. But Matt Guy and the Victorian Liberals have a plan to restore integrity and accountability in Victoria. More funding for the Victorian Anti-Corruption Commission. More funding for the Ombudsman, more funding and powers for the Parliamentary Budget Office, future pandemic management plans, keeping schools open and no vaccine mandates. And of course, no Victorian will be allowed to ever forget those lockdowns. The impact that they had on the hundreds of thousands of school children. Now, I've been on the ground of Victoria and everywhere I go, Victorians are sick of this sick government and its distorted priorities. They are sick of the stonewalling, they're sick of the accountability, of the lack of accountability. But I have had the extraordinary pleasure of being with some outstanding candidates across Victoria who will deliver real change for Victorians, like John Pursuto in Hawthorne, who is a dear friend of mine. He's lived in the area for 25 years and he continues to demonstrate that boundless energy to support the people of Hawthorne inside and outside parliament. And Jess Wilson in Kew, who brings such a brilliant policy brain and a real understanding of what matters to people in Kew. Matthew Lucas in Paran, Debbie Taylor Haynes in Bentley, Lucas Moon in Richmond, and Nicole Werner in Box Hill. These are outstanding candidates who have been recruited for all that they love and all that they can contribute to my great state of Victoria. They demonstrate the kind of talent that Victoria needs in its parliament to see it through what are going to be a number of challenging years ahead. And they'll join Michael O'Brien and other members of Matt Guy's excellent parliamentary team like Michael O'Brien, the Shadow Attorney General, and of course he is also my friend and local MP, and a tireless advocate for his community. David Southwick in Caulfield, who understands small business and how they've been impacted by the pandemic and has been truly instrumental in coming up with the policy, positive policies that will revitalise small business across Victoria. And Brad Rosewell in Sandringham, who as Deputy Chair of the Integrity and Oversight Committee has been holding the Andrews government to account wherever he possibly can, wherever this government has allowed him to do so. These are just a few of the very talented team that Matt Guy has assembled. He and his team have a comprehensive plan that delivers real solutions to the issues facing Victorians. Their real solutions plan demonstrates that they are safe, that they are sensible, that they are mainstream and that they are ready to govern. But Victorians need to understand one thing. There is only one way to get rid of this bad Dan Andrews-led government. There is only one way to do that, and that is to vote Liberal and National on Saturday, not for anybody else. You cannot vote for anybody else and guarantee that you will get rid of Dan Andrews and this Senator bad, Hume. this terrible, this, 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 damaging, this damaging state government. That is why it's so important on this Saturday 
this Saturday in my state of Victoria that Victorians step up, that they get out, that they vote and that they think long and hard about what these last few years have meant for them, what it's meant to have their children taken out of school for 186 days, what it's meant to be separated from their elderly parents for so many months who have been stuck in aged care, unable to be visited by family and by friends, what it's meant to have their freedoms and their liberties taken away, and what it's meant to be spoken down to by a contemptuous, by an arrogant, by a self-centred government and a leader that simply must go. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I have to say I've, I'm going to speak about the Victorian elections again, and I have to endorse what Senator Hume has said, except from the part of only voting for the Liberal National Party. But um, Victorians go to the polls this week, and what a choice they have to make. Um, they can vote for more of the same, record debt, actually $170 billion, and an unaccountable government like who's my way or the highway under Labor, led by Premier Dan Andrews. Or they can vote for, a, for um, the, um, the coalition government, um, and they've, um, there is an alternative there. But I'd say the coalition is probably a better choice than the Labor government, and some good Conservative minor party candidates, they deserve consideration. Or you can actually vote for the, the logic and reason waste. Their on votes are on radical Marxist greens. So you have a great choice there. Well, I think vote for the party which puts them, their state and their country first, which is one nation. And I've always stood, stood up and fought for the values of the Australian people in this country. One nation will demand accountability for the direct attacks on democracy and freedom that were part of the longest, hardest and most ruinous pandemic lockdown in the world. One Nation will pursue this through a Royal Commission into the management of the COVID-19 pandemic, pandemic that everyone seems to want to back away from and doesn't want re um, to answer the Australian people. Our party will champion energy independence, security, reliability and affordability. We'll push for Victoria's vast gas reserves to be used to the benefit of the Victorian people. We'll push for a second interconnected across Bass Strait and for the expansion of fuel storage facilities at Geelong. We'll advocate for measures to improve water and food security. One Nation supports expansion of the Big Buffalo Dam and more certainty about water allocations for the state's irrigators. We'll work to improve education outcomes with a focus on critical skills and thinking and education instead of indoctrination. We'll work to arrest the slide of Australian educational standards. We'll work to improve health services, especially in regional Victoria, tightening obligations on medical graduates to ensure they work in regional areas in return for assistance with their health hex debt. We have a strong, workable policy to address the rental and housing crisis in Victoria, banning foreign ownership of residential property to increase supply, lowering immigration to reduce demand and eliminating red tape, which is slowing the release of land. We'll hold the government to account, working to implement recommendations from IBAC and the Ombudsman. They are being ignored by the tyrannical Premier Andrews government. We will advocate long-term investments in infrastructure, especially in regional areas, that will underpin Victorian prosperity for decades to come. Upgrades to the Princess Highway and Bass Highway are our priorities, as is the massive backlog in regional road maintenance. One Nation will be the champion of revitalising Victoria's regional rail networks, and we will work to scrap the useless over-budget Metrolink, nothing more than a vanity project. Um, for Premier Dan Andrews. We will implement policies to support a skilled and flexible workforce, revitalising vocational education and establishing innovation hubs in regional areas. And most importantly, One Nation will be resolute in the defence of fundamental democratic principles like freedom of speech, religion, association and assembly. These principles came under direct and sustained attack by the tyrannical Andrews Labor government, which shamelessly used intimidation, heavy-handed police tactics and surveillance to force the Victorian people into compliance. We will not allow that to happen ever again. To the people of Victoria, I also say make very sure your vote and your preferences go to the candidate who is going to work for you and your interest. Election campaigns are like a job interviews, and voters are the employer 
Select the candidate who is going to represent you and your community and fight for your rights. With the revelations of Victorian voters being deliberately misled by cynical manipulation of our upper house vote group voting tickets. The only safe vote above the line for the Victorian upper house is one nation, but we strongly encourage you to vote below the line. I wish Victorians all the best for the future of their state, um, which is in the hands this coming Saturday. And I commend to the One Nation team in Victoria, our candidates, members and volunteers for a great campaign that has always put Victoria and Victorians first. And Heaven help Victoria if the Daniel Andrews and his Labor government gets Order. voted back Your in again. Time has expired. Senator Dodson. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President. Uh, the Uluru Statement is an invitation to the nation, and it requires a response from the nation. It was given to us in goodwill by the 1,200 First Nation representatives that participated in 13 regional meetings across the country in 2016 and 2017. The 250 delegates that they selected to attend the final constitutional convention at Uluru formed a consensus on how they wanted to be recognised in the nation's constitution. What emerged was a call for voice, treaty and truth. And since that day, the Uluru Statement has travelled the length and breadth of this country, and many hundreds of people from all walks of life have signed their names to it. We as Australians have each been accorded an opportunity to lay a new foundation for our relationship, rather than the one our nation was built on, the lie of terra nullius that there were no people here when the British came. What First Nations people have asked is a very simple thing, a say in how the parliament makes laws about their well-being and their lives. It will give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples a say on the issues that affect them. After 250 years, not a bad idea. By allowing communities to say, to have a say on their destinies, and that will improve their lives and their circumstances. The government's role is to ensure that the bricks and mortar of a referendum are sound, that we give the Australian people the best chance of making a clear and considered decision on a voice to parliament. We are consulting with First Nations leaders and constitutional experts to lay the groundwork for a referendum. We have established three key groups to assist this preparation. A referendum working group of 22 First Nation leaders, all of whom have deep experience on voice, treaty and truth, and whom we know have been working in these spaces for years. The second group is called the Referendum Engagement Group of more than 60 First Nations leaders and community members drawn from the regions across Australia to provide advice on what communities need and to propose ways for First Nations peoples to be meaningfully engaged in the Constitution. And the third group is a constitutional expert group from across the political spectrum to consider the words and the question proposed by the Prime Minister at Ghana this year, and to ensure the ultimate supremacy of the parliament. The work of each of these groups is ongoing. Let me share one part of the work to date, a set of principles for the voice that have been agreed by the working group. It will be a body that provides independent advice to the parliament and the government. It will be chosen by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples based on the wishes of their local communities. It will be representative of those communities. It will be gender balanced and include youth. It will be accountable and transparent. And it will work alongside existing organisation and traditional structures. The voice will not have a program delivery function. 
nor will it have a veto over the parliament or the executive government. And I want to make one thing very clear. <clears throat> the government is here to facilitate and support what is needed to deliver a referendum. A voice to parliament is not the creation of the Labor Party, nor should the referendum be a campaign dictated by politicians. This is for the Australian people. The Aboriginal politicians here represented, we represent our parties and our diverse electorates. And we are not the unified advocacy for First Nations that the voice to the parliament will provide. If the referendum is to succeed, Order. Senator Dodson, your time has expired. Thank you. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. It gives me great pleasure today to rise uh, to thank and acknowledge uh, a young man, uh, Cooper Bates, who was in my office uh, last week, undertaking a voluntary internship from the Young Liberal Movement of Western Australia. Uh, Cooper is currently studying a Bachelor of Commerce with a major in Business Law. Uh, he came into my office, undertook a variety of tasks for the week, and he is a very intelligent and hard-working young man. Uh, to put it in the colloquial terms from the bush, he's got his head screwed on right. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge Jacob Fowler and Hayden Tognella and the Young Liberal team in Western Australia for putting this program together. And I was very happy to be the first guinea pig in the program, but it will be rolled out more widely, I know. So congratulations to you, Cooper. I also wish to speak briefly about the uncertainty that's being created in an industry in my home state of Western Australia and one that's very close to my own heart in the live export trade. As many would know, I come from a farming family and including uh, having participated in the sheep trade uh, for many years. This is a very important industry to Western Australia. It's worth $143 million directly to the agricultural sector, and that's sheep alone. Another $200 million in cattle exports. In total, across Australia, $1.6 billion of overall economic benefit to this country. It employs thousands of workers and it provides a stable floor price for sheep in the West Australian market. Uh, it also provides a stable source of protein to very important trading partners overseas who want to keep importing our sheep particularly uh, because they are of high quality, because the animal welfare standards are the best in the world and because when we export our livestock, we're not just exporting livestock, we are also exporting animal welfare standards. And that is something that I would urge all in this place to remember when we are considering these issues going forward. Unfortunately, uh, in my home state of Western Australia, the industry is under a massive cloud. It's, it's under a massive cloud because this government uh, coming into power has said they are going to stop the trade. Now, this would result in a loss of jobs in Western Australia. It would result in a significant undermining of the sheep meat industry in Western Australia, and it would damage long-term trading relationships with very important trading partners. And this, sadly, will not be limited merely to sheep meat. This has the potential to also flow on to other agricultural and non-agricultural products, and that would be extremely damaging. Nations rely on Australia being a good trading partner. Nations overseas rely on Australia as a source of food and fibre and minerals. And if we, through government fiat, decide to close particular, industry, particular industries down, then how can those trading partners have certainty in other similar industries, in other uh, aspects of agricultural trade that are so important? They will look elsewhere. They will look elsewhere because the principle 
responsibility of those nations is to feed their people, is to make sure that they have the sources of high-quality uh, protein they need for their uh, domestic markets. Australia has been a long-term supplier, particularly into the Middle East from Western Australia. And over those 30, 40, 50 years, we have seen constant, constant improvements in animal welfare standards, to the point now where uh, the, sh the sheep trade in particular has demonstrated quite remarkable results uh, over a consistent period of time now, uh, over not just over the last three years since the Owasi Express incident, but over the past 20 years, constant improvement in animal welfare standards, constant improvement in mortality rates. And that is something I would very much urge the new minister and the government to keep in mind. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Deputy President. Sometimes I feel that we face two very different worlds of work. There's the world on the front page of The Australian, the world of employer organisations and those old-time industrial relations club warriors fighting the workplace battles of last century, those who predict that any tweaking of workplace laws will mean massive industrial action and time travel back to 30 years ago and 1980. They predict the end of the world as we know it. Today it's the Reserve Bank worrying on the front page of The Australian about changes to the law making it harder to hire and fire. And then there's the real world of work out there, the world where people actually go to work and try to have a life, where a third of workers now are insecurely employed, only 13 per cent have a collective agreement, where we've seen falls in real wages for a decade and more to come, where union density sits not at 60 per cent but at less than 15, where half, the world's, half of our workers are now women, where full-time workers are donating six weeks of unpaid overtime to their workplaces every year, a world where there's not enough childcare, where so many workers have no say over their rosters. This is a tale of two worlds. The first is a world of mostly men in suits, a world of hired advocates and opponents of reform, singing from very old song sheets, paid to sow alarmism about the catastrophe of multi-enterprise bargaining, imminent collapse of small business. Out there, in the real world of work, things are different. The issues are not strike action or too little flexibility in the hiring and firing of workers. The issues are who will look after my kids tomorrow while I go to work? What hours have I got next week? If I knock back this shift or try to, try to swap it out, will I ever get another one? And how will I pay for petrol or childcare if I don't get a pay rise? I've been hearing a lot about this other world of work as we've taken our select committee on work and care around the country. Last week, I was in Perth and Albany hearing from locals, people with lived experience of putting together a job with the rest of their life. And in Perth, we heard from a professor of economics, Alison Preston at UWA, about the high, indeed huge penalty, more than half of lifetime earnings that hits carers over their lifetime as they put together jobs with the care of others. This is labour that is essential to our economy. Across Western Australia, childcare centres have waiting lists of between 150 and 200, and when they get that long, you don't bother putting your name down. So you know that we know that there are more people out there looking for childcare, and people make the decision instead to give up work. And businesses across the state, they can't find the workers that they need. If the roads that get us to work every day were functioning at 60 per cent of capacity, keeping people away from work like this, there'd be a national emergency declared. We would have a critical roads to work infrastructure fund of billions, fast. The failures in our work and care system are a failure of critical infrastructure. Yet our shouty, blokey labour law debate, if we can dignify it with that name, is stuck on issues of industrial action, awash with horror stories about the possibility of workers bargaining together for a collective standard amongst like businesses. Meanwhile, millions of employers and workers in small and larger businesses are just getting on with the job. They navigate a failed and inflexible infrastructure, our care system, our leave system, labour law built for blokes last century. 
Amidst this, some workers and employers have great relationships, but where workers rely on their legal rights to get some say over how their work is organised and decent pay, they have too little backup in our workplace laws. And even then, where they do have workplace laws that back them up, they're not enforced. So that today we hear, for example, from the Australia Institute that Australian workers are on average working six weeks unpaid overtime a year, costing over $492 billion in unpaid wages across the economy. Our workplace is increasingly in our phone and in our back pocket, and it's competing with our kids for our time. This is wage theft, and we need to have a labour law and labour arrangements that help us bargain around it and prevent wage theft. We need reform of our labour law, but it needs to leave the tired, old, overstated and alarmist myths of industrial action and business collapse behind and recognise the re reality of men's and women's and children's lives now. We are not in 1980, 1980 anymore. We do not have a wife at home. We are in a world of low unionisation, job insecurity, more working carers and wages suppressed through a lack of collective bargaining. Australian workers need improved Order. workplace laws Time that deal expired. with the work. Senator Green. Uh, thank you very much. I'm very pleased um, to uh, follow um, the good senator and her call for workplace reform. Um, I'm here today to talk about uh, a recent uh, incident with workers uh, in my hometown of Cairns. Um, last Friday I joined a rally of workers in Cairns in far north Queensland. These workers were up against a multinational, multi-billion dollar corporation, one that had been, they have been bargaining with for three years. Svitsa operates tugboats to every major mainland port here in Australia. Workers at the company play an often unseen but critical role in our economy. In Cairns, Svitsa tug workers facilitate the safe passage of fuel, cruise ships and, critically, resources for residents of the Cape and Outer Islands of the Torres Strait in far north Queensland. They ensure Australians who live in remote far north Queensland can continue to keep the lights on and put food on the table. They, are pay, pay, uh, they play a vital role for Australians throughout the pandemic and made record levels of profit for their employer while they were at it. Svitsa, the company I'm talking about here, made a record $21 billion of profit last year alone. It is owned by a global overseas company and their CEO receives millions of dollars each year. But on Friday, 18th of November this year, Svitsa notified their local workforce of their intention to take industrial action against them. And yes, this is the industrial action that those opposite don't want to talk about, that there are companies in this country who seek to lock out their own workforce. This was along with 582 workers across the country. They said they planned to lock the gates out on workers who were ready and willing to work, simply because they had yet to reach an agreement on their future terms and conditions. Well, I showed up uh, to the local rally in solidarity because these workers were willing and able to do their important job, because they play a critical role in the, uh, maintaining the health and safety of my region and so many others in Australia, because it's fundamentally bad for our economy and our supply chain if this critical part of our transport infrastructure is halted, particularly just before Christmas. And I showed up because I'm sick and tired of the way essential workers continue to be treated by those opposite and the interests that they represent. Our government didn't just show up for these workers. We expressed grave concerns to the Fair Work Commission that this corporate industrial action would impart significant economic impact on our economy. The Fair Work Commission listened and ordered the action to be suspended. And last week, these workers were looking down the barrel of locked gates. They were willing and able to return to work, and so they did. But Svitsa went as far as docking the pay of workers in preparation for the lockout, which didn't even go ahead. Now, because of their own solidarity and the support of the government, these workers are back at work. But this is evidence. This is evidence of a broken bargaining system where you have workers in our economy delivering an essential service to people in our communities who are trying to bargain with a global multinational company for years and years and years to get a pay rise. This is what we are talking about when we talk about 
the bargaining system being broken. And when a company seeks to lock out its own workforce instead of sitting down at the bargaining table, well, that is what we're talking about when we're talking about industrial action from a company against its own workers. This is the system that we need to change because workers have been trying to bargain for a pay rise, but they're not getting it. And that is why we are delivering reform in this sector. It now being 1.30, I'm going to move to two-minute statements. Senator Henderson. Thank you, Acting Madine, Madam President. As the former Victorian Police Chief Commissioner Kel Glare said in Peter Credlin's excellent Sky News documentary, The Cult of Daniel Andrews, never in his lifetime has he seen a government as corrupt as the one led by Premier Daniel Andrews. The Premier is currently at the centre of four corruption inquiries. He has left a trail of corruption and cover-up. After turning Melbourne into the world's most locked down city where police fired rubber bullets at protesters, after presiding over a health crisis and a broken triple zero service that caused the deaths of 33 people or the hotel quarantine scandal that killed 801 Victorians, after driving our state into the ground with crippling debt and higher taxes which threatens Victoria's future, after the gross mismanagement of infrastructure projects like the $4.7 billion Westgate tunnel blowout, after the dirty deal with Prime Minister Albanese to funnel nearly all federal infrastructure money for Victoria, $2.2 billion, to the discredited suburban rail loop described today by Macroeconomics Advisory as the worst infrastructure project of all time, I say don't let Victorian Labor get away with it. The only way to end the corruption, combat the cost of living crisis, fix our health system, pay down the debt, lower taxes, deliver real solutions for, for our great state is to vote Liberal National. In the Geelong region, despite massive funding from the former coalition government, we've seen failure after failure from lacklustre local Labor MPs who've taken their seats for granted, vital projects promised by Labor pushed into the Never Never, the Women and Children's Hospital, the rail duplication to South Geelong, the Grub Road Ocean Grove safety upgrade, the Geelong Convention Centre. When local residents were locked out of the state, stranded in cars and caravan parks, these Labor MPs did nothing to bring them home. On behalf of the people of Victoria, I say don't let Daniel Andrews get away with it. Senator Stirl. Well, Madam Acting Deputy President, thank you very much. I'm going to have a lot more to say about this issue, a lot more. Now, on our waterfronts here in Australia, there is white-collar crime going on. Let me tell you, the international shipping companies are getting away with murder. And I'll tell you what they're doing. They're putting the cost of transport straight onto the trucking companies who have to pass it on to all us out there in, in, in the shopping centres and everywhere. And so what actually happened was that the uh, Productivity Commission have done an interim report. I can't wait for the final report. One of their recommendations is they're saying that terminal access charges and other fixed fees for delivering or collecting a container from a terminal should be regulated so that they can only be charged to shipping lines and not to the transport operators. So guess what Shipping Australia Limited has done? They've come out and declared war on the trucking industry. It's the truckies' fault that they're fleecing everyone, but they've finally been caught. Those thieving international-owned shipping companies who do not pay one cent of tax in this nation for the exploited seafarers that they use on our coastal trading. And let me tell you, I'm going to have a lot to say. They want to fight with the trucking company. Well, I'm going to have a fight with them. I'm going to join the trucking industry. Isn't that a shock? But there, I want to talk about the robbed at sea report very quickly. And uh, in the conclusion, I'll just cover this. It says here, seafarers perform difficult, often dangerous work that is essential to the operation of global supply chains, delivering all the merchandise we take for granted in modern life. Yes, they do. But guess what? It's this same mob that's shipping Australia Limited. All these low-life, low-life foreign companies who pay some of these poor seafarers at times two to three dollars an hour. Can you believe the goal of Shipping Australia to want to take on a fight because they've been uh, uncovered? The, the Emperor's clothes have just fallen off and I'm rubbing my hands together, Shipping Australia. I sent out an email to give me a call. I'm still waiting because you don't even have a phone number on your website. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This week, Media Diversity Australia has released a new report titled Who Gets to Tell Australian Stories 2.0? It looks at cultural and racial diversity in free-to-air television news. 
The picture the report paints is neither encouraging nor surprising. Truth be told, it's pretty damning. Among other insights, the report finds that journalists with an Anglo-Celtic background remain vastly overrepresented on television, that Australia's non-European population is at least 19 times greater than the representation on commercial networks, and that they could not identify a single indigenous reporter or presenter at the Seven Network, which has the least on-air cultural diversity. It also finds an underrepresentation of cultural diversity on network boards and in TV news editorial leadership. The Media, Entertainment and Arts Alliance have rightly given it a fail to, uh, rightly given a fail to Australian TV news and current affairs on their cultural and racial diversity report card. The Australian media is still overwhelmingly white. This has enormous consequences for the way that issues are reported on and communities are portrayed. The defensive remarks of media management reported yesterday in response to the report were disappointing to say the least. There is clearly resistance to acknowledging the depth of this problem, let alone getting serious to address it. The media monoculture is not just limited to TV news journalism, which was the focus of this report. Look at the list of this year's Walkley nominees. There are only a handful of journalists of colour across all media forms. There is much work to be done to put an end to a media culture that is still aggressively Anglo. Congratulations to Media Diversity Australia on the release of this really important report. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's been my privilege this week to participate in the Australian Defence Force Parliamentary Program. Uh, Lieutenant Caitlin Watkins. An officer in the Royal Navy has been in my office this week and she joins us in the advisors box this afternoon. The program provides an opportunity for members of parliament to work with all levels of the Defence Force and this part of the program is reciprocated once a year where military members coming into parliament to see how we work hosted in our offices. So I take this opportunity to share Lieutenant Watkins' view of her time here in the Parliament this week. Her words, not mine. I wish to thank Parliament House and the Chief Vice Chief of Defence Force for this unique opportunity that has been afforded to a small handful of ADF personnel, personnel this week. I have been fortunate in the past to support visits of parliamentarians on naval ships. I never truly comprehended the significance of a visit to an environment you know but you don't understand. It has allowed me to truly understand the level of sacrifice and commitment required by our parliamentarians that isn't just sitting a week, it's the, the hard yards that occur an ongoing commitment and sacrifice to ensure their local members feel their voices are being heard, uh, the time away from friends, family that each member commits. As a defence member, I do truly understand that sacrifice and she does. While I currently see greater level of military efficiency occurring within some discussions and meetings, I appreciate the level of passion that each member brings to the floor. I wish to thank those who have allowed this to occur and have been frank, honest and friendly in dealing with the numerous questions asked about Parliament and their roles. It is reassuring that as a member of the Defence Force that Parliament is filled with many members who care about their service personnel, give a genuine curiosity about the services and to do see that defence isn't just about physical capability but the personnel that operate Thank you, in Senator. support of defence and government intent. Senator Billick. Thank you. With Black Friday approaching, it's a good time to reflect on how little has changed since a year ago when several senators spoke in this place about the Make Amazon Pay campaign. In 2021, Amazon advertised a position to undertake global surveillance of their workers' union activity. That's correct. They wanted to undertake global surveillance of their workers' union activity. The UNI Global Union report described Amazon's surveillance program as, and I quote, a grave threat to workplace democracy and workers' rights. In the United States, complaints have been filed about multiple labour law breaches after Amazon held compulsory anti-union meetings and stacked their workforce with anti-union members all to defeat a ballot for union representation at their warehouse in Bessemer, Alabama. And in Australia, Amazon rolled out a gig economy delivery model called Amazon Flex. 
Amazon Flex drivers faced wage theft, unsafe conditions and unfair sackings, and pol police were called on transport worker union officials with lawful rights. Yes, they had lawful rights to enter Amazon Flex premises for safety investigations. Fortunately, the Transport Workers Union won a case in New South Wales for Amazon Flex drivers to receive enforceable rates of pay. And an Amazon worker in Sydney, represented by the SDA, recently received an out-of-court settlement after filing for unfair dismissal. So she was called to a meeting two days after the telling the company she was pregnant. At the meeting, she was told she was unsuccessful in her application for a permanent position because of low productivity and absences from work. Claims, she said, were untrue. I commend the TW and the SDA for standing up for Amazon workers. Amazon can afford to look after its workers' safety, pay them a decent wage, give them job security and treat them with respect. After all, this is a company that turned over a billion dollars last year in Australia and paid less than $20 million Senator. in tax. Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. Well, I went on to check up the Heart Foundation today, and before you start getting too upset and dragging out the tissues, I'm fine. All right, I'm not ready to kick the bucket yet. So anyway, just put you put you at peace, right? In 2019, the Heart Foundation worked with parliamentarians to deliver an important reform for Aussie Hearts: the introduction of a Medicare-funded health heart check. Since then, over 360,000 Australians have seen their GP to have their heart checked, which is possibly the most important step they could take to prevent a heart attack or stroke. Now, the health check um, Medicare item is now due to expire on June 23, and this is why they need our help and our lobbying to actually ensure this is kept for Australians. Having a permanent health heart check uh, Medicare item will ensure that risk factors for cardiovascular disease CVD, are detected and treated earlier, which will in turn save more lives and reduce the burden of um, this on the health system. Just to let you know that 1.2 million Australians have conditions related to heart or vascular disease or stroke. In 2018-19, there were 591,000 hospitalisations with cardiovascular disease, 5.2 per cent of all hospitalisations, and cardiovascular disease caused 42,300 deaths in 2019, a quarter of all deaths in Australia. This costs $11.5 million a year for the service to be provided to Australians. It will actually, a period of time of five years, it has saved the economy $1.75 billion with people getting risk assessed in the first place with this check rather than you know, trying to fix it up afterwards when they have this uh, health heart attacks. So I am calling on the parliament and the Labor government, please, if you can put $100 million into um, Aboriginal communities for climate change, then why can't we support all Australians Thank with $11.5 million a year? Senator Little. <coughs> Thank you. For around 40 years, there has been a three-part test to confirm indigeneity. In essence, the test requires demonstrating Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander descent or both, identification as a person of that descent and acceptance by the community in which the person lives as being of that descent. It makes provision for stolen generations. It's not perfect, but there is no evidence that it is broken, nor am I aware that it has become irrelevant. I'm alarmed at tinkering with this definition and its impact and consequences for program and service delivery for the people that need it most. There should be no place in government or in policy for a self-identification test or for fluidity in the definition depending on policy or program application. With self-identification, there's no validation, no accountability. It counts people who should not be counted. It relies on the box ticker having a moral compass. It risks greater access to specialist services by charlatans to those services designed for those that need it most. It fails, fails, fails every test. In the most recent ABS census, Australia asked who was Indigenous, and with that there was a 25 per cent increase since the previous census. Esteemed academics have described the national 5 per cent annual growth rate as astonishing, noting the growth was much faster than could be accounted for by births alone. That's possibly explained by the reply email sent from ancestry tracing sites that tell people they are indeed Indigenous through a relative where there is no lived connection, no lived experience, no life experience, 
and not for maybe even more than a century. What should be occurring is accountability of the government, its agencies and community organisations, ensuring the bona fides of Indigenous claims. And we'd better get it right before we ask Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples to elect representatives to the voice, should that be successful at referendum. Senator Walsh. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I pay tribute to early childhood educator and United Workers Union member Liz Kennedy. Liz passed away suddenly last week at the age of 59. Liz was a tireless advocate for early childhood educators and the children in their care. She was determined that every child should have access to the highest quality early learning possible and that every, educa every educator should be properly valued for their incredible work, including in their pay packet. Liz took every opportunity to advocate for her profession, including publicly challenging comedian Dave Hughes to spend a day walking in her shoes after he said, live on radio, that early educators just play with children and change nappies. He took up her challenge and let's just say he was suitably educated by Liz, her fellow educators and by the children he was tasked to work with. Liz was rightly proud of her role, winning better pay as part of a Victorian union agreement with over 100 employers in the sector. And she wanted to see the benefits extended to all early educators. So just two weeks ago, Liz was here in Parliament House to once again advocate for early educators to receive the recognition they deserve. While there's so much more to do in this place to make that happen, Liz's legacy lives on in the lives of all the children who she taught and nurtured, and in the pride and the passion of educators, which she helped foster by standing up for her profession. My deepest sympathies go to her husband, Jim, her children and her colleagues and families at Windsor Community Children's Centre. Vale, Liz. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. I'm proud to be taking part in Raise Our Voices this week, which many other MPs have as well, amplifying the voices of young people from across my state of Queensland about the things that matter to them. So today I'll share the words of Abigail Ma, a Year 6 student at Cannonvale State School in North Queensland. Abby says, I'm writing to you today because I'm worried about the amount of people living without a home. This is a problem not only in the wet Sundays but across all of Australia. In the Whit Sundays, it's estimated that children make up almost half of the area's homeless community. The 2016 census showed that there were more than 116,000 people living on the streets in Australia. The effects of COVID has increased the amount of homeless people and the cost of housing. This issue really concerns me and we need to find a solution. I'm asking you for help to encourage the following actions. One, build cheaper houses that more people can afford. Two, build temporary houses to bring people off the streets. Three, create a government housing plan for cheaper housing. With these ideas, I'm hoping you can make something happen. Well, thanks to Abby, who's 11, the Greens hear you, and in a wealthy country like ours, no one should be without a home, uh, experiencing homelessness or even experiencing housing stress. We urgently need a serious investment in social and affordable housing, as well as rent caps, so that everyone's got a safe, accessible, livable place to call home. So thank you to Abby for your thoughtful contribution and for the care that you're showing for your community at the tender age of 11. Um, we'll be working hard in this term of parliament to find solutions and indeed, as you ask, make something happen. Senator Babbitt. Thank you. The proposition facing Victorians this Saturday is a simple one. Do we reward the Premier, Daniel Andrews, with a third term or do we not? It is an important question because, as everybody knows, you get what you reward. If you reward corruption, you can expect more corruption. If you reward lies, you can expect more lies. If you reward incompetence, you can expect more incompetence. A vote for Premier Daniel Andrews on Saturday. It only serves to reward the worst Premier, the worst Premier in Australia's recent history. And that's saying something because as far as history goes in Premiers, there have been some doozies. But Dan Andrews, Premier Dan Andrews, he's in a league of his own. The Belt and Road Initiative with the CCP 
triple zero waiting times, a world's longest lockdown, multiple IBAC corruption inquiries. How many? Five. Five. That's how many. Any one of those things on their own is enough of a reason to kick Premier Daniel Andrews and his failed government to the curb. Taken together, though, they are failing so epic that future generations will study this period of, Vic of Victorian history as a warning of what can happen when stupidity is rewarded at the ballot box or never again. When Victorians go to the polls on Saturday, they should not reward Premier Daniel Andrews with more time to destroy Victoria. Victorians must not, must not reward incompetence. They must punish it. Victorians must not embolden corruption. We must cut it out like the cancer that it is. Victorians must not honour a dishonourable man by electing him for a third time to the highest office in our state. Victoria deserves better and, let's face it, anything, anything is better than Premier Dan Andrews. Sack Dan Andrews. Senator Scar. Um, Madam Acting Deputy President, there were two extraordinarily important documents that were tabled uh, in the Senate this week, which demonstrate without doubt that the last thing, the last thing this Senate should do next week is abolish the Australian Building and Construction Commission. Now, those two documents were the annual report of the Australian Building and Construction Commission for the year ended 30 June 2022 and their most recent quarterly report on their operations. And I want to refer to three points with respect to these documents. The first on page 36 gives you everything you need to know as to why we need the Australian Building and, Corruption, Australian Building and Construction Commission, and that is this. With respect to the penalties imposed between 2 December 2016 and 30 June 2022, 90 per cent of them, 90 per cent of them went to the CFMEU construction division. That is the problem, the unlawful behaviour of the CFMEU construction division. Penalties for other unions, only 3 per cent. There's a problem with the CFMEU construction division. Second point. In the annual report, his Honour Justice Logan, a Queensland justice, is quoted as saying with respect to the CFMEU, and I quote, the time when enough was enough in relation to compliance with the law by this union has well and truly passed. That's on page 40 of the annual report. Is that the sort of situation where you would actually abolish the cop on the watch in terms of construction in this country? And lastly, in terms of my home state of Queensland, Queensland, in terms of new investigations launched by the ABCC for the last year, topped the nation, topped the nation with 51. The next in line was Victoria with 44. So for Queenslanders, the last thing we should do is abolish the ABCC. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Today I rise to acknowledge and pay respect to Yona Dane Wulajuju, or Yona as he was called. Yona was a beloved Monjam elder and a talented artist who, whose art featured at the opening ceremony of the 2000 Sydney Olympics. Yona was born on country. His father founded his Wungard spirit in the ocean at a place called Yona Dayan, a whirlpool where the two tides meet. Yona was the spirit of the whirlpool. From the beginning of his life, Yona was enmeshed in negotiating and the meeting of two tides his cultural world and the world of the wider public. He lived out his early years on country and learned from his ancestors. This was explored in his biography, I Lived My Own Life. Yorna's voice remained with us through his book and other artworks. Yorna was also known for his understa understated and quiet presence, his dignity which drew people to him and his power as a person, as a teacher, that was founded in the unassuming and humble way he engaged with people. Throughout his life, Yorna's energy and wisdom impacted on the lives of many people across the country. He was committed to his family and his Wanjana Wungard uh, community. He dedicated his time to enabling young generations to visit, love and connect to their country, to be proud of their culture and traditions and be prepared for the future to be respected by others in their community. His encouragement gave confidence and pride to many young First Nations people. 
Yona also undertook many recording projects, establishing tourism ventures, participating in cultural heritage protection activities and creating his own art practice. He was the first chairman of the Moajam Art Centre and participated in numerous First Nations organisations such as the Moajam Art Spirit of the Wanjana Aboriginal Corporation and Moajam Aboriginal Community and several other cultural organisations across the Kimberley. Thank you, Thank you Yona. May you rest in peace and your legacy live on forever. Senator Thank Davey. Thank you very much. I bet when you think of movies, you don't actually think about regional Australia. But regional Australia features extensively in a lot of Australian movies. The merger about a cash-strapped Aussie rules club was filmed in Wagga Wagga. The dressmaker with the fantastic Kate Winslet was filmed in Gerildery. Mad Max, uh, se several of their films, uh, were filmed around Broken Hill and Silverton. And then our television. Doctor Doctor was filmed in Mudgee, my old hometown. The Royal Flying Doctors filmed in Broken Hill, again. Regional Australia provides a crucial aspect of our screen and film industry, and that industry needs our support. Uh, our, unlike free-to-air broadcasters, the streaming services don't have any requirements to ensure they make and support Australian content. Now, to be fair, the streamers are investing in Australian content, and I thank them and commend them for doing so. But I believe they can do more. They can do more to support our industry. That supports our communities and our economy. Because each of those films or TV series that I mentioned earlier, when they come to a community, they bring their dollars. They shop at the local cafe. They, get, they go to the hardware store to buy their hardware. They use local tradies. Sometimes they use the local hairdressers. And I know from personal experience that they use locals as extras in their scenes. So we need to get behind our screen industry and we need to look at what more we can do to make sure our stories continue to be seen on our screens. Senator Grogan. Thank you. Um, I would like to acknowledge today and thank the continued work of our state emergency services, our country fire services and their dedicated volunteers who are working tirelessly to assist the communities impacted by floods across Australia. In my home state of South Australia, uh, we have a major emergency declared as floodwaters in the Murray River continue to rise, with the potential for flows to reach 220 gigalitres a day by early December. The River Murray um, will be inundated in the worst case scenario under those numbers, with a real possibility of a second flood peak in December and into early January. Already we have dedicated volunteers who have been deployed to the flood affected areas in South Australia and I could not be more grateful for the commitment that they have made to these communities. Our local residents are preparing to fight to protect their properties, their businesses and the community. But they also rely on the Herculean efforts of our emergency services who work to support our communities at risk. My heart goes out to those facing loss, hardship, extreme stress and uncertainty as the flooding continues. Disaster recovery funding arrangements are now in place to help with counter disaster operations and with clean-up activities, with both the state and the federal government committing to support those communities. We've got almost 11,500 sandbags going into um, the Riverland over the weekend and about 110 tonnes of sand each day. Our amazing volunteers are responding so quickly and after the heavy rainfall, the extreme winds, stormy conditions and the uncertainty, the dedication that all of these people have shown throughout these natural disasters and emergencies plays a vital role in keeping our communities and our country safe.
Oh, Senator Green. <laughs> Thank you, President. Uh, this week we celebrate 50 years of the World Heritage Convention adopted by the General Assembly, Assembly of UNESCO on the 16th of November 1972. There are now 194 parties to this convention, nearly all of the countries in the world. Australia is one of the first countries to ratify the convention in 1974 and now has 20 properties on the list. Our government is committed to continuing to support the, the credibility and continuation of the World Heritage List and System, and that is why we are committing in our budget last month $14.7 million to support Australia's First Nations culture and world heritage. We are also ensuring we are delivering $1.2 billion to protect and restore the Great Barrier Reef to 2030. This includes an additional $204 million, because on this side of the chamber, we are not um, fighting about whether climate change is real. We are fighting for the future Thank of you, the Senator Great Barrier Green, Reef. The time for Senator statements has expired. We'll move to question time. Senator Cash. Thank you very much. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. On page 52 of the government's regulatory impact statement for their industrial relations bill, when trying to work out the bargaining cost for medium businesses, the Department of Employment and Workplace Relations calculates that $273,700 divided by 15.2 is $12,878. Can you please confirm that the correct figure should be $18,006? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister Cash. Uh, Minister Watt. Thank you, President. Well, I knew if I waited long enough, the shadow minister for industrial relations would be allowed to ask a question uh, about Senator industrial Watt, relations. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you. you know, it, is, it is always good to have a question about industrial relations from uh, the minister whose office leaked, leaked a police raid on union officers who presided over conflict in the industrial relations system and wants to drag us back into that conflict situation. It's always good to get a question about Senator IR Watt. from the whiteboard warrior Senator over there, Senator Watt. Cash. And you'll Senator be shocked Watt. to hear. Resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Watt, I will direct you to Senator Cash's question, please. Senator Watt, please continue. Thank you. So, uh, Senator Cash, always good to hear from you. But the one thing I can guarantee is that when Senator Cash opens her mouth about industrial relations, you can guarantee it's going to be a scare campaign based on lies. And yet again, she's doing it again. The actual, uh, the actual Watt, facts here. Please resume your seat, Senator Cash. Relevance, uh, President, you have already directed the minister Thank to you. my question. I would ask that you again draw his Thank attention you, Senator to Cash, the question. Thank you, Senator Cash, and I will, do, I will indeed direct the minister to your question. Thank you, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. And in fact, I was directly answering Senator Cash's question by referring to the fact that she had, yet again she was coming out with a scare campaign based on lies. Uh, Senator Watt. That was the question. Senator Watt. Please resume your seat. Uh, just a moment, Senator Birmingham. If I uh, direct the minister back to the question, I would expect those that are asking the question to at least be quiet so we can all hear the answer. Senator Birmingham. President, indeed, it was your two directions which I welcome to the minister back to the question. And each time he has flouted that by continuing with the theme of simply reflecting upon the opposition rather than dealing with the very specific relevant detail of the question. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I had just directed the minister back to the question, and there was so much noise on my left, I couldn't even tell you what the minister said, and he had just risen to his feet. He's well aware that I've directed him twice, and if we can have quiet, we might all be able to hear the answer. Senator Watt. Uh, as opposed to what Senator Cash is saying, the facts here are that small businesses will be excluded from the single interest stream, so will not be forced to bargain. Small um, businesses. Senator Watt, please resume well, I'm your trying to seat. Uh, Senator Watt. Uh, Senator, <laughs> Senator thank you. Cash. I'm happy to go. Thank you very much, President. The question again, relevance. The bargaining cost for medium. Businesses, you clearly don't even know uh, what a small, thank you, medium, Senator or Cash, large business. Thank you, Senator a debating point. It's not a point of order. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Small businesses will have access to small order. businesses will have access to the cooperative workplaces stream. Uh, this point comes across from well. Uh, Senator Watt, you really you don't want to see. When you've quite finished on your left, you have one of your own senators on her feet. 
Senator McKenzie. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, on relevancy, maybe uh, the shadow minister could table the regulatory impact uh, Senator statement Senator McKenzie, to assist that is not the a debating point. Please resume your seat. Senator Watt. Thank you, uh, President. Small businesses will have access to the Cooperative Workplaces stream, which is designed to be a low-cost option for businesses without a dedicated human resources capacity. We've seen over the last 24 hours Senator Cash hyperventilating about information in this in this uh, Senator Watt. Uh, I'm going to ask you to withdraw that. Okay, I'll withdraw hyperventilating. We've, sen we've seen Senator Cash going on and on and on, as she is prone to do, about information contained in a RIS and trying to argue that this shows that small businesses will be subject to a major Order. cost when, in actual fact, most of them will have access to cooperative workplaces stream, which is a low cost option that most of them will take advantage of. It's more misrepresentation and Thank scare campaign than opposition. Thank you, Senator White. Your time has expired. Senator Cash, for a supplementary. Thank you very much. Can you also confirm? that as a result of the mistake, in other words, the RIS is wrong, the total bargaining cost for medium businesses is actually much higher at over $80,000 and not the $75,148, according to your own government's formula. Minister Watt. Uh, thank, thank, you, thank you, President. Again, what we continually see from Senator Cash and her colleagues in the coalition is a misrepresentation of how the Minister bargaining Watt. system will work under Minister the government. Minister Watt, please resume your seat. Order! You've barely asked the question. I've called the minister to his feet and there's so much noise, I'm having trouble hearing him. Please continue, Minister Watt. As I, thank you, President. As I was saying, we continually see uh, Senator Cash and her colleagues seize on facts and figures and then distort what they actually mean. The reality under the government's the, the, the reality is that under the government's proposal, most small businesses, and I know you're asking about medium-sized businesses, most small businesses will have access to the cooperative workplaces stream, and there are Order. various other routes for medium-sized businesses to take advantage of that will not include the kind of costs that the opposition is out there trying to scare people about. All through this debate, we have seen scare campaign after scare campaign from the opposition. First of all, it was going to ruin the mining industry, and then we realised everyone realised that it wasn't going to apply to most of the mining industry. Then it was going to promote strikes, and in actual fact, there's restrictions on strikes. Everything we've heard from the coalition is a scare campaign and blatantly wrong. Thank you, uh, Minister Watt. Senator Cash, second supplementary. Thank you. Is the figure of $1,278? as the bargaining cost for medium businesses as set out in the government's regulatory impact statement, right or wrong? Thank you, Senator Cash. Minister. Thank you, President. Of course I can only go off the figures that are in the RIS. That is what they're for. But the point is, the point is that every step Order. of this debate Every step of this debate, we have seen people from the coalition seize on figures and then misrepresent what they actually stand for. Everything we have heard from the coalition has been a misrepresentation of what the government is proposing to do through this multi-employer bargaining Order. and the various other changes. Please resume your seat, Senator. It's not up. Uh, Senator Watt, that's not helpful. I am asking those on my left to allow the minister to answer. Uh, in silence. Senator Cash, I've just drawn your attention to the noise in the chamber. Minister Watt, please continue. Uh, thank you, President. As I say, everything we hear from the opposition uh, in this debate is a misrepresentation and a scare campaign. Uh, and, and the reason for that is that they will stop at absolutely nothing uh, to stop wages from growing. A 10-year government that kept wages deliberately low, Order. that kept productivity low and is fighting to the death to stop changes being made to our industrial relations system that will actually deliver better wages for workers and better productivity for businesses. That's what this is really about, is that the coalition wants to keep the old system in place that kept wages low uh, and kept you, productivity Minister low. Thank you, Your time has expired. Senator Payman. My question is to the minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Gallagher. Can the minister outline how the Albanese government is supporting Australian households during these challenging economic times? Minister. Thank you very much. And I thank Senator Payman uh, for the question. Uh, Senator Payman is right. In these challenging times, what Australians needed from their government was a budget that was responsible, that was right for the times and which readied us for the future. 
The primary focus on the budget, aside from delivering on our commitments to the Australian people, was managing the inflationary pressures that Australians are expecting, experiencing right now. That's why, why at the heart of the budget was our five-point plan for cost of living relief to provide some support which delivers an economic dividend but doesn't put extra pressure on inflation. The hard reality is that after nearly a decade of division, denial and delay, our economy wasn't as strong or resilient as we need it to be for the challenges we face. But our budget begins to turn that around by investing in the capabilities of our people and the capacity of the economy. <laughs> Fee-free TAFE and more university places. The National Reconstruction Fund for new, well-paid jobs in new industries. Investing in cleaner, cheaper, more reliable energy to deal with the extraordinary energy market mess that we inherited. And budget the pays for things that Australians value the most, better health care, better Medicare and better aged care. Above all, the budget marked the end of a wasted decade. The decade where we've seen energy chaos, an aged care crisis, a skill shortage, stagnant wages, a trillion dollars of debt with nothing to show for it. That's the mess that we inherited, the mess we're cleaning up in this budget with those key measures which will go to investing in uh, the economic uh, or the productive side of our economy by training people with the skills they need for the future, creating opportunity, supporting new industries um, where they need an extra hand. Uh, and getting the uh, transformation to a decarbonised economy on the right foot. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, first supplementary. Thank you, President. Um, can the minister outline how the budget will ease cost of living pressures for households? Minister. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, we are easing the cost of living pressure on households by investing in cheaper childcare for more than 1.2 million. Uh, families. Um, important legislation that passed this chamber yesterday and has, uh, has also been dealt with in the House this morning, helping more people, overwhelmingly women, back into the workforce if they choose to, and, and enough to increase uh, um, the number of full-time workers by 37,000 extra full-time workers, by expanding paid parental leave to 26 weeks by 2026, by making medicines cheaper the biggest cut to the cost of medicines in the 75-year history of the PBS. By our investments in more affordable housing, tens of thousands of new social and affordable homes, more support for people to buy their own home, a new national housing accord bringing governments and the private sector together to build the homes we desperately need. Again, after a decade of neglect, the Commonwealth is back at the table on housing, wanting to work in partnership with, with state and territory colleagues and private providers to deliver the housing options that Australians need. Thank you, Minister. Senator Payman, second supplementary. Can the minister outline why it's important that the government provide support that is responsible and does not put additional pressure on inflation? Minister. Thank you, President. I thank Senator Payman for the supplementary. The budget was carefully calibrated to deal with the inflation challenge in our economy. We knew we had to act differently from our predecessors to avoid making the inflation problem in our economy worse and forcing the RBA to go even harder on interest rates. The October budget returned $114 billion of tax upgrades to the budget over the forward estimates. This is the government making a decision to return 99 per cent of the upward tax revisions for the next two years when the inflation challenge is most severe and 92 per cent over the forward estimates. This compares to the Howard Costello um, government's average of around 30 per cent of the, um, of the tax upgrades and the former government's average of around 40 per cent. It was an important decision that we made. Um, Treasury has analysed the economic impact of the overall revenue upgrades in the October budget instead of being transferred to households rather than returned to the budget, and that would have put significant pressure on inflation. Thank you, Minister. Senator McGrath. Uh, thank you. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Watt. The regulatory impact statement of the government's industrial relations legislation says the department has costed bargaining consultants by using an article entitled, How Much Should I Charge as a Consultant in Australia? from a website called authentic.com.au. The author of that article is described on that website as a cross between business strategist, modern day spiritual healer, and self development expert. Benjamin J. Harvey is as comfortable 
are working Order. with shamans to strategists, psychics to sale reps, healers to homemakers, Buddhists to businessmen, mediators Order. to mediators. Do you think that's an acceptable way to calculate such costings? I'm not going to call the minister until there's silence. And I expect senators to listen in silence. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President. Uh, I am aware of this. Um, I am aware of this uh, incident, and uh, I also am aware that a departmental spokesperson from the department has already addressed this point uh, by saying that the link was used as part of an internal desktop review, which used a range of online sources to determine an indicative cost as part of the RIS. This included websites such as the AFR. Do you have an issue with that one? Uh, it included PayScale. Do you have an issue with that one? Uh, it included Talentcom and LinkedIn. Do you have issues with those as well? Uh, and, and the de departmental spokesperson has gone on to say that it was incorrect to use the link as being the only source referenced in that section of the RIS. Um, the department apologises. Would you resume your seat, please? Order, Senator Cash and Senator Canavan. When I'm calling the Senate to order. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. Um, I didn't know the opposition objected to the AFR and LinkedIn and Talent.com and PayScale and things like that, but apparently they do. Because the, the truth here is that the, the opposition, what they really object to, what they really object to is any change to an industrial relations system that has kept wages low, uh, Senator, kept what? productivity low and impeded Senator, economic growth. That's please what resume your seat. Order. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. There is oh, nothing Minister that gets the coalition what? more excited Minister than keeping what? wages low. Please resume your seat. Seriously, Senator Cash, I've just called the chamber to order, and the very minute the senator gets back on his feet to answer the question, you interject very loudly once again. I will ask you to listen in quiet. Please continue, Minister Watt. Thank you. As I say, there is nothing that gets the coalition going more than the prospect of keeping wages low. That's what they did for 10 years they were in government, and that's what they're determined to do even though they lost the last election, even when our government got a mandate to get wages moving again. This mob over here are so determined to hold workers back from getting a pay rise that they will, they will continually oppose it. They will come up with scare campaign after scare campaign, anything at all to keep wages low. And why? Because it was a deliberate feature of their, desi of their economic policy, and they are determined to pursue that in opposition, just as they did it for 10 years in government. You know what will actually make our economy stronger, and that is higher wages and higher productivity. And you know how we are going to do that? By delivering these industrial relations reforms that the people of Australia voted for and this mob still haven't woken up to, and they are pursuing the old fights and the old conflict to hold wages low. Uh, thank you, Minister. Senator McGrath, first up. Thank you. The same regulatory impact statement on page 46 references an article entitled How Much Do Payroll Services Cost? on a website called Bark.com, which lists its most popular services as dog and pet grooming, dog training, dog walking, life coaching, limousine hire, magicians and private investigators. Is this an acceptable source for a government department to use to calculate bargaining costs for businesses? Thank you, Senator McGrath. Uh, when there is silence, I will call the minister. Minister. Thank you, President. As I was saying in my previous answer, the departmental spokesperson has acknowledged that it was incorrect to use the link as being the only source referenced in that section of the RIS. However, as I've already said, uh, the, the work that the department did also included the AFR, PayScale, Talent.com and LinkedIn. And frankly, it probably would have been, been more wise uh, of the department to reference those ones rather seat. than the uh, Senator McGrath, you've asked your question. I would expect you to listen in silence, along with Senator Cash and Senator Birmingham. Please continue, Minister. So I've got a, a shorter version of that. Please continue, Minister. Thank you. Um, thank you, President. Um, so, as I say, I, fr I frankly think it would have been a better idea uh, for the department to use some of those other more reputable sources on its website rather than the one that they chose to do. They have apologised for their error, but that does not deny the fact that in the doing this work they relied on a number of other reputable sources, unless if we are learning today that the opposition also has a problem with the AFR, LinkedIn and the other various sites that I used. Um, but, as I say, we are going to hear this all week. We are going to hear attack after attack from the coalition on wage rises, uh, despite the fact that the Australian people voted for them. Frankly, I think it would be a— uh, 
Thank you, Minister. Senator Birmingham. Senator Watt keeps misleading the chamber with his reference ah, to what the Australian no. people voted for. Senator the bill Birmingham. he's talking about, the Senator people didn't. Senator Birmingham, please resume your seat. Order, 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 order. When order, order, order. Senator Birmingham, that is not a point of order. Senator Wong. Uh, the, I would ask you to not allow the leader to the leader to continue to debate a point when there is no point of order. Uh, he knows, and I know he wants to throw some meat to the back bench on an ideological issue, but he knows that is not a point of order. Thank you, he, Senator you ought to sit him down, President. My submission is you ought to sit him down Thank earlier. You. Order, uh, Senator Wong. I would have sat. Senator Birmingham down, but there was so much disorder in the chamber he could not hear me. I would once again ask all senators to refrain from shouting out. It's not a football match. It is the Senate chamber where a little bit of rowdiness is fine, but not the pitch at which it is currently being delivered. Minister, please continue. Thank you, President. I know it hurts the opposition to realise that the Australian vote people voted for wages Thank to get you, moving Senator again, White, but they did, and we're expired. doing it. Uh, Senator McGrath, second supplementary. Why won't the minister take responsibility for the mistakes in this so-called mistakes in the in the RIS document instead of blaming junior department officials? Take responsibility. Order. Shame on you. Order. Order. Senator McGrath. Order. 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 Senator Wong, order. Senator McGrath, I would ask you to be silent. You've asked your question. Senator Cash, I would ask you to be silent. And Senator Wong, I will ask you to be silent as well. Order, Senator McGrath. I've just directed you to be quiet. Minister Watt. Thank you, President. As I was saying uh, in my earlier answers, a departmental uh, spokesperson has taken responsibility for that error. And, uh, Senator and Watt, please resume your seat. Order on my left. Senator Mackenzie. Order. 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 Senator McKenzie, I'm asking you to be quiet as well. Minister Wall. So, in addition to the department taking responsibility, I have taken responsibility as the minister uh, responsible by saying, frankly, I think that was the wrong thing to do. But isn't it ironic that the party of no hoses is here lecturing us about taking responsibility? We endured years of the pro Senator former. Senator please resume your seat. Order. Senator McGrath. Please continue, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Um, well, we've learned what really gets these people going. It's cutting wages and taking responsibility. They're the things that they get wound up about. So the party that sat by under a Prime Minister whose only famous quote was that he didn't hold a hose now want to come and talk to us about taking responsibility? Over the entire three years or four years that Scott Morrison was the Prime Minister of this country, there's only one thing he took responsibility for, and you know what it was? It was keeping wages low. That's what he took responsibility for, because that was a deliberate design feature of your economic policy. That's taking responsibility, keeping wages down low. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to get wages moving again, and we're going Thank to lift you, productivity Minister. while we're at it. Your time has expired. Senator Thorpe. Order. 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 I have Senator Thorpe on her feet <laughs> waiting to ask a question. She has the right to be heard in silence. Please continue, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Pre President. In recent weeks, there have been numerous. Uh, Senator Thorpe, it's our customary to start with who your question is to. Oh, of course it is. I got sidetracked. Uh, my question is to Minister representing the Minister for Youth, Senator Watt. In recent weeks, there have been numerous violent attacks against young First Nations people in this country. 
Our communities are scared. Our children are feeling unsafe. There has been little or no response by state, territory and federal governments. Why is addressing racial violence not a priority for this government? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Thorpe. Um, I don't think it's fair uh, for Senator Thorpe to suggest that this government uh, doesn't take these issues seriously. Uh, I would like to think that every member of this chamber has been appalled by some of the racial violence uh, and uh, alleged murder, bearing in mind that there's a court process yet to be gone through, particularly uh, uh, in relation to the incident in Perth, which was it was awful. Um, there's no other word for it, and it shouldn't be happening in, in Australia. It shouldn't have happened in Australia at any period of our history, and it certainly shouldn't be happening now. Um, but it's not just me who's been saying this on behalf of the government. I well remember uh, the multiple comments that the Prime Minister has made uh, in recent weeks about these acts of rac racial violence. Uh, and as I say, I would hope that that is a position that is shared by all my members of this chamber. Um, the, I'm sure, Senator Thorpe, you are aware of uh, a range of actions that this government is taking uh, around matters involving youth justice, which um, disturbingly, again in this day and age, continue to have disproportionate uh, involvement of young First Nations people than they should. Uh, as a country, we haven't done a good enough job around uh, youth justice uh, for young Indigenous people, and they are being incarcerated at a far higher rate than should be acceptable to any of us in this country. Um, so, uh, but I, I do believe that this is an issue that the government takes seriously. Uh, we had money in the most recent budget to expand a range of services around youth justice, particularly in relation uh, to young First Nations people. Oh, sorry, Senator Thorpe. See, uh, my question is: Why is addressing addressing not yep. hand on heart feeling, you know, condolences and and understanding how hard it is for us. But my question is actually how is yes, uh, what uh, is Senator Thorpe, it's not appropriate the government to, doing to Senator address Senator Thorpe, it is not appropriate to repeat the question. You've made a point of order uh, indicating to me that you believe the minister isn't being relevant. I don't agree with the point of order. The minister is being relevant and I would ask him to continue. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, President. Um, as I say, there, there were a range of programs that our government funded through the budget recently around youth justice programs for First Nations people. Uh, Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Senator Thorpe. This is not about youth justice. This is about racial violence. It's not about the black kids uh, themselves. Senator Thorpe, it's about Senator the Thorpe, racists that are doing Senator this. Senator Thorpe, that's a debating point. You had a wide-ranging question. As I indicated to you on your previous point of order, the minister is being relevant. Please continue, Minister. Well, I was coming to that, Senator Thorpe. In addition to the programs that we have uh, in relation to youth justice, um, I, I think that there have been a number of figures from this government who have been very vocal about uh, racial uh, violence being completely unacceptable uh, in our country, uh, and I'm, I'm happy to take advice from the relevant ministers as to what we might be more be, might Thank be doing you, in Senator that regard. Senator White, your time has expired. Senator Thorpe, first supplementary. Thank you, President. If you claim this is important, which we keep hearing all the words and no action, then what is the government doing to ensure that First Nations children in so-called Australia are kept safe from these racially motivated attacks? and are able to live out their birthright. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Um, as I was saying towards the end of my last answer, this government is uh, doing a range of work in relation to uh, racism and racist violence within our community. I'm aware, for instance, that the Human Rights Commission uh, is doing some work in this regard that is being supported by our government, uh, and there are a range of other uh, um, uh, departments within our government uh, I know it's not directly relevant to the point that you're making, but I know that uh, the Department of Home Affairs is doing work in this space in relation to racism, particularly against migrant Australians. Again, I accept that it's a different point, but a similar issue about how we're tackling racism within the community. Uh, and that's something that we intend to do a lot more of, because we don't want to see First Nations people uh, exposed to the kind of violence that we have, been, uh, have seen of late. Uh, as, and all I can do is repeat the fact that I think we all found that disturbing and we need to do much better as a country. 
Senator Thorpe, second supplementary. Thank you, President. Given that you won't support raising the age of legal responsibility to 14 and showing that you're more focused on locking our kids up than keeping them safe, how are you addressing systemic racism in police forces and government agencies that impacts so heavily on First Nations children? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister Watt. Um, thank you, President. Um, the, the matter that you began with, Senator Thorpe, about the um, uh, criminal age of responsibility, the Attorney General, Mr Dreyfus, has actually made that a standing item for discussion and action uh, at the Ministerial Council of all Attorneys General around the country. Um, there are some states that are more willing than others to look at this issue and to do something about this issue, and I know the Northern Territory is currently doing something about that issue. Um, but there are other states who aren't moving as quickly. But the fact that the, the Attorney General has got this on the agenda every meeting of, the, of his colleagues demonstrates that that's something that we want to be doing. Well, Senator Thorpe, um, the, the age of response, criminal responsibility is a, is a matter for states to determine, uh, but, and, and we are demonstrating leadership uh, by putting it on the agenda for every ministerial Order, council Senator, uh, meeting. Senator Henderson. Uh, that is, uh, and that is how Commonwealth governments exercise leadership, is by putting it on the agenda to put pressure on the states to, to start thinking about these issues Thank more. Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. Senator Polly? My question is to the Minister for Trade and Tourism, Senator Farrell. The government is making significant progress to diversify trade opportunities for the Australian businesses. Can the minister provide an update on the status of Australia's trade agreements with the United Kingdom and India? Uh, minister Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, President. And can I thank uh, Senator Polly once again for her deep interest in this uh, subject uh, area? And, uh, uh, a subject uh, so important to her home state of uh, Tasmania. And it's important to say, I think, that after a decade of uh, the Liberal government, <coughs> almost a decade of the Liberal government, Australia was more dependent than ever on a single market for, uh, for our exports. To overcome this predicament, the uh, Albanese Labor government is progressing a trade policy agenda that creates opportunities for Australian businesses to gain new market access into major markets. This includes implementing trade agreements with two of our major trading partners, India and the United Kingdom. The Liberal government dropped the ball by failing to conclude parliamentary processes to implement the Australia-UK Free Trade Agreement and the Australia-India Economic Cooperation and Trade Agreement. In contrast, this government, this government took an important step yesterday, deepening and diversifying our trading relations with India and the United Kingdom by passing legislation to implement these trade agreements. We want to continue to work closely uh, with the United Kingdom uh, and the Indian governments, and I've been in contact with both of those governments uh, overnight to ensure that all of the processes that we have started uh, and commenced and completed yesterday just just waiting just just waiting just waiting for for uh, royal assent just waiting for royal assent uh, we want to ensure that not only is everything that we've done at our side to complete these processes done on the other side thank you minister senator Polly, first supplementary a trade agreement with the European Union will further expand opportunities for Australian businesses, including at the agriculture sector. Can the minister provide an update on the progress of the trade negotiations with the EU? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. <laughs> at least, at, sorry. At least I'm prepared to meet with them and discuss issues right. with them, That's which right. you never, ever, ever did. And I met Senator with them. Farrell. I met with eight of them Senator last Farrell. night. Senator I met. Resume your seat. Order on my left. Order. 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 When there is quiet, I will ask the minister to continue his answer. Oh, Senator Hume. Oh, Senator Henderson, sorry. Sorry, Senator Hume. Uh, there's so much noise, it's, it's hard to tell. Minister Farrell. Thank you, President. Thank you for that protection. And uh, I should start by thanking 
uh, Senator Polly, once again for that uh, insightful question. Um, now, despite many years of negotiations, the Liberal government failed to land a trade deal with the European Union. Now, why was that? Why was that? That why was that? Why did you fail to land an agreement? Why did New Zealand? Why did New Zealand get ahead of us with a free trade agreement? Because, because of the former government, the Morrison government's disrespectful approach to a close ally. But I'm pleased to say negotiations are back on track, and discussions, of course, have occurred with the Prosecco producers, wonderful producers, both Australia and the Thank EU. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. Your time has expired. Senator Polly, second supplementary. President, the World Trade Organisation rules underpin global trade and trade agreements. I understand you met with the WTO Director General yesterday. Can you give the Senate an update on that engagement? Thank you, Senator Polly. Minister Farrell. Thank you, uh, President. I thank uh, Senator Polly once again for her question. Uh, yes, um, yesterday, you're right, uh, Senator Polly. I had a, uh, a, uh, a great meeting with the uh, Director General yesterday. It was a very warm uh, and friendly uh, meeting, of course. Uh, she, uh, she's a great friend of uh, our former Prime Minister, Minister uh, Prime Minister Gillard. And her visit provided an opportunity to discuss how we can continue to work together to address the uh, challenges uh, facing the multilateral trading system. A key issue discussed was the need to ensure a pro properly, uh, properly functioning dispute settlement system. Uh, I also emphasised the importance of addressing uh, trade distorting agricultural subsidies. Uh, in recognition of the importance of the WTO uh, to Australia's economic resilience, Australia committed $5 million to help developing countries and least uh, developed countries access the Thank benefits you, of Your WTO time has expired. members. Senator Hanson. Minister, the Minister representing the Minister for Communication, Senator Watt. In 2018, Australia Post CEO Christine Holgate secured a deal with the CBA, NAB and Westpac to pay $20 million each, each every year as a representation fee for Bank at Post to serve their customers. Will the minister confirm this fee has been halved in the new agreement to $10 million a year each? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Minister Watt. Uh, thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Hanson, uh, for that question. I'll have to take the precise details of that question on notice. I don't, I don't have that information to hand, uh, but uh, I know that many Australians right around Australia, particularly in rural and regional areas, depend very heavily uh, on Australia Post services, uh, and that's something that we very much support. We, we, for instance, stood very much against uh, the yeah, well. Rene. Ah, Senator Rennick gets a go. His own side won't give him a go, so he's got to have a go during Senator Hanson's question. Um, the, um, so what I was actually about to say prior to Senator Rennick's interjection was that Labor has always stood against the privatisation of Australia Post, for example. Um, but the nature of Australia Post services is changing over the years. I know that they're increasingly moving towards parcel services rather than postage. Um, but they do provide a vital service to rural and regional areas in particular, uh, as well as servicing our cities increasingly with the parcel uh, business that they have op been operating. Uh, but Senator Hanson, I'm happy to come back to you on notice with the answer to your specific question uh, as soon as I get those details. Senator Hanson, first thank, supplementary. Yeah, thank you very much, because I appreciate that you don't know the, the answer to that, but I have been told on good advice that it is $10 million a year. Now, a lot of these, uh, local po these post offices actually rely on that money that they're making from that $20 million a year that was getting made them viable to actually um, uh, you know, keep their doors open. So the banks are making billions of dollars profit a year. If this is the case, if they have actually dropped it to $10 million a year, what will your government do to address this? Thank you, Senator Hanson. Mr Watt. Um, thank you again, Senator Hanson. Um, obviously, uh, a number of these types of matters are ultimately decisions for the board of Australia Post rather than the government of the day, because it does have a degree of independence. However, uh, we are concerned uh, about the number uh, 
of outlets that are available, particularly in rural and regional areas. And I know this is an issue that you've taken up in the past uh, on the, uh, uh, Senator Hanson. Um, currently, Australia Post, uh, for instance, has about 4,300 retail outlets across the country, and it has a le legislated met requirement to maintain at least 4,000 retail outlets. And as I was saying, I recognise, and I think everyone in our government recognises, that these post offices play a key role in communities around Australia. Uh, and as I've already reflected, the, this is particularly true in regional Australia, where often you find that it's the Australia Post outlets that also serve as the banks uh, uh, um, and a range of e even of government services as well. So um, I know that uh, these Thank you, are Senator issues. Watt, your time Thanks. has expired. Senator Hanson, second supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but since the beginning of 2021, more than 200 branches of the big four banks have closed or have been announced they are closing, mostly in regional areas, with customers shunted to bank at post um, outlets. What is your government go to, going to do to counteract bank closures and lack of staffing happening across the country, mainly in rural and regional areas? So, Is the government actually going to start addressing this and pull the banks into line that they must provide the service um, that is necessary Senator to Hansen. Australia? Your time has expired. Minister Watt. Um, thanks, President, and thanks, Senator Hanson. I think we're probably straying outside uh, the, the responsibilities I have as a representing minister, let alone as the minister. So, um, but I'll do my best to answer the question. Um, again, I, I am definitely concerned about the decreasing number of branches uh, that we see in retail banks across country areas in Australia. And I guess I particularly now see that, uh, that through my role as the agriculture minister. Uh, it was only last week that I was in uh, rural, I'm pretty sure the conversation happened in South Australia, about the impacts of bank closures uh, in those communities, and it places real pressure uh, on those communities when they can't uh, access those services. Actually, I remember now it was Maury I was having the conversation. Um, so, the, um, so it is a problem. Um, I think banks do have a community obligation to provide services to their customers. Uh, and as we see those banks withdraw, that does also put more pressure on uh, Australia Post outlets. And that's, I know, what the fundamental point you're trying to make. But I'll come back to you with some more answers. Thank you, uh, Minister. Senator Brockman. Thank you, President. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, uh -oh. Senator Watt. Uh -oh. I refer to the now Treasurer's comments on 21 November 2021, where the Treasurer said industry-wide bargaining was, and I quote, not part of our policy. Uh -oh. Given the government is trying to introduce industry-wide bargaining by stealth in its, in its extreme industrial relations legislation, Will the minister apologise to the Australian people for this broken promise? Uh, thank you, Senator Brockman. Minister. Well, what do you know? It's 2.42 p.m. on the Wednesday and we're on a broadcast day, and it's another false scare campaign about IR. Um, this is, is this the third we've had so far? I've lost track just about how many we've had in question time today. So, I'm not sure whether Senator Brockman knows that he is misleading people with what he's saying, but I'm here to help him. There is a distinction between industry-wide bargaining and multi-employer bargaining. Industry-wide bargaining involves a whole industry. Multi-employer bargaining involves multiple employers. They are different things. We are in favour of allowing employers and employees, where they choose, uh, to pursue multi-employer bargaining. Order. That is not the same as industry bargaining. It's in the name. Uh, so again, it's just another false scare campaign from an opposition uh, Watt, that is. Senator please resume your seat. Uh, Senator McGrath, your constant interjections are disorderly, as are yours, Senator Cash. I would ask you to listen quietly. Minister, please continue. Um, so, you know, I'm looking forward to the supplementary questions because we might get to our fourth and fifth scare campaigns in one question, ca uh, question time alone. Because this one is yet another one that is completely baseless and completely misunderstands how industrial relations actually works in this country. So what we've got is a coalition that is so intent on running scare campaigns to stop wages Senator rising McGrath. that they are clutching at straws and making things up and misinterpreting how their own laws actually work in order to throw mud at a government that is trying to do something about wage rises. It's actually a little bit sad to watch. Uh, from the coalition, uh, so so completely misunderstand how industrial relations works uh, that they will be making up these kinds of things, which anyone could just Senator look at Cash. how those words operate 
industry-wide, multi-employer. They're actually kind of different concepts. You know what? Industry-wide is also different to single interest bargaining, which is another thing that we're providing for. They are completely different concepts, and what you're talking about is not part of the government's agenda, never has been part of the government's agenda. The only agenda this government has is to get wages moving again. Thank you, Senator Watt. Senator Brockman, first supplementary. A survey of businesses by the WA Chamber of Commerce and Industry has found nine in ten businesses would be damaged by measures in the Albanese government's extreme Shame. industrial relations bill, and Shame. four in five would be damaged by multi-employer bargaining. Businesses are saying it will make it harder to run a business and employ Order. Australians. It's not a scared campaign. They're scared. Why is the government turning its back on job Order. creators in Western Order. Australia? Order. Uh, before I call the minister, I'm going to ask senators on my left and right to be silent while the minister answers the question. Minister Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Brockman. Well, hold the front page. Big employer group opposes wage rises and opposes changes to the IR system that enable wage rises. I mean, has it ever been any different? Has it ever been any different? Uh, and we know that over the last 10 years, some of those big business Senator groups were in, were in cahoots Senator with Watt. the coalition. Please resume your seat. Order. Please continue, Senator Watt. Thank you, President. No, so it's hardly a surprise that when we finally have a government in this country that wants to get wages moving again, that we say business, we see some business groups oppose it. But isn't it interesting that the government, Senator that the opposition, Cash. doesn't want to pay attention to those business groups that actually do support multi-employer bargaining? And as I was saying yesterday in the Senate inquiry, we had evidence from the executive director of the Community Childcare Association, which represents over 750. Oh, apparently we don't. We're not prepared to listen to community childcare centres. They don't get a voice. In this. No, they're no good because they represent uh, employers of low paid Senator workers. They don't Please get a say. In your seat. Senator McGrath, I called twice for you to be quiet and you just ignored it. The minister has the right to give his answer in silence. Please continue, Minister Watt. So, yeah, apparently, if you are a business that provides childcare services, um, that's not a, that's not on it. You can't have your say. You also can't have a say uh, if, you're in, if you're involved in manufacturing and installation associations who support uh, what we're White, trying to do. Senator White, your time has expired. Senator Brockman, second supplementary. The same survey has found the government's radical industrial relations legislation will put 34,000 workplaces at risk of employer employing fewer staff in the years ahead if the changes proceed. Employers universally are saying these changes will make it harder to run a business and employ Australians. Why is the government pursuing policy changes that will see less jobs for Australians and will see even more job losses than already expected under this Thank government? Thank you, Senator Brockman. Your time has expired. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. Well, again, I am, I am shocked. I am shocked that an employer group that is out there telling its members that the sky is going to fall in if these changes go through, then goes and surveys its members, and their members are scared. What a shock! What a shock that is. Now, Senator Brockman is talking about uh, our, our changes as being radical. So, is it radical, Senator Brockman, that what we're trying to do is to make gender equity an objective of the Fair Work Act? Is it radical, Senator Brockman, uh, that what Senator we want to do Watt, is to ban secrecy? Senator Watt, I would ask you to address your answers sure. to the chair. And I would ask those on my left to be quiet. Senator Watt. Thanks, uh, President. President, I ask you, is it radical uh, to have a government that wants to ban pay secrecy clauses in employment contracts? I think it's not. Is it radical uh, that we have a government uh, that wants to ensure employers have a duty to prevent sexual harassment? How radical that is! What a radical proposal to do something about sexual harassment. Is it, is it radical to have a government that wants to make the sexual harassment dispute process fairer and more effective? How naughty and how radical of this government to want to do something about that? That's why Thank we're doing you, it, Minister, to look after workers and look after expired. businesses. Thank you. Uh, Senator Waters. I've called Senator Waters. Thanks, President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Minister for Climate Change, Senator Wong. Uh, the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology have today released the State of the Climate Report, and unsurprisingly it finds that the climate systems that touch on every aspect of our lives and our environment are changing before our very eyes. Our country has already warmed by 1.47 degrees, 
fires, floods and cyclones are more intense. Extracting and burning coal and gas is the biggest cause of the climate crisis. Minister, do you support Australia's coal and gas export industry expanding? Thank you, Senator Waters. Minister Wong. Well, uh, again, I will first respond to the State of the Climate report and, and say, uh, like uh, Senator Waters and, and many, uh, and I hope most people with, um, uh, who look at this issue rationally, and I'm afraid that doesn't include necessarily many opposite, uh, it is a deeply concerning report. Uh, it, 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 a report that's released every two years. It shows an increase in extreme heat events, intense heavy rainfall, longer fire seasons and sea level rise. Uh, it, it, provides five, uh, it, it shows, as you said, that Australia's land climate has warmed by an average of 1.47 degrees since national records began in 1910. And I heard again interjections from the other side saying, uh, rubbish. This is the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO, and Senator I know you like, to, uh, you like to suggest they're part of some conspiracy, but this is what the science is telling us. This is what the science is telling us. But I'm actually Senator quite pleased Rennick. at the interjections because it shows, uh, reminds us yet again uh, why the frame that Senator Waters has put to me is not, is not the, the answer to what we have to deal with. It is not a single industry's fault. It is not a single employer's fault. It is not a single place's fault. We have to engineer a transition of the Australian economy and the global economy, and we have to do that together. And we have to do it from government. And for for years we have been arguing for this. Uh, and I am pleased. I am pleased uh, that we finally have a parliament in both in both chambers which does want to act on climate. And I also understand why it is that the, the Greens political party seeks to make this entirely about, entirely about one issue. It is about transitioning the whole of the economy. It is about reducing the emissions uh, that we produce. And it is part of doing what Minister Bowen did at the conference of the parties, which is being part of a global solution to what is a global problem. And no amount of finger pointing domestically for political purposes will yield the outcome that we want. Thank you, Minister Wong. Your time has expired. Senator Waters, first supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. I note that you conveniently didn't answer the aspect of the question about whether you support expanding the coal and gas export industry. Uh, however, I'll press on. Yesterday on Sky News, I'm informed uh, the managing director of Tamboran, a company that this government voted to give uh, $7.5 million to frack the Beedaloo Basin, uh, that managing director said they'll be able to pump gas for hundreds of years. Uh, Minister, do you want Australia to be pumping gas for hundreds of years? Uh, Minister Wong. Uh, th thank you. Uh, can I? Uh, I, I, don't, I didn't see that interview, uh, so I won't. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, that's that's good to know. Um, uh, <laughs> genuinely, we have uh, at the. Um, what, what I will, we, we, we do agree on something. Um, the position the government has been very clear about is that we will reduce our emissions by 43 per cent by 2030, uh, and we will aim to get to 82 per cent renewables by 2030. What I would also I would make this point, I would make this point uh, is that the market is moving. The market is moving. It is moving domestically and it is moving internationally. And I know those opposite want to howl at the moon over this, but it is. And what that does show is that the reliance in the global energy markets uh, on fossil fuels over time to 2050 will reduce. Uh, so whatever individual companies might uh, thank say, you, Your time that has is expired. the and before I call Senator Waters, Senator Rennick, I have called you to order a number of times. This is Senator Waters' question, and I would ask you to give her the respect of listening to the answer. Senator Waters, second supplementary. Uh, thanks, President. That also conveniently avoided talking about the public money that this government uses uh, to give to coal and gas industries. Um, Minister, in August of 2019, you told ABC Insiders, in response to a question about Pacific Island concern on Australia's push for more coal and gas, um, you said that coal is an important industry for Australia. Is this still your view, Minister Wong? I, I, I think I, I think that anybody who has looked at the history of Australia and at Australia's current export profile will know uh, the, the monetary value that coal has provided to all of us and has funded a lot 
has funded a lot of the public infrastructure, including those things that you wish for, you know, Medicare and so forth. But, but the point is, as the world moves to 2050, it is inevitable that we will have to ensure that we export goods and services into a global market that is a net zero market. And so that means we have to transition our economy to do much more uh, uh, for the new economies and the cl uh, clean energy economy than we have in the past. Uh, so rather than just trying to make one industry and those who work in it and vilify those who work in it, which is what the Greens political party do, what Order. I want to do and what we want to do is transition our economy so our children get the chance to, to have the prosperity we have had, but on the uh, basis thank of you, the Minister clean Wong, energy and the net zero has expired. economy. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister for Emergency Management, Senator Watt. Minister, the Bureau of Meteorology and the CSIRO have today released their State of the Climate report, which states that the climate has warmed by 1.5 degrees from the start of the 20th century. Can the minister explain how this will impact on communities and the emergency management sector? Uh, once again, Senator Rinnick, if you wish to make a contribution, there are many other opportunities during the week for you to do so. I would ask now that you stop interjecting. Minister Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Wong, order. Order. Uh, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. I'm going to ask you to withdraw that comment. It's defaming. Senator Wong, I've asked you to withdraw that comment. That he's a coward. Uh, Senator Wong, it is not appropriate to repeat. I withdraw. Thank you. Senator Watt. Thank you, President, and thank you, Senator Smith. I know that um, I know that you're very concerned about what the flooding that we're beginning to see in South Australia, along with Senator Grogan, Senator Wong, and Senator Farrell, and we're all very concerned about what might lie ahead for your state, and we'll certainly be there with you all. Uh, today, the Minister for Science and Industry, uh, Ed Husick, and the Minister for Environment and Water, Tanya Plibersek, released the State of the Climate Report 2022, and it is an extremely sobering read. This report prepared by two of Australia's leading climate research agencies, the CSIRO and the Bureau of Meteorology, found changes to weather and climate Order, extremes are happening. Nice. I'll remind you there are opportunities during the week to, have, to make a contribution. Question time is not it. Senator Watt. Thank you, President. And it is sad that even when we have a government that is serious about doing something about climate change and is in here talking about it, the Greens want to just carry on with their usual stunts. So this report does show uh, that we are experiencing changes to weather and climate extremes that are happening at an increased pace across Australia. Australia's climate has warmed on average by 1.47 degrees since national records began in 1910, and the impacts are being experienced across the country. While Australia has always been known as a land of drought and flooding rain, the past five years have been beyond anything we have seen in our history. And this, show, this report shows an increase in extreme heat, extreme heat events, intense heavy rains, longer fire seasons and sea level rises. We have lurched from prolonged drought into the black summer bushfires and now the unfolding flood and storm situation that is impacting across Australia's southern and eastern states. The report found that continued increasing temperatures are leading to more heat extremes and fewer cold extremes. And what this means is an increase in the number of dangerous fire weather days and longer fire danger seasons across southern and eastern Australia. We can also expect to see more heat waves, and heat is already our most dangerous natural hazard, killing more people than all other hazards combined. And I want to acknowledge the work between the Bureau of Meteorology, emergency management agencies and the Departments of Health for the national implementation of the Australian Warning Thank System you, for Heat. Your time has expired. Senator Marielle Smith, a first supplementary. Thank you. Minister, how is the government working to improve how we prepare communities ahead of and during these more intense heat, fire and flood events? Thank you, Senator Smith. Minister Watt. Thank you, uh, Senator Smith. Uh, and this government is always going to be standing shoulder to shoulder with communities when disasters hit by providing the necessary support to help them respond and recover. But by better preparing for natural disasters, we can protect lives and livelihoods and lower damage bills from floods, fires and cyclones. Last night in this place, the legislation to create the Disaster Ready Fund was passed. That was an election commitment of the Albanese government, and now we've delivered. 
The de this fund was also confirmed in last month's budget with up to $1 billion made available over the next five years for important disaster mitigation projects. We also know that the most effective way to assist Australians struggling with insurance costs is to better safeguard properties from the impacts of natural disasters. This fund will provide up to $200 million per year to invest in mitigation projects like flood levees, cyclone shelters, fire breaks and evacuation centres around Australia, funds that were previously locked away by the Coalition in their failed emergency response fund. In the meantime, we're also helping Australians recover from the current floods, Thank you, having spent— Thank you, Senator Watt. Your time has expired. As Senator Smith, second supplementary. Thank you. Minister, please tell us what could previous governments have done differently to have prevented these now extremely concerning global warning, warming trends? Minister Watt. Thank, thank you, Senator Smith. And before addressing that, I might just mention that uh, since January, some 2.9 million people in Australia have accessed more than $3 billion in Australian government disaster recovery payments and $195 million provided through the Disaster Recovery Allowance Program. But you asked what could previous governments have done differently. Well, firstly, the coalition could have at any point over the past decade acknowledged that climate change was real. Instead, we saw 10 years of government-led climate wars. We're into the, the 11th year now, it would appear, that held our country back, exposed Australians to risk and made us an international disgrace. And with Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan still in the party room, still showing today they have learned absolutely nothing, that they still don't believe the science, we know that the coalition will still never come around on the uh, basic science. Senator Watt, please resume your seat. Uh, order. Order. Uh, Senator Rennick, I'm sh sure I don't— Order. 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 Those on my right. I have a senator on his feet. Senator Rennick, I'll also remind you, you don't start your point of order until I call. Senator Rennick. Uh, that was a personal reflection under section 193.3. Could you please retract that remark? Thank you. In the silence. Uh, the mention of two senators, is that what you're referring to? It wasn't Nine. a personal reflection. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Um, Minister Watt, please continue. Thank you. Uh, and, and as I say, what we've heard even today from Senator Rennick and Senator Canavan among their colleagues shows that nothing has changed. There are so many things this, the former government could have done. It could have spent a single cent from its emergency response fund on just one disaster mitigation project you, Senator instead Watt, of just your time earning interest. Has expired. Um, Minister Wong. And I apologise for not hearing you previously. Um, I, and I ask that further questions be placed on notice. Thank you. Oh, are you on a? I'll oh, just wait for the deputy. Presenting the minister for minister for infrastructure, transport, regional development, and local government, Minister Watt. As to why an answer to questions on notice number 543 has not been provided to the chamber. I'll give you the call, Senator Watt, in a moment. Let's just let the chamber clear. Can, can honourable senators please leave the chamber if they they're deciding to do so, Senator Watt? Uh, thank you, Deputy President. <clears throat> I'm, I apologise. I didn't hear the question numbers that uh, Senator Mackenzie referred to, but I think it was 543. Um, I understand that answer has been tabled, but for the avoidance of doubt, uh, here's another copy that I'm happy to table now. Senator Chandler. Um, thank you, Mr. Act uh, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of all answers to questions asked by opposition senators during question time. Thank you. Please proceed. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy President. And we had um, quite an interesting question time today. Lots of talk of psychics and spiritual healers and shamans and the like. And I, I couldn't help but wonder with all of this talk of seeing into the future if only the government had had a crystal ball back in May because then they might have 
actually foreseen some sort of semblance of an economic plan that they could uh, bring to the Australian people to try and solve some of these very difficult problems that we currently see uh, before us. Because throughout the election campaign, we heard on multiple occasions the now Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, and his Labor colleagues tell Australians that they cost, cut the cost of living, that they listen. Um, uh, and they told everyone that um, your household costs would come down and your wages would go up. Uh, they promised that Australians would see a $275 reduction on their power bills, not a subsidy or a concession or a one-off payment. They said that's what your power bills would go down by. Yet in the recent budget, Labor itself is forecasting power price rises of more than 30 per cent. And, Mr Deputy President, Labor's IR bill will only add to those cost of living pressures. Yesterday, media outlets reported that food manufacturers and distributors warned that the government's IR legislation would push up grocery prices and further worsen the cost of living crisis. It is clear that Labor's IR changes will adversely affect hundreds of thousands of Australian businesses, and we know that small businesses are going to be hit the hardest. Instead of thinking about hardworking Australians who own and operate the small businesses around this country, and instead of focusing on delivering cost of living relief to Australians before Christmas, which we know is on its way, the government's only focus is giving the unions an early Christmas present. It's quite amazing uh, how quickly Labor's tone changed after they won the election and took office. In the election campaign, it was all about reducing the cost of living. And as soon as they were elected, all we've heard from the Treasurer is commentary on how bad the global economy is, how none of it's their fault, and a pursuit of the niche issues to appease their union mates. The Labor Party was more than happy to attack the former government for economic conditions right through three years of the worldwide COVID pandemic. But now, after being elected, all we hear is an attempt to set a narrative that nothing is their fault. It's the war in Ukraine, it's inflation in the United States and the United Kingdom, it's international supply chains. Governing is about dealing with these events. Sometimes it is hard, but you have to deal with them. That is your responsibility. Yet after waxing lyrical about how they're going to reduce the cost of living, Australians have been left fuming at the lack of action from this government, which is now pursuing legislation in the form of an IR bill that will only deliver higher cost of living pressures for Australian families and for Australian businesses, Mr Deputy President. Um, because as we heard today, the Albanese government's own regulatory impact statement, if it's to be believed, shows that Labor's legislation will cost small businesses uh, more than $14,600 in bargaining costs, including consultancy fees, uh, however calculated. For medium-sized businesses, that cost is going to be more than $75,000. But we know the actual cost could, be, in fact, be much higher than that. And let's not forget, according to the government, that a medium-sized business is defined as having any more than 15 employees. The question remains, how is the government going to respond to the challenges of the day and deliver on the hard and fast promises they made to cut the cost of living for Australians? Because, like I said, Mr Deputy President, there was no shortage of promises made by Labor to do so. Australians didn't hear the Labor Party saying, well, we'll cost the, cut the cost of living as long as the war in Ukraine ends and as long as the US economy is strong and everything else is well around the world. They said that they would cut the cost of living. Lower your power bills by hundreds of dollars, not raise them by 40 per cent and then hopefully take a few dollars off down the track. And Australians definitely didn't hear the Prime Minister or Labor propose these radical industrial relations laws because they never took this policy to the last election. It amounts to another broken promise from Labor. Labor's changes will mean a weaker economy. Labor's changes will mean higher cost of living pressures for Australian families. And Labor's changes will put the interests of union bosses ahead of hard-working Australians and our economy. Because Labor is more than happy to leave our construction industry and its more than 400,000 small businesses at the mercy of the militant CFMEU. By abolishing the ABCC, Labor have opened the door for more strikes, fewer jobs and unprecedented access to small business, and it will have a devastating impact on our economy, resulting in higher business costs. Addressing the cost of living Thank pressures you, don't even register anymore. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Well, it is fascinating to watch the coalition try and work out their political tactics today um, in question time, particularly on the secure jobs, better pay bill. 
they want to use question time and uh, many um, mechanisms within this chamber to, to push forward their scare campaign about the industrial relation changes that this government is rightly trying to implement. But as soon as Minister Watt uh, began answering uh, their questions, and, and quite rightly making the comparison between Labor's record and our approach to industrial relations uh, and that of the previous government, you could barely keep up with the coalition senators um, interjecting, popping up, trying to prevent uh, the minister from actually answering the question. Now, we all know why those opposite don't want us to make this comparison, because it does start to remind the Australian public of, of their track record, of what they are ashamed about on their industrial relations reforms in this country, and so they should be. For the past 10 years, under the previous government, uh, Australia's enterprise bargaining system has been in decline. Around half, of, uh, around half as many new agreements were made last year as they were in the 2013-2014 financial year. The coalition policy of deliberately suppressing wages—their words, not ours—has had a devastating effect on working people. And have they abandoned this policy? Well, clearly not, because they are not doing everything they can to ensure that the workers deserve the pay rises that they have been screaming out for for the last decade. That is why the Labor Party, since it's come to government and into the lead up to the last election, has made it crystal clear of our efforts to get wages moving again. The coalition cannot even decide what scare campaign they want to run. Some members of the opposition are arguing that there is no proof that the bill gets wages moving again. But you know, the Leader of the Opposition has been on the record in the other places saying that he is scared that the bill will start to prompt wages growth above and beyond inflation. Um, it is important to also note that those opposites uh, could also learn a thing or two from the union movement. Because, quite frankly, uh, with the experience that a number of Labor members on this side have had, uh, the, the fact is that the collapse of bargaining over the last 10 years has led directly to the loss of wage growth for Australian workers, um, Deputy President. Every incremental increase in bargaining coverage will result in meaningful wage increases, according to many researchers, but particularly a new study from the Centre for the Future of Work. The study shows that every percentage point of bargaining coverage lost since 2013 has resulted in a drop in wage growth of around 0.1 of, of around 0.15 per cent. The OECD average for bargaining cover, coverage in countries with enterprise and some limited multi-employer bargaining is around 33 per cent. So, if this bill that is before, at some, before the parliament and once it does come into the Senate here for debate, uh, manages to increase bargaining coverage to this level, the level that is seen right across many OECD countries, the report predicts that a corresponding 1.6 per cent increase in wages growth will occur every single year. This increase will mean $1,473 per pay rise for the average work in the first year. And I think that is a really good start, and that is the whole intent of the Albanese government about trying to not ensure that there are greater secure jobs in this country, but to have jobs that have well-paying, uh, well-meaningful wage rises that we have not seen over the last 10 years. Uh, but what we did see too when we first came in, that the previous government uh, refused to actually put in a, uh, a submission to the Fair Work Com Commission that supported meaningful wage rises for workers. So one of our very first acts as a government was to write to the Fair Work Commission advocating, advocating for wage rises to the very, very many millions of Australians who are on our award system, the low paid of this country, the very people who were packing our shelves, were working around the clock to ensure that we had toilet paper and, and, and tissues at the last minute when we ran out of supply, the people that were on the front line defending our fellow Australians during the COVID pandemic. Remember those people, all those people that we come in here and talk about and say how great of a job they're doing, but those opposite refused, refused to ensure that their wages keep growing. Senator Deputy Coney. President. Senator Fawcett. Thank you, uh, Deputy President. 
The uh, concern that we have with the bill that the government is putting forward and the way they have responded to the questions is that there seems to be a lack of understanding that it is not so much government and government programs, but it is small business who are the predominant employers of people in Australia. And that means that for a business to be able to employ people to pay good wages, uh, the business has to be profitable, and the business owner, who is often stumping up uh, their own capital, often putting their own house on the line uh, to get the capital to invest in their business, need to have the confidence that they'll have some control, some rapport with their workforce and to be able to set conditions that are good for both the employees and for the employer. Now, one of the problems with what's being proposed here is that this is a massive change to our industrial relations system that strips the small business owner and their direct employees, who generally they actually have a good relationship with because they tend to work as a team, it strips that relationship away and puts it in the hands of unions who are representative bodies who have no relationship often with the actual business and their workforce. Now, one of the concerns with this is that this is a change that takes us back some three decades. Uh, it actually undoes some of the very productive reforms that previous Labor governments uh, have put in place. And as we look at the rush here, it's worth remembering that governments who get elected on the basis of a policy position that's been argued, that's been considered, has been put to the Australian public, there is some grounds for them to rush things through if they believe it's really important and the Australian people have actually given them a mandate. But in this case, it was not an election commitment. It wasn't discussed before the election. There is no commitment. And even independent uh, media outlets are highlighting uh, the fact that it's reasonable to ask why the rush. Uh, in the editorial in The Australian Today, it asks why the rush. And it talks about the evidence of the haste in that the department, in seeking to rush this through and provide an evidence base, has actually reached out to sources that even the minister has admitted were not wise. In fact, they're quite laughable. So the source for how much business could be expected to pay to enter a multi-employer agreement uh, the source, which is quoted by the department, describes themselves as a cross between a business strategist, modern-day spiritual healer and a self-development expert. It's hardly the kind of robust basis that policy should be developed uh, in Australia. The editorial from The Australian goes on to highlight the high costs to business, some $14,500 to small businesses, up to $75,000 for medium-sized businesses and ask the question, why the rush? And I think that's a valid question, particularly when you look at the feedback that business is giving. So in my home state of South Australia, uh, Business SA as a representative body is highlighting the fact uh, that the, there are a number of red flags for the business and that currently uh, you can have bargaining, enterprise bargaining, where multi-employee bargaining can be done, where employers choose to bargain together. But in this case, it can force people to bargain. And so business are at risk of being roped into agreements that they've not negotiated at all. And in fact, the employees may not want it, but they can be roped in because unions could reach an agreement with a few employers elsewhere and then extend the agreement to hundreds of other employees. The issue for business is that the Labor government don't appear to actually understand the impact of costs. And we see that even in their Powering Australia plan. Whilst Minister Bowen is saying that only sensible economists or sensible economists would support the wind and solar uh, transition that the government is pushing, again rushing, uh, he ignores the evidence from independent experts, engineers and economists such as the OECD that have highlighted in a report released in April this year that power prices will only continue to rise and in fact rise exponentially as we constrain carbon emissions if we insist on relying purely on wind and solar. They have a place but the OECD has highlighted that wind and solar will not get us to net zero and that we do need to consider other options and unlike the assertions by Minister Boeing, the OECD and the IEA actually say the cheapest form of electricity is nuclear power.
Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, Deputy President, sorry. Uh, and uh, I thank the opposition uh, for their trifecta uh, of questions uh, served up on our Secure Jobs Better Pay bill uh, and its regulatory uh, impact statement. Uh, and I thank them, of course, for their rigorous uh, examination uh, of the RIS for our bill. Uh, and I also thank them for making uh, patently clear uh, through their behaviour in the chamber today, which can really only be described as frantic uh, and frenzied behaviour in the chamber today, uh, that their opposition uh, to our bill has nothing to do with the details of the regulatory impact statement. Uh, their opposition to the bill has nothing to do with what we're trying to achieve uh, as a government for workers and businesses in this country. Uh, and their opposition uh, to this bill has everything to do with the coalition's absolute love for low wages in this country. Um, we all know that the Liberals just love low wages. Uh, we all remember uh, that low wages were a deliberate design feature of the previous government's agenda, uh, and that is exactly what we are about changing. And when I think about why the Secure Jobs Better Pay bill is so important, some of the people that I'm thinking about are the early childhood educators who have come to this place year after year after year telling us all their story about how hard it is for them to live on the wages that they earn. They have been coming here year after year and telling us uh, that $24 an hour caring for and educating and nurturing the next generation uh, is just uh, an insulting amount of money. They've been telling us uh, that the money is so low uh, in this profession that while they're doing work that they absolutely love, educating children, uh, many of them can't even afford to have their own. Uh, these workers, who are over 90 per cent women, they need multi-employer bargaining to actually get their wages moving. And I'm also thinking, uh, when I think about our bill, of the cleaners um, who do absolutely essential work, who go in at night after everyone else is gone uh, and clean toilets for a living um, and are proud to do that for a job. Uh, but what they can't stand for um, is earning wages that are so low that they just can't support themselves uh, and can't support their families. Wages like 20 bucks an hour. This is another group of workers who actually need multi-employer bargaining to get their wages moving. Now, the enterprise bargaining system has completely failed all of these workers uh, and failed their families too. Uh, and what educators and cleaners have in common is not just that they're low paid, uh, it's that they're employed in small workplaces where the workers uh, and also the employers just don't have the resources to engage in bargaining effectively. And if they could um, use enterprise bargaining, it would literally take decades to go enterprise by enterprise to try to get wages moving. Um, we can't wait that long. These workers can't wait that long. Australia can't wait that long to actually get wages moving in this country. So the system as it exists today just doesn't work. Um, workers know it. Employers know it. Everyone who came to our job summit knows that the system that we have in place today just doesn't work. Uh, and it's why only 14 per cent of Australians today are actually covered by enterprise agreements. It's why reform is needed. Uh, it's why wages have been flatlining for 10 years under the previous government. Uh, and again, it's why we need multi-employer bargaining uh, and why we're proud to present it to this parliament, uh, because we need to get wages moving in this country after a decade of those opposite. Um, so the problem uh, is not uh, that wages are going too far or too high right now in Australia. The problem is that they've not been moving at all. Uh, and these laws, they are about redressing the imbalance that has emerged over the past 10 years. The sky won't fall in, demand for workers won't dry up, 
uh, and it will not be the 1970s again. What will happen is wages will start moving. Thank you. Senator Nampa, Jimbo Price. Thank you, Mr President. Um, Acting President, uh, we hear a lot from this government uh, with regard for its concern for everyday Australians, yet they can't seem to come up uh, with a plan to reduce the cost of living for everyday Australians. Uh, instead, we have a um, rushed piece of legislation. And what does rushed legislation look like? Well, it looks like, um, it looks like inaccurate bargaining costs. It looks like a government that cannot demonstrate um, that it is able to produce accurate costings for small and medium business using its own formulas. I mean, is it 75,148, you know, already a, an expensive cost for medium business, or more accurately, more than $80,000 um, for medium business? <laughs> what else does uh, a rushed um, red legislation look like? Well, it looks like um, Google as a research tool for relying on, um, relying on shamans to strategists, psychics to sales reps, uh, healers to homemakers, Buddhists to businessmen, and med meditators to mediators to develop its policy on the run. And a minister who is uh, clearly prepared to throw his department under the bus uh, when he's called out for his unreliable research tactics. So uh, we're hearing a lot about accusations of um, scare campaigns and scare tactics and terminology such as frantic and frenzied. Well, there are, there are business people out there who are very, very concerned about what the impacts of this legislation means for them, the cost that it means for them. Uh, there's this talk about, uh, you know, this, is, this, this legislation is about supporting workers. Well, don't we have to support the business people that employ workers to ensure that the business people can appropriately support their employees? Otherwise, these individuals may, be, may well be without a job uh, in the end because we're hearing from business people, small to medium business owners, that uh, this legislation may, may impact them to the point where they have to lay off some of their workers, where they have to close the doors entirely on their businesses. Uh, so yes, there is reason uh, for concern. Uh, and, and this government has to recognise that that is the case. Um, you know, th 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 this is not an exercise about increasing wages. This is an exercise about handing over workplaces to the unions, of course. You know, one such industry, the mining industry, that every single one of us rely on for everything to do with our everyday lives, um, not to mention um, to support this rush toward renewables by this government. The mining industry is certainly an industry uh, that impacts the, pe the people of the Northern Territory where I come from and um, in, in a many number of ways. It needs to be understood that the industry itself already delivers a average annual pay rises of more than the CPI, with some companies increasing salaries uh, of employees by 7.8 per cent above uh, state inflation rates. Um, you know, these proposed workplace changes is, is, is a radical shape-up a shake-up of Australia's industrial relations system um, in decades. And if, if we want to look further into what it means, certainly um, for the mining sector, there is concern that this is this is going to lead to um, <laughs> lead to strikes, widespread strikes within the within the mining industry. You know, it has the potential um, to relate to, of course, the similar sorts of strikes as we've seen in the 1970s. Um, it threatens the mining industry in that it earns over $413 billion in exports and employs over 277,000 Australians in high-paid jobs already and contributes $43.2 billion in taxes. And this was in 2021. This is an industry that supports Australians across the board. Uh, in the last 20 years, employment in mining has tripled and, of course, wages have doubled, benefiting thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of Australians, especially in regional areas. And as I mentioned, the mining companies themselves are saying these changes will slow down Australia's energy transformation, uh, that we need for lithium, 
batteries, more copper for solar panels, more cobalt for electric vehicles, not more uncertainty and risk that will simply chase away, certainly, investment to our shores. Um, Thank you, Senator Denver, Chair Price. I'll just put the question first, Senator Thorpe, and then I will come give you the call. Put the question to the motion moved by Senator Chandler. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Senator Thorpe, you wish to take note of an answer? I do. Thank you, Deputy President. I note the minister's, uh, Minister Watt's response to racially motivated violence against First Nations kids was to actually talk about youth justice as if our kids are the problem. We're talking about adults perpetrating violence against our children in this country. The world knows about Cassius, and everyone was touched by that disgusting, uh, violent, racial attack. Even the PM knows about Cassius. But what about all the other children? In August, a 49-year-old woman mowed down two Aboriginal boys with her four-wheel drive, leaving one, Ronaldo Penny, in a coma for six days with a fractured skull, swelling and bleeding in the brain and a broken femur. He will carry these injuries for the rest of his life. In October, a 21-year-old man assaulted 15-year-old Cassius Turvey and a 13-year-old friend who was on crutches. Cassius was beaten to death. The 13-year-old was assaulted and racially vilified before his attacker stole his crutches. One week later—you didn't hear about this in the media—one week later, Leon Sutton Pickett and his 14-year-old brother-in-law were hunted down in a four-wheel drive, then assaulted with metal poles. This is in the great country called Oz, isn't it? Horrifically, the details of all this violence are similar. Homemade weapons, racial slurs and claims of mistaken identity. These predators know exactly who we are, Aboriginal people on Aboriginal land. For First Nations people, the violence doesn't stop with the assault. We then have to face a racist police network who either don't care or actively contribute to the violence. When Leon was attacked, police attended the scene. Get this. No one was arrested. Leon told officers that he wanted to press charges, and the police said that they were too busy. In November, 13-year-old Jaden Abraham was mauled by a police dog. 13-year-old Aboriginal child mauled by a police dog. He suffered severe injuries to his face, neck and arm. The Aboriginal Legal Service of Western Australia has called out the disproportionate use of police dogs on First Nations people. In the last year, police dogs were used against First Nations people in 61 per cent of cases. We know why this is happening. People brag about it online. I quote, the dogs would have a fat time munching their bones. Baseball bat or large bolt cutters have more than one use. Find them and start cutting hands off. This is barbaric. And it's unacceptable. And what's the Prime Minister saying about that? Call it what it is. Racially motivated terrorism. People are getting radicalised online, which leads to violence on our streets, and the police are part of the problem. Black lives matter. Our babies matter. What's the Albanese government going to do about it? What's the McGowan government going to do about it? Because all of these attacks happened in Western Australia. 
Labor has the power to protect our babies at the state and federal level. So do something. It's all talk and no action, Labor. Oh, wait, it's on the agenda for the Attorney General, but it's been on the agenda for 200 years. Act on what we're telling you. Ban unmuzzled police dogs, release all body cam footage when families ask you to, and stop hiding the truth. I put the question. Those for the question say aye. Against, no, the ayes have it. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? There being none, I'll move on. Um, I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? No. Nope. I'll call the clerk. Uh, no postponements have been lodged. Uh, the Environment and Communications Legislation Committee has sought an extension as shown at item 12 on the order of business. I remind senators that the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. Uh, and the question is that the now move to the condolence motion. It is with deep regret that I inform the Senate of the death on the 31st of October 2022 of the Honourable Robert James Bob Ellicott, AC KC, a former minister and member of the House of Representatives for the Division of Wentworth, New South Wales, from 1974 to 1981. I called the Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate. Thank you, uh, Madam President. Uh, and I seek leave uh, to move a motion relating to the death of uh, Bob uh, Ellicott. Uh, leave is granted, Senator Farrell. Thank you, President. Uh, I move that the uh, Senate records its Zorro at the death on the 31st of October 2022 of the Honourable Robert James, otherwise known as Bob Ellicott, ACKC, former Attorney General and Minister for Home Affairs and the Environment, and the former member uh, for Wentworth, uh, places on record its gratitude for his service to the parliament and to the nation, and tenders uh, its sympathy uh, to his family in their bereavement. Thank you, uh, President. Yep. I, I rise on behalf of the government to express uh, our condolences following the passing of uh, former barrister, minister and judge, uh, the Honourable Robert, uh, otherwise known as Bob James uh, Ellicott, ACKC, at the ripe old age of uh, 95. As I begin, I wish to convey the Senate's condolences to Mr Ellicott's family and his friends. Born in Moree, New South Wales, on what was Good Friday, the 15th of April, uh, 20. Uh, sorry, 1927, Bob Ellicott's life was long and impactful. As a child, he set his ambition to become a barrister, uh, which he set about making a reality by 1950 when he was admitted to the New South Wales Bar. In 1964, he was appointed a Queen's Counsel. Uh, then in 1969, he became the Solicitor General of Australia a role he held until 1973. During that time, Bob Ellicott served as uh, one of Australia's first delegates to the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, a role which provides a small degree of overlap uh, with the work I currently undertake in the trade portfolio. Bob entered Parliament <coughs> as the member for Wentworth in 1974 election. Following the 1975 election, Mr Ellicott was appointed Attorney-General in the Fraser Government. As Attorney-General, Mr Ellicott made a big mark on Australian legal structures. In his role, he established the Family Court and the Administrative Appeals Tribunal, which had both been initiated by the Whitlam Government. He was also responsible for legislation which set up the Human Rights Commission. However, his term as Attorney-General came to an end when he resigned his ministry after a disagreement uh, with the then Prime Minister in 1977. <clears throat> Mr. 
While I did not personally know uh, Mr Ellicott, I think we can get a sense of the person he was from his willingness to give up his role due to the difference of opinion with the then Prime Minister in line with Westminster tradition. However, in recognition of his ability and commitment to reform, not long after uh, <coughs> this he was reappointed to the Ministry as Minister for Home Affairs and Minister for the Capital Territory. It was in these roles he continued to build a legacy which continues to serve us to this day. One area where Bob made a contribution um, in was his role, which is particularly close uh, to my heart, and we, where he set uh, out establishing the Australian Institute of Sport following a notably poor performance by Australia at the 1976 Montreal Olympics. His passion for sport continued throughout the rest of his life, and I think it's fair to say that many of our current sporting heroes owe their success to Bob's forward-thinking approach to sport. Bob left Parliament in 1981 after making many significant contributions throughout his parliamentary career. The Bob's drive to contribute to Australian society continued. <coughs> Following his parliamentary career, Bob served on the federal court bench and as an arbitrator on the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Over the decades, his efforts saw him awarded with many accolades, um, which are too many to list here. This perhaps culminated uh, in him being recognised in uh, the 2017 Australia Day Awards, being awarded the Companion uh, of uh, the uh, AC in the General Division of the Order of Australia. The loving husband of Colleen, who passed in 2020, a loving father of Suzanne, Penelope, Michael and John and an adored grandfather and great-grandfather, our thoughts go out to his loved ones. In the words of John, Bob was a man of great compassion, love and commitment. We thank Bob Ellicott for the contribution he made to our country, his great life of service. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Senator Birmingham. Thank you, President. Uh, I rise to, uh, to join with the Deputy Leader of the Government in the Senate in support of this motion recognising the life and contribution of the Honourable Robert James or Bob Ellicott ACKC. Bob Ellicott was a scholar, a statutory office holder, an esteemed and respected barrister, a jurist and a parliamentarian. Whilst serving in the parliament as the member for Wentworth, from 1974 until his resignation in 1981, Bob Ellicott served as a senior minister and significant figure both during and in the years immediately following Australia's greatest political and constitutional crisis. He had, as Senator Farrell has indicated, gravitated towards law as a barrister from a very young age. The age of eight, in fact, is when he said that he had set his sights on becoming a barrister. Bob's success as a barrister ultimately saw him serve as the Commonwealth Solicitor General from 1969 until 1973, when he was caught by the lure of politics. Under Prime Minister Fraser, Bob Ellicott had become uh, sorry, under Prime Minister Malcolm Fraser, Bob Ellicott became Australia's first law officer as Attorney General, taking on the role as a man with a reputation for integrity and honesty, hallmarks which would also ultimately see him stand down from that position. In becoming Attorney General, Bob Ellicott became, and indeed remains, as I understand it, the only person to have served as both Australia's Solicitor General and Australia's Attorney General. Bob believed his discretion and independence as Attorney General were paramount, and when he felt they had come into conflict with Prime Minister Fraser and members of the Cabinet in relation to the Sankey v Whitlam and others proceedings, which as many others would be aware is a case intrinsically linked to the events preceding the dismissal and, uh, and those events known as the Kenlani Loans Affair, Bob Ellicott chose to resign as Attorney General. This was a bitter end to what at the time was the peak of a legal career of great eminence and achievement. But it was also the act of a man who was true to his oaths and commitments, who put his principle and respect and beliefs for the law first. And for that, he was respected, including by the Prime Minister with whom he had disagreed. 
With a softly spoken and mild-mannered demeanour, Bob was renowned for his belief in the law and the legal system. In 1975, leading up to the dismissal, he had spoken of and written of the role of the Governor-General with a legal opinion just weeks out from that eventful day of 11 November 1975, which the then respected National Times called the most thorough, tightly argued and prophetic legal opinion. Despite his departure from the coveted position of Attorney General, Malcolm Fraser rightly lauded Bob's achievements during his time in that office, pointing to his role in the restructuring of the federal court, in expansion of the jurisdiction of the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and his work to establish the Human Rights Commission, all within just two years in the office of Attorney General. Despite the loss of the position of Attorney General, Bob Ellicott was back in the Fraser Ministry within two months, reflective of the respect that Malcolm Fraser had for him, and continued to serve as a minister right through until his departure from politics in 1981. One of those roles was as Minister for the Capital Territory, and it was Bob Ellicott who led the charge towards the first referendum on self-government in the ACT. The result of that 1978 vote was for the status quo, but there is no doubt that Bob Ellicott can be considered as one of the founders of the self-government movement for our national capital. It would take another decade for the ACT to take on self-government, and even then with many doubters, but that foundation was laid in part by Bob Ellicott. As many will have seen from the many tributes paid to Bob since his death on 31 October this year at the age of 95, it was Bob's role as Senator Farrell referenced in establishing the Australian Institute of Sport that is perhaps his greatest legacy. Bob himself said it was his proudest achievement and, on, and one of the great privileges of his life. He described how gradually the AIS took off in full flight, he said like a 747 on its first flight. It is a legacy that set Australia on a path towards being competitive in the world of high performance sporting endeavour in the years and decades following the establishment of the AIS. Generations have since benefited benefited and will continue to do so. It had been driven by the bitter disappointment of Bob and many others at Australia's performance at those 1976 Montreal Olympics, in which, where it's hard to believe in this day and age, Australia won no gold medals, just one silver and four bronze medals, driving him towards the establishment of the AIS, which famed athlete Robert De Costello has said after Bob's death that he was the one who turned the whole high-performance approach around. In 1981, Bob decided to return to the law, leaving the parliament to be appointed to the federal court bench. He had hoped to be appointed Chief Justice of the High Court, and indeed discussions had occurred about that potential appointment. But his publicly stated views and opinions in relation to the dismissal saw him deemed too controversial a figure for the role. His time on the federal court was, to be short, like his time as Attorney-General, just a couple of years, but equally impactful. Jack Waterford, writing in the Canberra Times following Bob, Bob's decision to leave the federal court, described him as having proven himself to be an outstanding judge who will be a great loss to the federal court. He said hey, he has demonstrated he has particularly demonstrated his ability and his radicalism in his work in administrative law. Jack Waterford went on to highlight specifically some of that work in administrative law and the fact that Bob Ellicott had brought an interpretation of administrative law, particularly in terms of the rights of members of the public and public servants themselves to natural justice in their dealings with the bureaucracy and in terms of the right of public servants to the review of bureaucratic decisions made affecting them. He said they were landmark decisions in relation to the new administrative order. Ultimately, Bob Ellicott's love of the work he had undertaken as a barrister saw him decide to leave the bench and also his desire to be able to speak out on the issues that mattered to him more. And he returned to the bar. He remained active as a barrister and also in a range of other ways, including, as has been referenced, as a judge on the Court of Arbitration for Sport of the International Olympic Committee from 1995 
all the way through until 2015, when he was nearing his 90th year. His induction into the Sport Australia Hall of Fame in 2016 was a fitting tribute to a person who gave so much to the development of Australian sport. President, on behalf of the coalition, I add our condolences to those expressed in the House earlier this month to Bob's family, friends and many colleagues across politics, law and sport, but most especially his children, Suzanne, Penelope, Michael and John, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. Now reunited with his beloved wife, Colleen, who died just two years ago, we thank him for his service, them for sharing him. May he rest in peace. Thank you, Senator Birmingham. I ask senators to join in a moment of silence to signify their assent to the motion. Thank you, senators. Senator Urquhart. President, I should have probably done this at um, placing of business, but on behalf of Senator White, the chair of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation, um, I give notice of her intention at the giving of notices on the next day of sitting to withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one for four sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the anti-money laundering and counter-terrorism financing rules amendment instrument 2021 number two and business of the Senate notice of motion number one for seven sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the financial framework supplementary powers amendment, Attorney General's portfolio measures number one, regulations of 2022. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. Uh, Senator Roberts, I'll give you the call. Uh, thank you. President, uh, I withdraw my motion, uh, formal motion number 79. Thank you, Senator Roberts. Uh, so we'll go to business of the Senate number one, standing in the name of Senators Fawcett and Ciccone. Who, <laughs> Fawcett and Ciccone. Oh, okay, thank you, Senator Askew. Um, on behalf of Senators Fawcett and Ciccone, I ask that business of the Senate notice of motion number one be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. So the question is, the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the names of Senator Fawcett and Ciccone, be agreed to. Those without opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. We'll now move to general business notice of motion number 88, standing in the name of Senators Mackenzie and others. Is that Senator Askew again? Thank you, Senator Askew. Which one was it, 88? 88. Sorry. Okay. On behalf of Senator Cash and others, I ask that general business notice of motion number 88 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. Senator Ayres. Now I'm in the right spot. Well, <clears throat> I suppose the opposition has made its uh, seek what, leave to make a short statement. Thank you. Uh, leave is granted for one minute, Senator Ayres. Well, the opposition's made its uh, approach to orders for production pretty clear. Wide-ranging fishing expeditions at the rate of more than two a sitting day so far. Its approach in government, by contrast, was also very clear. In just the last parliament alone, those opposite issued claims of public interest immunity in response to 40 per cent of Senate orders for production of documents. The former government, led by the lamentable Scott Morrison, was a conspiracy to pervert the processes, uh, to keep things secret, to protect ministers. The former government claimed public interest immunity to withhold the final report in relation to Senator McKenzie's award of funding under the Community Sports Infrastructure Program. They claim public interest immunity to protect Senator McKenzie from producing documents relating to the dairy industry. They did it every day of the week that we were here. Uh, we're not going to stand a word of criticism from a government uh, that, that should you. be uh, uh, ashamed of itself. Senator Ayres, two issues. One, you need to refer to members in this other place by their correct titles, and I would ask you to withdraw the comment you made about the former Prime Minister without repeating the comment. I, I withdraw whatever it was that I said. That, Thank uh, you very much. Um, 
we will now um, put the I called you to put the question, didn't I, Senator Askew? Yes. So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Cash and others be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. Division required? We're cancelling the division. Sorry, senators. So I'm going to call that as um, I'm going to call that for the eyes. The eyes have it. So we'll now go to general business. Notice of motion number 85, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. Uh, 85. Yeah. I ask that general business notice of motion number 85 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. S Senator Ayres, are you seeking leave? I am seeking leave. Uh, Madam uh, one minute is granted, I believe. Well, they, they, they use public interest immunity claims to protect almost everybody in the former government. We talked about Senator McKenzie before. Well, what about Senator Cash? They, they used it to protect her from, to avoid producing documents related to the rorting of infrastructure grants and the inflated purchase of the Leppington Triangle land. There isn't a single point where the previous government wasn't prepared to use public interest immunity claims, which properly constructed are appropriately used, but they use them to debauch the process, to debauch the public sector, to debauch the proper processes of government. And what you'll find with the new government is a very strong contrast. Those, it, it suited the previous government to use these provisions to protect themselves. And again, it's pretty hot to have any criticism in here of this government's approach to those questions. Thank you, Senator Ayres. So the question is that the motion that's moved uh, by Senator Askew, standing in the name of Senator Bag Bragg, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Let's ring the bells for four minutes. That'll be quick.
the doors. So the question is, uh, general business number 85, standing in the name of Senator Bragg and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as tell for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as tell for the nose. Order. There being 42 ayes and 20 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I advise senators there may be more divisions. We will now go to general business. Notice of motion number 86, standing in the name of Senator Bragg. <coughs> Senator Askew. Um, on behalf of Senator Bragg, I ask that general business notice of motion number 86 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So, uh, Senator Chisholm, I uh, believe leave is granted for one minute. Senator Bragg's motion, as usual, is a waste of time. He has, asked already, he has already asked the Assistant Treasurer for the exact same documents through a freedom of information process and a subset of the request through the parliamentary question on notice. Senator Bragg is good at wasting the Senate's time, and again, this is another stunt. It is not a duplication process, but a triplication. The government is more than happy to be transparent on this issue through the FOI and the question on notice process. The motion is a waste of time and should be opposed. So the question is that the uh, general business notice of no motion number 86, standing in the name of Senator Bragg and moved by uh, Senator Askew be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. And the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Uh, it's a change of pairs, I believe.
Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 86, standing in the name of Senator Bragg and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 40 ayes and 18 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We we'll now move to general business notice of motion number 87, uh, standing in the name of Senator Hume. <coughs> Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Hume, I ask that general business notice of motion number 87 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that uh, general business notice of motion number 87, standing in the name of Senator Hume, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the ayes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 87, standing in the name of Senator Hume, moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Urquhart as teller for the uh, uh, Senator Askew as teller for the ayes, and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes.
Order. There being 40 ayes and 18 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. We now move to general business notice of motion number 85, 89. Beg your pardon. Standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator Mackenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number 89 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I call Senator Askew. I move the motion. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 89, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Lock the door. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 89, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Order. There being 40 ayes and 18 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. I now move to general business notice of motion number 90, standing in the name of Senator McKenzie. Senator Askew. On behalf of Senator McKenzie, I ask that general business notice of motion number 90 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, I'll call Senator Askew. I move the motion. 
So the question is that general business notice of motion number 90, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. <laughs> Order, lock the doors. So the question is that general business notice of motion number 90, standing in the name of Senator Mackenzie and moved by Senator Askew, be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Askew as teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart as teller for the noes. Ayes and 18 noes. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. That now concludes formal business. Proposal from Senator Chandler has been received. Understanding Order 75 as follows. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today I propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Australian government to take concrete action, including applying sanctions comparable to those applied by like-minded nations in response to the human rights abuses and deadly violence perpetrated by the Iranian government against its citizens and other actions of the Iranian government, including its support for Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Is the proposal supported? It is. Thank you. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly and I call Senator Chandler. Thank you, President. And this is certainly a matter of urgency because people in Iran are dying every day at the Excuse hands me, of the Sorry, government Senator of Iran. Chandler, could you please move the motion before you speak to it? Indeed, 
Uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, I move the motion. Thank you. This is certainly a matter of urgency because people in Iran are dying every day at the hands of the government of Iran. Women are being killed. Children are being killed. Innocent civilians are dying. And while Iranian authorities have done their best to hide from the world what is happening by cutting off internet and access to social media, the world knows who is responsible for this. I'm sure every senator in this chamber has received countless emails and social media messages and phone calls from the Iranian community making clear that they want action, not just words, from our government. It has been more than two months since Masa Gina Amini was killed. I've been calling for urgent action by the government since the week of her death back in September. It is completely mystifying to the Iranian-Australian community why our government hasn't chosen to act sooner and faster. A fortnight ago, when the opposition asked the Prime Minister why Australia was yet to apply the same targeted sanctions that our allies have, the Prime Minister quite disgracefully chose to talk about considering the implications for businesses before acting. This is a situation where women are being beaten in the streets by their government for not covering their hair. Children are being shot and killed by the military. It is not a time to be sitting around mulling over business dealings with Iran. It is time to act. Other countries have acted and have applied multiple rounds of sanctions to Iran. This government likes to talk about acting in concert with our partners and the international community, but that is precisely the opposite of what they've done when it comes to sanctioning individuals responsible for killing women and children in Iran. Six days ago, Canada announced its fifth round of sanctions in response to the recent violence and human rights abuses. In that same time, our government has announced zero sanctions. The US has announced multiple rounds of sanctions directly in response to the current violence. So has the UK. Australia, none. These sanction notices provide long lists of individuals within the Iranian regime who our allies have identified and taken action against, along with detailed explanations of why they are being sanctioned. Yet when I asked the Foreign Minister in the Department of Foreign Affairs whether we agree with our allies that those individuals deserve to be sanctioned, all we receive in response is no comment. We can't discuss that. By the way, if you go and look at the Hansard for those foreign affairs estimates held 13 days ago, we still haven't had a transcript published. What is going on? Not only can the community not get answers from the government, they can't even access a record of official proceedings of the parliament from two weeks ago. I am pleased that yesterday the minister confirmed that government agencies tasked with countering foreign interference have been tasked to look at the threats and intimidation made to Australian critics of the Iranian regime. This is an incredibly serious matter, one that I raised in estimates myself and have subsequently raised with our eSafety Commissioner in written correspondence. Security and intelligence services around the world are making clear that this is a very real and very dangerous matter. MI5 has confirmed that Iran's intelligence services have made at least 10 attempts to kidnap or even kill British nationals or people based in the United Kingdom regarded by Tehran as a threat. And meanwhile, as if what they're doing to their own civilians isn't bad enough, we know that Iran is arming Russia with drones to kill Ukrainian civilians. Once again, our allies have sanctioned Iranian authorities over this, but Australia, according to the minister's answer to my questions earlier this week, has not. It is not good enough for Australia to be lagging behind our allies in responding to this human rights crisis with targeted sanctions. Iran is growing bolder every day in their violence and their threats to international peace and security. It is time for Australia to play our part in holding them to account. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Senator Shelton. Ron. Now, it is a shame it didn't come a bit earlier. 
because in government they oversaw a decade of cuts to Australian diplomacy and multilateral institutions. A decade of inattention and cynicism. Those opposite were members of the UN committee that appointed Iran, get this, appointed Iran to the Commission for the Status of Women. They could have acted when they were in government. They did nothing. They said nothing. And unfortunately, they seem to remain committed to the Scott Morrison approach of putting political point scoring ahead of the national interest in foreign policy. As said, Senator Chandler well knows, the Albanese government is committed to action on Iran. We have acted and we will continue to act. The Australian Order. government Order. The Australian government condemns the deadly and disproportionate use of force against protesters in Iran. Following the tragic death of Mashamani, a 22-year-old Kurdish woman whose Kurdish name was Gina. We have raised our concerns regarding the brutal crackdown on protesters directly with the Iranian embassy in Canberra. The government has been alarmed by reports that hundreds of people have been killed and many more injured, including dozens of children as a result of the heavy-handed measures Iranian authorities have implemented to crack down on ongoing protests. Australia supports the right of the Iranian people to protest peacefully and calls on the Iranian authorities to exercise restraint in response to ongoing demonstrations. As the Foreign Minister, Senator Wong, has told the Senate, we will continue to work with our international partners and continue building pressure on the regime to cease its brutal campaign against its own citizens. Now, Senator Chandler seems to want to give people who might be the subject of sanctions as much warning as possible, which of course weakens their effect. It's an open mic night in the Liberal Party Foreign Policy Committee and they're all competing for who can score the pettiest political point. The government won't play Order. political games. We'll continue Order. to step up. The government won't play political games. We'll continue to step up pressure on the Iranian regime. Australia stands with the Iranian women and girls in their struggle for equality and empowerment, and will continue to call on Iran to cease its oppression of women. We are committed to promoting gender equality and women's empowerment and ending violence against women and girls worldwide. The Liberals and Nationals had their chance in government and they did nothing. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Steelejohn. Thank you. Every day we wake up to more devastating news from Iran. Just today, there is news of Iran's Revolutionary Guards attacking targets in neighbouring northern Iraq for a second day in a row. The airstrikes targeted bases of Kurdish separatist groups uh, in northern Iraq, according to most recent reports. Also today, Iran's football team at the World Cup have been told that they could face reprisals if they fail to sing the national anthem in their remaining World Cup group games, after a politician in the country uh, said that they will never allow anyone to insult our national anthem. Despite these chilling warnings, uh, the players stayed silent at their first game in solidarity uh, with the Iranian people protesting uh, follow, following Jinnah Amini's death. A major disruption to internet services uh, has also been reported uh, today in Iran. There have been reports of indiscriminate killings of more protesters, including children. This is all in simply one day's worth of news. The Australian government must do more. 
These behaviours by the Iranian regime have continued and continued. Words of condemnation are not enough. Actions must be taken. The Australian Greens remain deeply concerned about the ongoing situation in Iran and are in solidarity uh, with protesters in Iran. We will always protect the right to protest. We will always fight for people's rights to choose their dress, their partner, their religion, their career and what they want to do with their bodies. The Iranian authorities' suppression of the rights of women, of LGBTIQ plus people and other minorities, including the Bahi, must end. The Australian Greens support this urgency motion and we are again calling on the Australian Government to impose Magnitsky-style uh, sanctions and other targeted sanction measures, including financial asset freezes and the introduction of visa bans uh, for people linked to the Iranian regime, including members of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps, key security officials, uh, militia personnel and, the, and members of the morality police. Now, what we have heard in conclusion, what I will uh, observe here is that we have heard from the government an argument uh, that they, they've done enough already or that there is little more that they could do. The government of this country must engage with this issue in solidarity now. Thank you, Senator Steele. John, Senator Scar. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I agree and endorse and associate myself with every single thing that Senator Steele John just said in this place. And I was very pleased a few weeks ago to attend a, uh, a rally with uh, the good senator, which was convened by our wonderful Burmese diaspora with respect to the human rights abuses which are occurring in, in Burma as we are here today. Uh, this is an important issue, and our Iranian diaspora in Australia expects us to act. This place adopted Magnitsky sanctions, adopted laws which would enable them to be imposed. They need to be applied. The fact of the matter is that Western democracies around the world are moving ahead of us at a rate of knots. The death of Masa Amini uh, has been a lightning rod, an absolute lightning rod, for disaffection in Iran. It, is, it has come to symbolise the repression and violence against Iranians from its own government. And this country needs to act. We need to act. Hundreds have been killed. The journalist who actually broke the story with respect to Masa Amini, Nilafar Hamidi, has herself been arrested. She's herself been arrested after she took photographs and communicated on Twitter the reaction of Masa Amini's family to her death. She's actually herself been put in prison. This is unacceptable. The Australian government needs to act. And this should not be. This should not be about partisan politics. We should be above above partisan politics in this regard. And in relation to Senator Sheldon's point about us broadcasting, broadcasting the names of those who should be subject to these sanctions, you don't need to broadcast them. Just have a look at the press statement dated 26 October 2022, issued by Anthony Blinken, Secretary of State of the United States. They actually list the people who are subject to. Magnitsky-style sanctions. They're already on the public record, and I'll go through the categories because these are the people who need to be held accountable for the atrocities and the brutalities that are occurring in Iran today. The first category, those who, and, and there are five individuals, six officials, I should say, the government of Iran, responsible or com complicit in serious human rights abuses, who hold leadership positions within Iran's prison system including at Even Prison and in the provinces of Sistan and Bulukstan and Kurdistan, among others. That's the first category. Category one, you can read their names. The Department, the Secretary of State, Department of the Secretary of State acted 26 October 2022. We're nearly in December. What are we waiting for? That's the first category. The second category, three individuals serving as commanders of the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, who have been at the forefront of the brutality. Again, they have been identified as individuals directly responsible for the suppression of peaceful protests and arrests of peaceful protesters. 
That's your second category. The third category, those people associated with what's referred to as the Raven Academy, which engages in cyber security and the training of hackers which are being used to stifle freedom of speech in Iran. That's the next category. The fourth category, the Iranian commander and chief of police in Isfahan province, who has engaged in gross violations of human rights, namely the cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment of peaceful protesters. Again, another category. The names of these people are here. They're already the subject. They're already the subject of sanctions imposed by the United States. What are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? The diaspora, the Iranian diaspora in Australia expects us to act, and we should act in solidarity with our brothers and sisters in Iran. There is no reason not to wait. I know, I know, and I listen and respect the Minister for Foreign Affairs. I know she cares deeply about these issues. I don't, I don't suggest otherwise. But there is potentially a systemic problem here. There is a systemic problem here, in my view, in terms of Australia's response to human rights abuses, whether or not they occur in, in Myanmar, in Sudan, in Tigray, in, in Ethiopia or in, um, or, or, in this case, in Iran. And that is, we've got these sanctions on the books. The rest of the world moves and, for some reason, we don't move when we should move, when there's a moral obligation to move. And that's what we should do. That's why this resolution is important. And I'm sure all senators here would agree with the sentiments behind this resolution. But we need to act in, in, to enforce human Thank rights. Thank you, Senator Scar. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise in strong support of this motion today. And on behalf of the Australian Greens, we stand with all of the women and girls and people of Iran. They have a government that is killing them. It is unfathomable to privileged people like us here in Australia, where whilst our democracy has problems, we're essentially safe from being shot at by our own government. This is a just extremely deeply distressing issue, and I appreciate that the foreign minister has um, made some representations to the ambassador and, and made some appropriate remarks by Twitter a month or so ago, but it is not enough. It's not enough. If you, if you feel it, and I think you do, you've just got to follow through with some actions. As has been said by many of the previous contributors, most of the world has already done this. It's not like we're daring to go out on a limb and lead here, which wouldn't be such a problem if we were, but everybody else has already imposed sanctions. They're already taking really strong actions and sending a really strong message that it is not acceptable to tell people, to tell women what they can or cannot wear. And it's certainly not acceptable to arrest people and then kill them because they haven't got the headscarf on properly or the pants are too tight. It is inconceivable that our government is not doing more to stop this sort of treatment um, of uh, people in another nation. There are so many things that could be done. My colleague and many of the other speakers have gone through the Magnitsky-style sanctions that could be employed. But frankly, we should also be declaring the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps a terrorist organisation. We should be immediately moving to withdraw the Iranian regime from the Commission of the Status of Women. These are concrete measures that could and should be taken by the Australian government and that we would not be alone in taking um, around the world. I was so proud to stand at a Brisbane rally and a massive shout out to the strong Brisbane Iranian community who are holding successive rallies, as I'm sure is happening right around the country. These people are strong and determined. They deserve safety in their own country and they deserve a government that they've got the right to vote for and vote out. I hope that this strength and resilience and sheer bravery and courage of the women and girls and people of Iran will ultimately lead to a democratic system for them. And I want the Australian government to do everything it can to send that message that we are with you. That is what we want for you too. And you get to make your own decisions about your own lives and your own government. Um, I don't think that's too much to ask. So uh, again, I was so proud and privileged to stand with those Brisbane folk and um, I've got a beautiful little plaque now that says Women, Life, Freedom that I've put with pride in my parliamentary office that reminds us of the job we have to do here to stand up for the rights of women, girls and people everywhere, not just in our own nation. Thank you, Senator Waters. Senator David Pocock. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Chandler for moving this 
uh, it is indeed a matter of public importance. It's been almost 70 days since Mas Amini was murdered. We continue to hear news of shocking developments, including the beating and killing of teenage girls in school raids orchestrated by Iranian security services. This regime is clearly very willing to escalate its violent oppression of the women and girls who refuse to be silenced in their ever louder calls for freedom. I am in awe of the courage and bravery of Iranians for standing up against this regime's draconian laws. They are risking imprisonment, they are risking death. Over 300 people have been killed since the protests began, including more than 40 children. The regime apparently believes these protests are an existential threat to their grip on power. And I believe it's beyond time to move from soft diplomacy with a regime such as this to targeted sanctions. In recent weeks, I've had the privilege of attending protests here in Canberra, standing alongside the Iranian Australian community and others in our community. While these crimes may be happening, thousands of kilometres away, our local community is feeling the pain closely. I want to thank everyone who has written to me, called my office or come to Parliament House to keep this issue front and centre. I hear you and I stand with you. We hear you and, and stand with you. I have written to uh, Minister Wong twice, calling on the government to apply targeted sanctions on Iranian officials. I applaud Minister Wong's willingness to speak in support of the Iranian people, but clearly now it's time for more action from the government. Thank you, Senator Pocock. Senator Shoebridge. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I want to associate myself with the contributions that have been made by those senators across the political divide calling for action today. The wave of protests in Iran following the death of 22-year-old Gina Masa Amini now two and a bit months long, continue. In the last week alone, 72 people have been killed in the brutal repression of protests. This takes the total number of people killed to at least 416, more than 50 children. Thousands upon thousands more have been arrested, and now the regime is threatening to execute those protesters. The UN has described the situation as critical. All of this is part of that ongoing brutal crackdown against protests and dissent. Largely young people, the future of Iran, who are calling for basic human rights we take for granted, democracy and freedom. And their rallying cry is women, life, freedom. The crackdown has been particularly severe in the Kurdish areas of Iran. Martial law has also been imposed in Mahabad. Convoys of armed forces are moving towards cities of Iranian, of Iranian Kurdistan, and some of the deadliest violence has been directed against other minorities, including the Baloghi community. We cannot let the Iranian government use this as an opportunity for further genocide. What has been clearest throughout these recent months is the bravery of the people of Iran, and we've seen that on the streets and out the, side of, out the front of this parliament. Their staunch, unwavering courage in the face of terror and brutality, their solidarity of Iranians who are rallying and protesting in the diaspora, enormous solidarity, is powerful, inspiring and important, and we're saying today we hear you. I watched as the Iranian soccer team stood silent while the anthem played at the World Cup. It gave me chills. We've watched videos of women removing their scarves, cutting their hair, walking bravely towards security forces, and they want us to stand up and act. The people of Iran are stepping up, and we need to stand with them. And that means immediate and comprehensive Magnitsky sanctions against that awful regime, targeting the criminal leadership, not the people of Iran. It means taking the action this parliament and the powers this parliament gave the government to act. It Thank means you, Senator solidarity. Shubridge. Senator Van. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Right now, in, in every single day in Iran, the basic freedom and rights of the Iranian people are being violated. And every day that the Albanese government does nothing and, and refuses to take a stand is another day that more innocent lives are lost. Authoritarian regimes around the world are taking the lives of innocent people. We see this clearly in Ukraine, we see it in China, and we're seeing it writ large in Iran. We cannot allow these authoritarian regimes 
to ignore the international rules-based order. The, det the detainee diplomacy undertaken by the Iranian regime when it jailed Dr Kylie Moore Gilbert for uh, around three years was just one symbol of the despicable acts of this regime and its complete disregard for the principles of law and the principles of human rights, including freedom of speech. Countries like Canada are leading the world in standing up for women's rights by sanctioning Iran. Canada's me measures prohibit dealings with the several individuals and entities, effectively freezing any assets they may hold in Canada and banning them from the country. Australia needs to follow this lead. We need to stand up for the people of Iran with everything that we can do, and we can do more, because at the moment this government is not doing anything but talking. Australia needs to follow in the footsteps of like-minded countries like Canada, the US and the UK and impose Magnitsky style sanctions on Iran and its regime. This should include financial asset freezes and travel bans against members of the Revolutionary Guard, the uh, morality police and other key officials, as well as sanctions and, and financial sanctions against the government. We now can take these actions due to the coalition's government signing into law the Autonomous Sanctions Amendment, Magnitsky Style and Other Thematic Sanctions Act 2021, which we did in December last year. The coalition has made it clear to, to the government that we will provide bipartisan support for Australia to do the same. Statecraft is a responsibility of government, and sanctions are a tool of statecraft. The government is doing nothing. We hear lots of rhetoric from the table. We hear the media, see the media performances. Still nothing is, being, is happening. The government said, and we heard this in estimates the other week, that, only, that the uh, charge d'affaires, the deputy head of mission of the Iranian embassy, had been called in by a first assistant secretary of DFAT. Why hasn't the foreign minister called in the, the DHOM? Why has it been left to a lowly official in DFAT? Surely we can send a stronger signal than that. The Iranian community in Australia is calling loudly for the Australian government to do more. They are outraged that nothing has been done, completely outraged. I've spoken at, I think, now about four rallies in Melbourne and here in Canberra, and the amount of sadness, the horror they're witnessing back home, the anger that they're feeling that nothing is happening here is palpable, and yet this government ignores them. We need to be able to stand up for the people of Iran. We need to be able to show that we care about human rights, about the rights of women and children, and not to stand by idly while people are being shot in the street for exercising a right that we would fight for here in Australia. This government is all words and no action, and I call on the Albanese government to do more, to bring in sanctions, to stand up for the people of Iran. The coalition government brought in sanctions against the Russians after the invasion. We did it within days, and we had the support of the opposition. We are giving you our support to do the same against the Iranian regime. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Van. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Chandler be agreed to. All of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Um, I've already. Do you want it re put? Uh, okay, I will re-put the question. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Chandler be agreed to. All of those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. I think the ayes have it. Division required. Division required. Ring the bell for four minutes.
Uh, senators, I believe uh, the ayes have it, so the division is cancelled. The ayes have it. Senator Scar, yeah. Senator Scar. Acting Deputy President, I was just perhaps seeking some clarification for Hansard as to how the division was cancelled. Senator Pratt, uh, I understand it was cancelled at the request of the Labor Party. President, I'm happy to put that on the record now. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The president has uh, also received the following letter from Senator McKim that, um, dear president, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I give notice that today the Australian Greens propose to move that, in the opinion of the Senate, the following is a matter of urgency. The need for the Senate to support the banning of fossil fuel sponsorship in sport, recognising the leadership shown recently by prominent athletes speaking out against fossil fuel companies sponsoring sport organisations. Uh, your sincerity, uh, Nick McKim. Is that proposal supported? Okay. I understand that informal arrangements thank you, have been uh, made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I ask that the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. Senator Thorpe. Uh, Senator Thorpe, before you start, can I ask, please, senators who are not remaining for the debate, if you could uh, leave the chamber? Thank you. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. This country loves sport. Our athletes Senator, are our children's role. Sorry, could you move the motion before you speak to it? I move the motion. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. My apologies. Uh, this country loves sport. Our athletes are our children's role models. For First Nations communities, sport has played a role in our gatherings and celebrations since before colonisation, bringing people together and strengthening our culture. Recently, we have been seeing more and more athletes, fans and community leaders taking action for climate justice. This shows the next generation what good leadership looks like in caring for our country and our communities. Climate change is making our country sick, and fossil fuel companies are continuing to destroy our lands, our waters and our skies, fueling climate change and killing us. Fossil fuels are the new tobacco. When we realised that tobacco had serious consequences to our health, we decided that the companies responsible for these harms had no place in sponsoring the sports teams and athletes we love. Now, as this country suffers devastating floods and fires, our athletes and everyday people are taking a stand to say that these dirty polluters have lost their social licence and have no place in sponsoring our beloved sports teams and players. In, a, in an attempt to regain this social licence, these dirty companies are pumping millions of dollars into sponsoring some of our biggest sports teams and events giving an estimated $14 million a year to national sporting teams, not to mention the millions in donations they give to both the Labor Party and the Liberal Party every year to keep this destructive industry alive. Recent polling shows that a majority of Australians believe that fossil fuel sponsorship is the new cigarette sponsorship 
and that fossil fuel companies should be banned from sponsoring national sports teams. This research shows that fossil fuel companies have lost their social licence to sports wash our national teams and major events, given that gas, coal and oil companies are accelerating the harmful impacts of climate change and extreme weather events. It's unsurprising that Australians and our athletes want these companies out of sport. As the only party, the only party in this place that does not accept donations from the polluting companies that are destroying our country and the globe, the Greens welcome and support the leadership shown by our deadly Noongar sister netballer Danelle Wallum, Noongar ex-AFL player Dale Kickett and Australian Test captain Pat Cummings in taking a stand against racist mining companies and fighting for climate justice. In voicing their objections to fossil fuel companies sponsoring their teams, these athletes are using their influence for positive change and that should be commended. The Greens want fossil fuels companies to be banned from all forms of advertising and sponsorships, including sponsoring any sporting team, organisation or event. If the government chooses to ignore the leadership of these athletes whilst they get selfies with them and stand on podiums, uh, which is quite hypocritical, they will be showing their, where their allegiances really lie, not with our athletes and not with our communities, but with their mates in the fossil fuel industry who no longer have permission to continue destroying our country and polluting the planet. Senator Macdonald, you have the call. Very much, Acting Deputy President. Well, opponents of conventional energy companies and their involvement in sports sponsorship are determined to cut Australia's zinc-covered nose off to spite its face. Australia has always been a world leader in sport, but it now appears we want to lead the world in hypocrisy. Many professional sporting teams are coming under pressure to cut all ties with energy resources companies, but if they were really serious, that would mean no more flying to games and no more diesel fuelled team buses, no more night games unless the stadium lights run on completely renewable energy, which may prove difficult to date on a dark windless night. Same with air conditioning in the rooms and coaches' boxes. Boots and sneakers are out. Mouth guards, plastic drink bottles, goals posts, playing apparel, clubs, bats, balls and supporters' gear too. And fans will have to stand because plastic grandstand seating is also out. Did anyone tell them these products are all made from minerals or petroleum resources? Professional sport would not exist without the byproducts of key mineral and energy commodities like coal, oil and gas. And I'm looking forward to seeing if this government is going to reject this radical position or whether it will say that somehow we're too good for the over $40 billion worth of royalties and company taxes paid for by resources companies and that we don't want to accept their money? Are we also too good for the hundreds of thousands of Australians who accept salaries and wages from resource companies? Are we too good for them as well? Recently, Hancock Prospecting, Woodside and Alinta Energy came under attack for the crime of daring to help our athletes play sport for a living, earn millions of dollars and bask in the adoration of fans. The truth is that much of professional and community sport is made possible because of Australian resources. For instance, Hancock Prospecting ploughs money into minor sports that don't get the big sponsors, such as Rowing Australia, Volleyball Australia and Synchronised Swimming Australia. And community sporting bodies represent mums and dads who take kids to sporting fields and ovals and stadiums right across the country every weekend and during the week. And so it's people like Mrs Reinhart and our great resources companies who are putting their hands in their pockets and allowing these things to happen. Sadly, some sports stars—the Greens, most of the Labor Party, the Teals, Green Independents—don't seem to realise that traditional dispatchable energy from conventional sources 
are pivotal to our ability to live first-class lifestyles. They also ignore the fact that almost all the big energy companies have publicly and firmly committed to reducing their own emissions. They employ the most environmental scientists and do the most environmental studies outside of the public sector. They sponsor programs for underprivileged and Indigenous youth that don't garner the big headlines. And many of these programs are in regional areas where young people don't have access to the best coaching, the best facilities and the decent equipment available in the cities. And under these circumstances, it's hard enough for a country kid to crack the big time, but now we're being told that we have to put another obstacle in their way. Criticism of energy company sponsorship ignores the fact that regional sports clubs run on shoestring budgets, chook raffles and sponsorships from resource companies and the local businesses that supply these companies. What virtue signalling inner city professional athletes call sports washing is actually direct community benefit to struggling regional towns. Resources companies support regional communities with infrastructure such as pools, housing, libraries and sports facilities. The world is transitioning to renewable energy, but we can't just snap our fingers and end the use of coal, oil and gas. The demonisation of energy companies is truly astonishing because without them, we wouldn't have lights, heating, computers, mobile phones and myriad other first world conveniences. People can have views, but the views being expressed currently are extreme and ignore the fact of energy requirements in this country now and into the future. Thank you, Senator. Senator Payman. Thank you, Deputy Acting President. Sport has the ability to bring communities together, to share a common purpose and teach us all important life lessons. Our incredible Australian sporting heroes have a role to play in moving society forward. Players need to be heard on important matters and need to have avenues to voice their support or dissatisfaction for any issues they have in the workplace. We need to make sure players are being listened to regarding issues in their sport, including sponsorship. The emerging issue of players speaking on their sport's choice of sponsor reflects broader conversations that Australians are having around the country on social, environmental and cultural issues. Now, this is, however, a, fact, a, a matter for the individual sports and their governing bodies. Now, what's important is our supporting environments. Our sporting environments should have modern Australian workplaces where athletes are entitled to collective bargaining and the ability to fight for wages and conditions. The Albanese Labor government's investment in sport is about getting more Australians involved in sport, bringing communities together, boosting the economy and supporting our elite athletes to pursue success on the global stage. We recognise the importance of sport being safe, fair and inclusive for all, so, so that every Australian can feel the rush only sport can bring you. Now, last month, I had the honour of meeting and participating in a panel discussion run by the Bashar Hooli Foundation Girls Leadership Program. We focused on the experience of Muslim women in leadership roles, the ups and downs they experienced, and the importance of getting involved in community sport. The best part was hearing from young women from all different backgrounds and all ages about how much they love playing sports. It was remarkable and inspiring to see their resilience in the face of obstacles and their enthusiasm to be the change they wanted to see in the world. They recounted how participating in sports helped improve their physical and mental health, develop their self-confidence, establish their place in society and build leadership skills. I'm not much of an athlete myself, but I do know how important sport is to the communities we represent, how it brings people together, improves people's confidence and their engagement in the community. This is an important period for Australian sports. We bring 
together Australia's sports community and celebrate the upcoming green and gold runway of major sporting events in the lead-up to the Brisbane 2032 Olympic and Paralympic Games. We have an incredible opportunity to unite, inspire and build Australia through sport. It will provide us with wonderful opportunities to boost and inspire more community participation right across the nation. Now, regarding the motion moved by Senator McKim, these matters are for the sports clubs and their governing bodies. But I will stress again that it is important for us to remember that our sporting environments are still workplaces. Our incredible Australian athletes, like any other worker, should have a say in their workplace environment and conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. Senator David Pocock. You have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Uh, as has been pointed out, Australians love their sport. And uh, climate change is threatening our way of life here in Australia and is affecting sports. This is happening now. Sport is already feeling the effects of climate change. I think it's really important to remember that in the context of this debate. We're seeing sporting clubs not being able to ensure, ensure against uh, bushfire, against um, flood damage, and uh, pitches being too hard to be played on in, in, during droughts. This is having an effect already. We hear the arguments for fossil fuel sponsorship in sport. You do need sponsors in sport. That's, that's, that's clear in professional sport. Community sports often rely on it too. Uh, but fossil fuel companies represent only 3.5 per cent of sport and business partnerships. So this is not an insurmountable challenge. And clearly a lot of sports are working on this. Uh, it's curious that many of these fossil fuel companies do not sell a product to consumers. So I think clearly this is about social license. And I think that's the concern of athletes who have been raising concerns about them being used to extend the social license of an industry which has many of those companies have no plans of, of winding down and transitioning. That's, that's the concern. We're not saying turn off the, the tap on fossil fuels today. We're saying we need to be part of a transition and many of these companies uh, who sponsor sport don't have a, a, um, a plan. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm out of time, but I do want to point out this is the first time the Greens have met, mentioned fossil fuels uh, sponsorship in sport, and this is not adequate time to debate something like this before putting it to a vote to the Senate. This warrants much more debate, and I am disappointed that we're going to hear a minute or two from senators Thank and then a vote very much, Senator on this. Uh, my your point. time has expired. Senator Canavan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Well, uh, the, the reserves of hypocrisy within the Australian Greens Party know no bounds. And uh, as I often comment, if only we could capture uh, their hypocrisy and, and convert it into electricity, it would be the ultimate source of renewable power. It is infinite in its supply. Because here we have a motion from the Greens saying they don't want, they don't want any money from fossil fuels to fund uh, sports in this, Australia, in, in this country, in Australia. OK, OK. Every election that I've known in my time in this place, every election, the Greens policy platform, which can't even be calculated on modern computers according to the former Treasury Secretary Ken Henry, the Greens policy platform uh, is funded by extra taxes on fossil fuels. <laughs> the only way they get to pay uh, for their political promises is from the funds of the coal and gas industries. If there weren't coal mines and gas fields in this Australia, the, the Greens would have massive, massive black holes for their, for their crazy plans for high-speed rail across all around the country, uh, uh, for, uh, for their, their plans to give health care to everybody, no matter what the cost that we can't afford. All of those plans that the Greens want to do, they, some of them are good things. I'd love to give health care to everybody. But all of them in the Greens policy platforms are funded by fossil fuels. So here we have a motion here today where the Greens are trying to deny to other people, to Australian sports, who, who struggle, a lot of sporting codes in Australia struggle, to make ends meet, you know, the high-profile ones do all right, but netball is, has been struggling. They're trying to deny them access to the funds of fossil fuels, but not to themselves. I mean, if it weren't for fossil fuels, if we were serious about this motion, how would we fund our hospitals? 
because most of that is coming from our coal and gas industries. We just had a budget that was handed down where a $50 billion increase—not not the total amount, but a $50 billion increase—came from higher coal and gas prices. We fund our public services in this country thanks to these large export industries. Coal is our biggest export. Gas is our third biggest export. Two together are 40 per cent of our nation's commodity exports. If we didn't have them, we wouldn't be able to fund ourselves, and certainly the Greens wouldn't be able to fund themselves without fossil fuels. Thank you, Senator. Senator Faruqi, you have the call. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. Digging up and burning fossil fuels is destroying our climate and our environment. A recent report from Swinburne Uni is the first to quantify the number and value of coal, gas and oil sponsorships in Australian sport. And it's not a small number. They spend 14 to $18 million each year sponsoring 24 high-profile leagues and sports in Australia. Santos, Alinta, BHP and Woodside are all major sponsors. So why do they do it? Because as the climate crisis intensifies, more and more people are aware that it is greedy, morally bankrupt fossil fuel companies that are fueling this crisis. More people than ever can see the connection between the greed of fossil fuel corporations and the disastrous climate emergencies we see here and around the world. These fossil fuel corporations know that their social license is fast evaporating and so they are scrambling to greenwash their environmental reputations by throwing money at high-profile, much-loved sporting leagues and teams. I came here from Pakistan passionate about netball and cricket and soccer, and that passion has only grown while I've been here. Fossil fuel companies know that people here love sport. They know that when sports embrace their sponsorship and when athletes wear their names and their logos, that helps to normalize their existence and sanitize their reputation because of the community's love for sport. It is a tactic that's straight out of the playbook of other big, cashed-up, unscrupulous industries such as the tobacco and gambling industries. Years of sponsorship of sporting teams, arts festivals and other community events positions companies as good corporate citizens and locks in dependence on corporate goodwill. But we must not accept that. We must not allow dirty, polluting fossil fuel companies to use sport to try and prolong their sorry existence while killing the planet. And just as we know fossil fuel sponsorships of sport needs to be banned, fossil fuel sponsorship of politicians needs to be banned. Both Labour and Coalition are on a unity ticket when it comes to accepting dirty donations from fossil fuel companies. This place is crawling with fossil fuel lobbies as a result. And sadly, big events in this place, like the Midwinter Ball, are sponsored by fossil fuel companies. It's no wonder that neither major party will call for an end to coal and gas, despite the overwhelming evidence that this is what we must do as a matter of climate science and as a matter of global justice. It takes courage to take a stand against powerful fossil fuel corporations. The major, major parties don't have that courage, but athletes, activists, and sovereign owners do. And I want to pay tribute to the brave athletes, especially in netball, cricket, and AFL, who are speaking up and refusing fossil fuel sponsorships. Solidarity, in particular, with Diamonds player and Nunga woman, Donnell Wallum, for her immense courage, and kudos to her team for backing her. They are speaking out about their values. They are reflecting the values of their communities and their fans. This is the type of courage that gives me hope for the future. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. The Australian netball team rejected an offer of sponsorship from Gina Reinhart's Hancock Prospecting because they refused to wear the Hancock Prospecting logo. So who is the company our netball has rejected? Hancock Prospecting grew into one of Australia's largest companies on the strengths of their Roy Hill iron ore mine. Iron ore is still their largest product. Hancock, Hancock mines coal as well. Since the Greens seem to be ignorant of metallurgy, let me educate you lot. The only way to make steel is using coal to heat iron ore. The Greens do talk about green steel as an alternative. It's not. Green steel is so brittle, it's unusable. There's no realistic chance of green steel ever being used to replace coal-fired steel. Green steel does have a role as a photo opportunity, 
to, uh, to sustain the green steel lie designed to destroy the coal and steel industries for whatever fanciful reason the Greens advocate. Australian netball has rejected steel. Senator McKim's motion is rejecting steel. I hope all those who feel as Senator McKim does go home tonight and rip out their steel stoves, turn off their, their steel fridges, throw away their steel microwaves, their cutlery, their knives, their saucepans and well, you get the idea. How will Senator McKim and his steel haters get home? Not in a car or even an electric vehicle. Those are made from steel and other products made with coal and hydrocarbon fuels. These other products include aluminium, glass, fiberglass and plastics. Not in a train or bus or cycle or scooter. More steel, more oil. Walking home is, of course, an option. Just avoid steel, tap, steel cap work boots or any boots made with steel tools. The hypocrisy in this motion is breathtaking. Hancock Prospecting enjoys strong relations with the local Aboriginal communities who benefited over the last seven years from Thank mining you, royalties senators. totaling $300 million. Order. We have one flag, we are one community, Order. we are one nation, coal-powered coal and steel-built thanks to miners. When the chamber shows some respect, I'll call the next senator. Up until the last speaker, there was respect shown to other speakers, and I ask and remind senators to uh, listen in silence. Senator Cox, you have the call. Thank you, Acting uh, uh, Madam Deputy President. Uh, advertisements intend to build positive attitudes, emotion and connection with products and with companies. Corporations seek out sponsorship opportunities of, as forms of their marketing campaigns, and unfortunately, fossil fuel companies are no different. And as the Australian Green spokesperson on resources, a proud West Australian and a long-suffering Fremantle Dockers fan, it pains me about how these worlds actually collide. Woodside Energy's merger with BHP's oil and gas assets makes it one of the ten biggest independent energy production companies in the world. Its 9.1 million tonnes of greenhouse gas emissions makes it the ninth highest emitter in Australia in the year 2021. The Fremantle Dockers have had a very long relationship with Woodside Energy, and in fact, Woodside Energy has been the major sponsor of the Dockers since 2010. And they signed on to support the Dockers AFLW team in 2017. This sponsorship deal was renewed last year in October and is worth approximately $2 million. I'm not the only purple scarf wearer who doesn't want Woodside's climate wrecking hands all over my footy team. The former Dockers player, my brother Dale Kickett, and former manager Jared McNeil stood alongside former Premier Carmen Lawrence, award-winning author Tim Winton, Nobel Prize winner uh, climate scientist Bill Hare, and former climate change adviser to Woodside, in fact, um, Alex Hillman, at a press conference last month to call for an end to Woodside sponsorship for our beloved club. Because fossil fuels have absolutely no place in sport while this climate is in crisis. And I echo the high profile Australians who do not want the Dockers' good name to be used by a corporation to enhance their reputation when its massive profit making activities are, in fact, threatening our environment and our health and our cultural heritage. Players, members and supporters are speaking out because that's what they actually care about. They care about the planet. They don't want athletes branded with fossil fuel logos, again, granting social licence to operate in our communities. State capture is in fact real, and both of my colleagues, Senator Thorpe and Senator Furuki, have outlined this. And when Rio Tinto actually blew up the Jukun case, they actually lost their sponsorship deal with the AFL, and this actually shows that it's not about commercial risk and it's not about the money. There are other notable athletes that have in fact spoken out about the injustices about sports sponsorship, and they have also been named by my colleagues. The Australian Test and One Day International Captain Pat Cummings recently urged Cricket Australia to look after or look for other ethical sponsors. Proud Noongar woman sister uh, Danelle Wallam challenged Netball Australia about their multi-million dollar contract with Hand Hancock Prospecting because of racism, not because of the history of the company and what they think they've done for black people in this country, because of the racism that exists. And that is history. She won and she made a spectacular debut days later, and I thank them for their leadership. And I ask those in this place to follow their lead. 
We can't continue to tackle the climate crisis if we are opening up new coal and gas projects, and there are currently 114 of those new coal and gas projects in the investment pipeline. If fossil fuel companies won't back off and put our health, the health of our children and the health of our environment before their profits, their power and their influence, as we, then as we and the parliament need to intervene the same way we did with big tobacco, stopping them from plastering their toxic brands everywhere they please. We are out of time, and the CSIRO State of Climate report released today tells us that Australia's climate has warmed by an average of 1.47 degrees since the national records began. The Paris Agreement requires us to keep that temperature below 1.5 degrees, and we are already heading to the point of no return. If you don't believe in doing everything that it takes to secure a future for our children on this planet, then you, in fact, don't deserve a, a seat in this place. Opening up new coal and gas projects will blow Labor's already uh, emissions reduction target that they've agreed to legislate in this place, and opening up Woodside Scarborough project in particular alone will blow these targets. We need a moratorium on new coal and gas, and we need to ban fossil fuel sponsorships for sporting teams, organisations and events. It's time to stop the greenwashing of fossil fuel companies who are misleading the Australian public about their climate credentials. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Thorpe on behalf of Senator McKim be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those are against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. You're calling for a division? I only heard one voice. I'll put the, I'll put the motion again. Those of that opinion uh, say aye. Those who are opposed say no. no. The ayes have it. No, uh, calling for a division. Yep. Uh, division is required. Ring the bells for four minutes, please.
lock the doors. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Thorpe on behalf of Senator McKim be agreed to. Those who uh, say aye, have, will you please move to the right? And those who are against nays, move to the left of the chairs. And I support uh, Senator Scar and Senator McKim. There have been 12 ayes and 28 noes. The, it has been resolved in the negative. Thank you. Senators who are leaving the chamber, do so quietly, please. Senator Urquhart, you have the call. Madam Deputy President, um, the previous matter of urgency in the name of Senator Chandler, it was called for the ayes. I incorrectly advised my deputy whip to call a division, and that was incorrect. That's why the division was cancelled. Senator Scar. Uh, we've had the explanation. There's no point of. Well, I had actually given Senator Scar the call before you. So, Senator Scar. Uh, perhaps, um, Madam Acting Deputy President, if if we could ask for some clarification, with I understand Senator Urquhart's explanation with respect to cancellation of the division, but the Hansard record will say that there were no's stated in the chamber before the division was called, those no's did come from the government benches. So I think uh, it would be useful to know if the clarification is those no's were unintended or were they intended? Senator Yang. Hanson Young, do you want to restate your point of order? Thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I too would like clarification as to who the no's voiced in the chamber were or indeed what the government's position is. Senator Urquhart, I'll give you the opportunity if you feel you need to clarify the position. I've actually outlined that I, call, I gave the wrong advice to the Deputy Whip in terms of the um, position of calling the division, and I've clarified the incorrectness of my decision. Senator Scar. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. For the record, then, can I just uh, make it clear that there were no no's coming from the opposition benches? Thank you. 
Senator Hanson Young. Thank, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I'd also like to make it clear there were no no's coming from the Greens benches in relation to that motion. Thank you. Uh, we shall now move on to the consideration of documents on page four of the order of business today. Sen are you re Senator Hanson Young, are you raising a point of order? No, I'm seeking leave to uh, table a non conforming petition, uh, which needs to be done before you do go on to that bit. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, thank you. I seek leave to table a non conforming petition regarding the destruction of the Gellerup Wildlife Corridor in WA, which has received 25,028 signatures. It's a big petition. Uh, thankful to all of the volunteers working on that campaign, and I understand that the whips have agreed uh, to give leave for me to table it. Leave has been granted. Position. The petition. Senator Urquhart. Uh, thank you, um, President. For the, for the sake of the um, confidence in the chamber, uh, I will declare that there were no no's in the chamber from the Labor Party. Thank you, Senator Urquhart. We will now move on to the consideration of documents, and these documents are listed on page four of today's order of business. Number one, is there any any speakers for document number one? Any speakers for document two? Any speakers for document three? Four? Family law. Senator, you have the call. I move that the Senate take note on uh, document four and seek leave to continue my remarks. Thank you, Senator. Sen okay. Senator, we will now then move on to item number five. And Senator Bragg, I think you want to speak on this document. Are you sure? Okay. Yes, you can. Thank you very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to take note of this uh, important document in relation to the government co-contribution of low-income earners, which of course is uh, one of the various superannuation programs that the Commonwealth government runs. Now, it is very important to note uh, in relation to this matter that there has been a significant debate in this chamber and beyond this parliament about the government's approach to the matter of superannuation transparency. And one of the first acts of this government in this space was in relation to the stripping of transparency measures that were put in place in the last parliament, which required the disclosure of payments from superannuation funds to unions. Now, Mr Jones, Minister Jones in the other place, decided that was his number one priority to strip transparency so that workers could no longer see how much money their super fund was paying to a union. Really shameful stuff. Now, after a debate in this place where Senator Pocock moved a disallowance and there was extensive discussion about why on earth this was the priority of the government, I now note that there are additional disallowances that have appeared on the papers, including one from Senator McKim, and I think that is an important development. And that also reminds me of the reporting in today's newspaper about the prospect of improving the transparency arrangements in this area across the board, because I think everyone wants to see the compulsory savings scheme being the most transparent of, of any government program, because we are in fact going into people's pay packets and taking 10.5 per cent of their money and sending it off to someone else to manage. So the idea that we are not going to allow transparency is fundamentally flawed. And that's why I welcome the proposed disallowance from Senator McKim and the other initiatives that have been engaged in this space, because we want to see complete transparency. Whether the funds are being run by a financial services business, be it an insurance company or a bank, or whether they are being run by an employer group or a trade union or a collective. The idea that the workers and the members are prohibited from seeing when their money is being sent off to a related party 
is fundamentally flawed and cannot stand. Now, the last time we considered this matter in this chamber, the disallowance was defeated, and we now have a situation where funds have been able to table their member statements without the transparency which appeared in our regulations from government. So, in the case of Australian Super, which is one of the household names, they are now able to conceal $100 million in related party transactions. And in addition to that, they are able to, able to hide $1 million in payments to unions. We don't know which unions those funds are being paid to. And you can now see, as a result of this change being made by Mr. Jones, Minister Jones, you can now receive more transparent information about the whereabouts of superannuation contributions from the AEC website than you can from the member statement. Now, the last time I looked, there weren't too many members of superannuation funds trawling through the paper records of the Electoral Commission to work out where their money has been paid to a union. So the whole point of the member statements was to make it digestible so that a person could see, OK, this fund that I'm a member of is paying $100,000 to Union A, uh, or this fund that I'm a member of is paying $500 to financial services company related party B. Now, that principle has been removed from these regulations, but I'm now much more confident than I was a month ago that we will be returning transparency for these members who should be able to see exactly where their money is being paid. So I look forward to seeing that and I uh, thank the Senate for the opportunity to make these remarks in relation to this report. Are you, Senator, seeking leave to continue your remarks? How did you know I am? Thank you, Senator. Is there any speakers on item six? No, if not, we, we, shall, uh, we shall move forward to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Uh, I call Senator White. I present delegated legislation Monitor 8 of 2022 of the Standing Committee of the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation together with ministerial correspondence relating to the report, and I move that the Senate take note of the report. I also rise to speak to the tabling of the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Delegated Legislation's Delegated Legislation Monitor 8 of 2022. This monitor details matters relating uh, to the committee's scrutiny of 77 disallowable legislative instruments and nine instruments exempt from disallowance. It also details the committee's ongoing consideration of instruments registered in the previous periods and concludes its engagement with the relevant ministry in relation to three instruments. In tabling the monitor, I draw the Chamber's attention to the committee's long-standing concern about exemptions from parliamentary oversight in delegated legislation. The committee has consistently raised scrutiny concerns about the exemption of delegated legislation from disallowance and its impact on parliamentary oversight, including holding an inquiry into the issue in the last parliament. It has been particularly concerned with instruments exempt from disallowance under the Biosecurity Act 2015, uh, known as the Biosecurity Act, including those made in a response to COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic. I note the Senate Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills has raised similar concerns in its reports. The Biosecurity Amendment Strengthening Biosecurity Bill 2022 was introduced into the Senate on 28 September 2022. This bill amends the Biosecurity Act, including to introduce three new provisions which are exempt from disallowance, some of which may trespass on personal rights and liberties. When this bill was introduced in the Senate, the committee wrote to the Minister for Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry and the Minister for Health and Aged Care requesting that they move amendments to remove all of the exemptions from disallowance in the Biosecurity Act to facilitate appropriate parliamentary scrutiny over these matters. Unfortunately, both ministers advised that they would not pro progress amendments to remove the exemptions. Disallowance is the most important tool that the parliament has at its disposal to maintain control of delegated legislation. The committee appreciates that during an emergency it is necessary for governments to take urgent and decisive action. However, parliament must have effective oversight of these decisions. The committee has considered this issue since the start of the pandemic 
pandemic and particularly as part of its inquiry into the exemption of delegated legislation from parliamentary oversight. It has found that delegated legislation, including emergency-related delegated legislation, should not be exempt from disallowance except in exceptional circumstances. In coming to this conclusion, the committee has carefully considered the arguments justifying what it is why it is appropriate for instruments made under the Biosecurity Act to remain exempt from disallowance. The common justifications for these exemptions were the need to act urgently, to avoid uncertainty, that the instruments were solely scientific or technical, and that the disallowance would put at human risk, health or undermine Australia's agriculture sector. The committee does not accept these justifications for exemptions from disallowance. The disallowance process does not in inhibit the immediate commencement of instruments and does not invalidate actions taken under instruments prior to disallowance. Therefore, potential disallowance would not prevent the government from taking critical or emergency action to respond to biosecurity risks and threats. Further, the committee does not accept the argument that the measures in delegated legislation are so scientific or technical that parliament should not have oversight over the measures being introduced. Lastly, instances where an instrument is disallowed by the Senate are rare and only occur after careful consideration, but nevertheless a crucial check on executive power. The risk that a law will be repealed is sim simply the risk associated with the system of democratic lawmaking established by the Constitution. Moreover, such justifications are framed by a pejorative view of the parliamentary process, which assumes that parliamentary lawmaking is necessarily less rational than executive lawmaking. The disallowance process is intended to facilitate appropriate debate and scrutiny of the use of emergency powers to help ensure such powers are not misused. For this reason, the committee asks the ministers to reconsider their decision not to progress amendments to remove the exemptions from disallowance and the Biosecurity Act. Taking this action would address the long-standing significant scrutiny concern held by the committee and the scrutiny of bills committee. With these comments, I commend the committee's delegated legislation, Monitor Number Eight of 2022. Yes, I think there's. Are you speaking on the same subject? No. Uh, does the Take note, yeah. The question is that the Senate take note. All of that opinion aye. say aye. All those say no. The ayes have it. Thank you. Senator. I present uh, on behalf of Dean Senator Dean Smith the Scrutiny Digest 7 of 2022 Standing Committee for the Scrutiny of Bills and move that the Senate take note of the report. Seek leave to continue. Uh, I'll put that. All of that opinion say aye. Oh. Do you need to have leave? You sought leave and then his table of that. So those of that opinion say aye. Those again say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Any further? If not, we'll move to are there any ministerial statements? No ministerial statements. Good. There is. Senator Brown. Oh, oh sorry. Moving on to committee membership. The President has received letters requesting changes to the membership of committees. Minister Brown. I seek leave to move a motion to vary the membership of committees. Is leave granted? I move that Senators. Oh, sorry. Yeah, leave has been granted. Okay. I move that uh, Senators be discharged from and appointed to committees as set out in the document available in the Chamber and listed on the dynamic red. Thank you. Any questions that motion be agreed to? Yeah, no, well, that's all there. Uh, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Now we're doing uh, messages. The President has received messages from the House of Representatives informing the Senate that the House has agreed to the amendments made by the Senate to the following bills. Emergency Response Fund Amendment, Disaster Ready Fund Bill 2022 and Family Assistant Legislation Amendment, Cheaper Child Care Bill 2022. Can we get that? Yes, Clark. 
Government Business Order of the Day number two, High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022, second reading debate. Thank you. Uh, Senator Davey. Yes, thank you. I was in continuation before we got rudely interrupted by um, hard markers, which are an essential part of business in this place. Um, so I just to wrap up my remarks, before, before I was interrupted by the hard marker, I was waxing lyrical about the utopian nature of high-speed rail in this country. Um, I'd mentioned how many attempts we've had at setting up high-speed rail agencies, um, doing investigations, doing desktop audits, looking at maps um, on tabletops and considering high-speed rail um, around the world and what could and could not work for Australia. And we continue to come up against the fact we've got a huge continent and a sparse population. We all agree that we need high-speed rail. We all agree that high-speed rail would be a very good thing for passengers, for freight, for the environment, as we heard from the Greens in their contribution. Um, uh, so we all agree it's a great thing. What we don't agree on is how to go about it. And I just implore the government, instead of renaming another agency, instead of shuffling papers and bums on seats, actually look at the work that has been done. Look at the work that our government initiated with the Newcastle to Sydney faster rail upgrades. Take that work and let's see something come to fruition instead of starting all over again and reinventing the wheel, because if it's not utopia, it's Groundhog Day. And quite frankly, uh, I, for one, am, am well and truly over it and would just like to see movement at the station. Pardon the pun. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022, or as I prefer to call it, the Elect Chris Minns as New South Wales Premier Bill. It's not a coincidence that this bill provides for the National High Speed Rail Network proposal to start with just one section between Sydney and Newcastle, just in time for the New South Wales state election in the coming March. Oh, the photo opportunities. The announcements, I can see them now. For example, vote Labor and we will get you to work in 40 minutes. What dishonesty, what treachery. I appreciate that the Central Coast and Hunter are now dormitory suburbs of Sydney. Every day, more than 100,000 residents use rail and road on their daily trek to Sydney for work, every day. High-speed rail would be a wonderful way to make that trip. The only problem with making that promise is that high-speed rail on that route is never going to happen. It's impossible. And here's why. The route consists of mountain ranges, massive sandstone cliffs and waterways. Unless the High Speed Authority sprinkles magic dust, there's no way it will make a straight, flat track with the solid foundations necessary to sustain high-speed rail through the Hawkesbury, Central Coast and Lower Hunter. The current discussion involves sending high-speed rail along the existing alignment through the central coast, along the Gosford waterfront, through residential areas to Wyong, then via Waiye into the Lower Hunter. The area's geography makes any other route almost impossible, at least without substantial environmental impact, meaning massive, long tunnels and cuttings through three national parks and equally long and heavy, heavily engineered bridges across the frequent waterways and soft ground. Anything can be done at a cost, although the cost here will ensure a white elephant for taxpayers that will never recover the investment. I shudder to think how much the tickets will cost, certainly more than the working families could afford, the families who are being targeted with this false, deceptive promise. While Australia does need a modern rail network connecting our capital cities, airports and major ports, high-speed rail is not the answer. The federal government last examined the possibility of building a 1,748-kilometre high-speed rail link from Brisbane to Melbourne in 2013. 
when the cost was estimated at $114 billion, with the Sydney to Newcastle section costed at $17.9 billion. Sydney to Newcastle costed at $17.9 billion. At that time, by the way, the inland rail was costed at $4 billion. It's now $20 billion, five times higher. So I would expect this same inaccuracy factor would apply to the fast rail, cost, costing out this Sydney to Hunter section alone at $90 billion in today's dollars. $90 billion. The Grattan Institute has found high-speed rail projects have little chance of passing cost-benefit tests based on the typical discount rate used for transport infrastructure of about 7 per cent. Marion Terrell, current director of the Grattan Institute's Transport and Cities program, has said that Australia is not suited to high-speed rail because its cities are too small and too far apart. Too small means the passenger volume will not be sufficient to justify the capital expenditure, leading to prohibitive fares or massive government subsidies, or most likely both. To illustrate this point, when New South Wales XPT trains were purchased in 1982, the intention was to create fast rail in New South Wales. The XPTs are designed to travel at just 150 kilometres per hour. So what stopped fast rail at that time was the inability to build out a track capable of supporting those speeds. This is essential for safety and reliability. Our rail lines curve around too much. The Great Dividing Range provides serious hurdles to fast rail, and our waterways along the coast complicate the flat sections that we do have. For clarity, fast rail is generally speeds up to 150 kilometres per hour. High speed rail is 250 kilometres per hour to 300 kilometres per hour. Fast rail requires entirely different and substantially more expensive rolling stock and track. Now, it may be feasible with a large government investment to upgrade existing rail lines on the Sydney to Hunter route to travel express services at fast rail pace rather than high speed rail pace. One Nation would strongly support immediate feasibility studies on upgrading the Sydney Hunter line to fast rail since New South Wales already has the rolling stock. Senator Mackenzie has moved an amendment to this bill which introduces Productivity Commission oversight of proposals and a transparent reporting system. If this amendment is passed, then this bill gains the checks and balances it should have had all along and One Nation will be in support. Without those checks and balances, One Nation will oppose this bill. We have one flag, we are one community, we are One Nation, and we don't lie for any reason and certainly not to the public to get votes. Thank you, uh, Senator Roberts. I call uh, Minister Brown. Uh, thank you, um, Acting Deputy President. I'd like to um, first by, um, start by thanking all senators for their contributions to the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022 and acknowledge Senator Mackenzie, Rice, Davey and Roberts for their contributions to the debate here in the Senate. The bill before us will establish the High Speed Rail Authority to develop, advise on and plan for high speed rail system in Australia. It will deliver on our election commitment and will plan for high speed rail along Australia's east coast from Melbourne to Brisbane. Fast rail connections between Sydney, the Central Coast and Newcastle will be progressed as the first priority and $500 million will be allocated to start the necessary corridor acquisition planning and early works. I also note that Senator Mackenzie's remarks regarding the need to ensure regional communities are consulted on the planning and the development of the high-speed rail network, and I can assure the Senate that unlike the National Party's delivery of inland, inland rail, the government will undertake extensive consultations with affected communities regarding the design and delivery of the high-speed rail network. In relation to the amendments proposed by Senator Mackenzie, I can advise that while we appreciate the contribution by the opposition to this debate, respectfully, we will not be supporting their amendments. 
I will speak to this more in the detail during um, de more detail during consideration. However, in terms of transparency measures, there are other processes now through both annual reports and corporate plans that provide the opportunity for the progress reporting to take place. And in relation to the board, we are seeking to establish a skills-based board, and the minister has advised in the other place that it would be uh, great for regional Australians to be members of the board. However, as it is such a complex project, we can't have a quota system, which is what the Nationals are now proposing in this amendment. And I, note, I note that this is not something Order. that the National Party supports Order. in other areas, such as the representation of women in parliament, in the coalition. I also acknowledge Senator Rice's sentiments regarding ensuring the delivery and financing the high-speed rail network stays in public hands. The government's position is that the consideration of the funding, financing, construction and operation of the high-speed rail network are not matters for this legislation to determine, but should be considered as part of the high-speed rail authority's planning work once established. I also note Senator Davies' comments around the distinction between faster and high-speed high rail. And to clarify that, faster and fast rail refers to trains that can operate at up to 250 kilometres per hour, and high-speed rail refers to services capable of travelling at speeds in excess of 250 kilometres per hour. I also note Senator Roberts' contribution to the bill's debate. I note also that uh, Senator Pol Pocock and his office have engaged constructively with the minister and her office in re recent days, and I would thank, them, uh, thank him for his engagement. And I understand that the senator has proposed a number of amendments that I can advise that the government will be supporting. These amendments relate to ensuring that appointments to the board of the High Speed Rail Authority and the position of CEO are the result of merit-based process, as well as amendment con concerning the disclosure of interests of board members to the minister in accordance with the Public Governance Performance and Accountability Act 2013. The minister has already made clear in the other place that the board of the High Speed Rail Authority has to be skills-based board and is absolutely the determination of the government to appoint people based on merit. It is important for us to note the approach of the former government, who stacked their boards with Liberal and National mates, and this coalition uh, government was focused more on jobs for the boys than delivering for the community. We all know, we all know that that what they did with the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and the Infrastructure Australia board. I would like to uh, conclude my remarks again by thanking all senators for their contributions today and uh, say to the Senate that high speed rail opens up many choices and without it you have, you have to live closer to where you work or lose time with your family stuck in traffic. With it, you have more choice. You can move out of the city, taking pressure off out, out of suburbs and into a regional area with all the benefits that that brings and still have more time with your family. And who wouldn't want that? Without high speed rail, it's not only the connection to work that is more difficult, but the connection to your wider family and friends. With high speed rail, catching up more often becomes more possible. High speed rail can get you between cities faster and rail can take you right into, right into a city centre. You can leave your car, you can leave your car, taxi and ride share behind knowing that in the process you are, you are doing more to help lower the carbon in the atmosphere. It's not, a, it's not only an easy, easy people mover, but it's also a job creator too and an industry builder. We, we want our regions to grow and pro prosper. We want the economy to be stronger and deliver benefits right across the country, not just the city centres. We want public transport to be part of the green economy. I commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, thank you, Minister.
the question is that this bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to establish the High Speed Rail Authority <clears throat> and for related purposes. Uh, as uh, amendments have been circulated, the Senate will now uh, resolve into committee. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Senator Mackenzie. Minister for assisting. Uh, and I would appreciate the assistance of the chamber. It's been a while. Um, <laughs> so I seek leave to move um, um, opposition amendments um, on sheet 1679, 1 to 5, by leave together. Uh, is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move the amendment standing in my name. I'd like to talk to those amendments now. <laughs> Senator, <laughs> we'll, we'll, get, okay. we'll get through this together, Senator Mackenzie. Yes. Senator Mackenzie, you have the call. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair, and thank uh, the Senate for its indulgence and sympathy. Um, I move these amendments um, with great pride. And I, whilst I note the Assistant Minister's uh, second reading speech and thank her for the gracious way she and the government have listened to the contributions of senators on this particular bill and uh, recognised our particular concerns with the bill and uh, obviously some of the things that we like about the bill. What I am concerned about is her dismissal, though, and somehow um, assumption that those from rural and regional Australia don't have the requisite merit or experience or, might I say, intelligence to actually serve on a board uh, and an authority such as this. Um, Minister, I completely reject the fact that the National Party is seeking to insert quotas per se onto um, the membership of this board. It is absolutely not uh, our public policy to be supporting quotas. We seek uh, merit-based appointments uh, always, but we probably cast the net a little wider than uh, the Labor Party traditionally would in, in what that meritorious appointments might look like. And we've learnt by hard experience that without someone around the table that has the lived experience of um, working, living, growing up, seeing a positive future for rural and regional communities, um, that that perspective is often not taken into account. And given that the Labor Party's specific um, focus for this authority uh, is in regional New South Wales, I would suggest it will actually help the authority uh, to do very, very good work on behalf of the government to have somebody from rural and regional Australia um, around the table. Similarly, uh, incredibly disappointed the government won't be supporting our very sound, sensible uh, amendment, particularly again when it comes to ensuring that the authority will consult with local communities. And despite your attempts at cheap political points, Assistant Minister, uh, with respect to previous governments and consultation, no one gets a gold star when it comes to consulting adequately with rural and regional communities, and we can always do things better. And I would hope, um, in my time in this place, and you've been in this place for quite a while as well, um, that we have seen processes improve over time, and it should be particularly in this portfolio area the case. 
because the minister that announces the project is very rarely the minister that cuts the ribbon on the project. These are long-term commitments, and it's very, very often the case in this pipeline of infrastructure build for our country um, that previous governments accept and continue the work uh, of the, the governments that have, uh, the current governments do that commit to projects um, of the previous government, because the level of planning, the level of design, the tender processing, um, the arrangements that have to be set up with local and state governments are long, they're arduous, the negotiated outcomes often, um, a lot of time, a lot of effort and a lot of money are put into them, and so respect for previous decisions uh, need to be um, underpinned. The other Aspects of our am uh, amendments that I'd like to go to are actually increasing the accountability and transparency, something this government made a big song and dance about in coming to power. And yet, when we put sensible amendments in front of them, when the Greens put sensible amendments in front of them, when Senator Pocock puts sensible amendments in front of them to increase the transparency, accountability, the reporting mechanisms for not just the Senate, but indeed the Australian taxpayer around these arrangements, you, you think you guys have got it all sorted out. Well, it turns out you don't, and the suburban rail loop in Melbourne is a classic case in point, where you've turned your back absolutely on your own stated objectives that you would only fund projects that use the Infrastructure Australia methodology and within five months, you'd broken your own promise to yourselves, let alone broken a promise to the Australian people. So far be it from me in the opposition um, to be the only one around this chamber uh, suggesting that you might need a little help with increasing transparency and accountability in these spaces, but it is other political parties, other senators who want to assist you be your best selves within government, and uh, I think that's a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, they describe our amendments, Madam Chair, but I also have some questions that I'd like um, the minister to go to. Um, so, Minister, in my second reading speech, I actually went to the explanatory memorandum for this bill, uh, where it explains this bill has no financial impact uh, on the budget bottom line, uh, can you confirm the explanatory memorandum's statement to that effect? Uh, thank you, Senator Mackenzie. The minister. Uh, thank you. First of all, um, I do wish to first deal with your uh, comments around uh, the government's view of community members, of course, of which I reject your remarks absolutely and take it as a political point scoring by the opposition that could be not couldn't be further from the truth and I will go through um, just through the amendments as you've already indicated um, the five amendments that you'll put forward and I just want to go step through the reasons why the government uh, will not be supporting these amendments. Uh, and then I'll go to the question that you've um, placed before me. Uh, so, in uh, your first amendment, uh, we, the government um, believes that this is an unnecessary amendment, that the leg legislation already states that the authority will be consulting and liaising and negotiating with uh, states and territory and other re relevant parties, and it is inherent, it is inherent that the community will be a core part of the work of the High Speed Rail Authority. And as I go to Amendment 2, uh, the Infrastructure Australia already evaluates business cases for transport infrastructure projects with an Australian government funding contribution of $250 million or more. In addition, business case evaluation reports are publicly rele released by uh, Infrastructure Australia. I move through to um, Amendment 3. Um, the board, we again, the government will be opposing this amendment. The board 
will consist of five members who will be appointed based on the appropriate skills mix. And it may well be, Senator McKenzie, um, that the board members um, have experience in regional Australia or may be from regional Australia. But the prime um, view of the government is that they have to have the appropriate set of skills to be on the board. Um, Amendment 4, we will be opposing. Uh, information on the progress of the High Speed Rail Authority will be publicly available via its annual report and corporation plan. And your last amendment, Amendment 5, the, we will also be opposing as information on the progress, as I said, of the High Speed Rail Authority will be publicly available um, by um, through its annual report and the corporate plan. Now, the other question that you put to me, I'll just take some advice. The, uh, so, going to um, your question, the cost of establishing the High Speed Rail Authority will be offset by existing funding set aside for the National Faster Rail Agency. Senator Cadell. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Uh, with High Speed Rail, the first $500 million investment was for uh, going from Sydney to my packet the woods in the Hunter, is there a break up how much that $500 million is between planning and acquisition of, of line rails? The minister. Um, that inf information isn't available. That's what the authority will be in place to do. It will be, um, uh, it's, will be their job to ensure um, that progress will be made and their immediate priority of any updated analysis um, will be their first um, priority of work. Senator Cadell. Uh, Minister, do we have a timetable for when that break-up might be available? Is it in 12 months, 24 months? Do we know when that work will be done? As I've said, once the authority is established, we, work will begin on the planning and the overseeing on the construction of a reliable, safe and efficient high-speed rail network. And, um, as soon as we can get this, um, if this bill into place and, and the authority established, um, the, the sooner the better, as this is going to be a huge opportunity for Australia. And I know that the uh, opposition uh, is supportive of the bill and the opportunities that high-speed rail will bring. Senator Cadell. Um, it now takes longer to go from uh, Broadmeadow Station in the Hunter to Sydney than it did in the 1950s under the Newcastle Flyer. If we haven't got a timetable for when uh, the planning will be finished, do we have a timetable for when the line may be finished? Even a decade would do. The Minister. Uh, no, I can't give you that information here today, Senator Condell. Senator McKenzie. Uh, Minister, just following up on Senator Cattell's question, um, in the budget you've put down half a billion dollars for this agency. You can't tell us when it's starting. You can't tell us if it'll even be laying a track in the next decade, and yet your government put $2.2 billion on the table in the budget for an uncosted project for Daniel Andrews, who's heading to the polls on Saturday. $2.2 billion. How much, how, when will that project be laying a track in Victoria, the $2.2 billion that you've actually committed to rail in your budget? Um, Senator McKenzie, before I uh, give the call to the minister, I'll just ask you to use the Premier's um, oh. appropriate title if, if this is and a line you're wishing to continue. Title that don't. we don't use in Victoria, <laughs> Premier Andrews. The minister. Well, first of all, I'll just say the, the government has committed $500 million for um, corridor acquisition and the, has committed $500 million to securing the Sydney to Newcastle corridor of high-speed rail network as the key first stage. And I think everyone knows 
what the, uh, the $500 million is seeking to do. That, that funding includes funding to start corridor acquisitions, planning and early works, and includes working closely with the New South Wales government. The High-Speed high Rail Authority will work collaboratively with the Australian government and the New South Wales government to be, determine the best way to deliver this project. Before allocating funding, the, funding, the government will, will consider advice from the authority. That is the situation, and it's not uh, unusual. Um, so um, I think I've been very clear. The bill is a very simple bill. It is also very clear, and I uh, commend the bill to the Senate. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you. Um, Minister, Assistant Minister, in the explanatory memorandum, uh, it said the bill will have no financial impact as any impacts will be offset. Um, the budget actually says that there will be a cost. There has been a cost to the budget to the tune of $18 million. Um, can you confirm where that $18 million was offset from, what projects were cut um, to find that $18 million? Thank you, Senator Mackenzie. I call the minister. I'm just getting some advice on that, and I'll get back get back to you. Thank you, thank you, Minister Senator Davy. Uh, yes, thank you. I have a follow-up question to your previous answer, um, where you, in response to Senator Mackenzie's question about the $500 million, you said um, that it is the $500 million is to um, get the corridor for, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Sydney to Newcastle, and you mentioned acquisitions. However, when I was in before Senate estimates and I put the question to Mr Hallinan from the department, he specifically said that the $500 million was for setting up the agency and commencing preparation for corridors, and when pressed, he implied that there would be no acquisitions undertaken under the first stage because it would be the commencement of conversations and negotiations. So, can you clarify if Mr. Hallinan was wrong, what portion of the $500 million is being set aside for corridor acquisitions, or is that $500 million to fund the new agency, the new bureaucracy, to start work on conversations that have already started work? Thank you, Senator Davey. The minister. So uh, the $500 million is not about establishing the authority, and I stand by the answer I gave to oh, Senator Cadell's question earlier, which is, and I'm happy to repeat it, that the Australian government has committed $500 million to securing the Sydney to Newcastle corridor of the high-speed rail network as a key first stage. This includes funding to start corridor acquisition, planning and early works, and includes working closely with the New South Wales government. The high-speed rail authority will work collaboratively collaboratively with the Australian Government and the New South Wales Government to determine the best way to deliver the project. Before allocating funding, the government will consider advice from the authority. Senator Davey. Sorry, Sorry. I apologise. So, um, Mr Hallinan got it wrong. Is, is that what I'm hearing? Because he did say it was for setting up the agency, and, and you've now twice said it is for securing corridor acquisition. Um, uh, I, I'm just because I am happy to put a question, a written question, back to the department to seek clarification from them. But um, I seem to be experiencing this um, quite regularly, where the departments are saying one thing and the government saying another thing, and uh, I'm just wondering when we're all going to be seeing, seeing off the same hymn sheet. The minister. Pretty shortly, I think, <laughs> Senator Davy. Um, my understanding is that the department has clarified their response. 
Uh, oh, Senator Davey, and then I'll go to you, Senator Roberts. Uh, final Senator question Davey. from me, and I will then um, sit down and listen. Uh, just with regard to the establishment of the High Speed Rail Authority and the disbandment of the National Faster Rail Agency, are you able to advise whether those staff were transferred over? Is that why there hasn't been a budget impact as per your explanatory memorandum? Or um, is this because I'm got the explanatory memorandum says there's no budgetary impact and um, any costs will, are created through savings. So I'm wondering if the disbandment of the National Faster Rail Agency um, is one of those cost savings and what's happened to those staff? Are they being transferred to the new authority or um, are they being uh, settled elsewhere? The minister. Uh, to answer your question, Senator Davey, is that the, the agency is still in existence and transitional um, arrangements are still being undertaken. The, and that, um, that the, the, though the National Faster Rail Agency will se cease as an executive agency with the functions being absorbed by the authority. Uh, Senator Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, Senator Mackenzie's comments about uh, shifting money from other regions, especially rural regions, down to Victoria to help Premier, current Premier Dan Andrews in a difficult election reminds me of the Rockhampton Ring Road, which is urgently needed which 700 to 800 million dollars had been committed, land had been purchased, families had moved into Rockhampton to start work, companies locally had bought construction equipment, cancelled, just like that, to send money to help shore up the corrupt regime of Premier Dan Andrews. Does the government realise that shifting these things for electoral gain that may occur in the Hunter due to a proposed long way off high-speed rail connection costs money and lives in other regions, particularly in my concern here in central Queensland with the Rockhampton Ring Road being shelved? What is the government doing to protect the people who have already made a commitment with their lives to this ring road? Thank you. Uh, Minister. Uh, Thank you, Senator um, Roberts, but we are here speaking about the High Speed Rail Authority Bill 2022. Um, if you want to go, come along to estimates and ask the questions around the Rock, uh, Rockhampton Ring Road. Um, these, the, that question. Uh, but it's still over. Yes. Yeah, so there you are. So we have a spillover on Friday, and I think we have a spillover the following Friday. So plenty of time, uh, Senator Roberts, to come and ask those questions. And we did go through, um, prosecuted by uh, Senator Mackenzie and Senator Canavan, about the Rockhampton Ring Road um, during the last uh, session of estimates. But um, you're more than happy to come along, I'm sure, to ask um, those questions. Uh, Senator Roberts. Yeah, I will just ask one final question of the minister. My question really boiled down to, once I set the context for the Rockhampton Ring Road, my question really boiled down to, is the government aware that when it rips money out of the regions, sends them to another area for electoral gain, that that is a cost to the regions and it hurts people and sometimes kills people? Minister. Uh, look, I have to reject. Um, the whole premise of your uh, question. The, the, 
The Commonwealth was working with the Queensland Government on how to commence early works on the Rockhand Ring Road pro um, project, as you probably are aware, but I completely reject the whole premise of the, the question you just put. Senator Pocock. Thank you, Chair. Thank you Minister, for your, your uh, comments earlier on the bill. I note that you pointed out concerns about the way that the coalition have appointed uh, people to boards. Uh, I would like to note that there was nothing to rectify that in this uh, legislation to set up the High Speed Rail Authority. Uh, there was no transparent framework to do that. I, I uh, thank the government for their support of my amendments to do that, uh, to ensure that Australians know that the people on the, the board and, and running the High Speed Rail Authority uh, have the right skills, uh, represent um, you know, different areas of, of the country and, and will uh, do the job there. Uh, I'm interested to hear from the government, given that there, there would be hundreds of people appointed to boards by the government, is the government committed to reviewing those appointments and going forward to ensure that there is a transparent process in all of these authorities and, and, uh, and for these boards going forward. Minister. Um, thank you, uh, Senator Pocock. Um, I'll just seek some advice. Why I'm just getting specific advice, um, I'm not sure if you were in the chamber when I did, actually, I did um, make it clear that we were supporting the three amendments that you are opposing, um, which go to um, selection for appointment disclosure of interests and disclosure of interests. So, as I've already said, um, the, the appointments to this board um, will be on um, on the basis of the relevant quality uh, qualifications, knowledge, skills, and or experience. So, merit based. Now, I can't speak to the um, to the situation in regarding other boards and board members and appointments um, other than what we've got before us here today, Senator Powicott. So what I um, yes, Senator McKenzie. I have one more question. Certainly, Senator, Senator McKenzie. Um, thank you, Chair. And then I will seek your guidance mm. because I know Senator Pocock's got amendments he would like to move, but we're in a period of no divisions, which makes it all a bit uh, iffy. Um, I'd like to know, Assistant Minister, the $18 million, which isn't mentioned in the explanatory memorandum, which appeared in the budget, is being offset out of the infrastructure portfolio. What projects have been cut to offset the $18 million? Uh, um, Minister. Oh, sorry, um, Chair. No projects were cut to fund the authorities' establishment. As I understand it, and I am happy to be corrected, but um, some of, part of that uh, 18 million was, uh, was money that was already allocated to the faster, um, faster rail agency. Senator McKenzie. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, Minister. So, so that was 10 million, Senator McKenzie? Uh, just, 
anticipating what you might be asking me next, and the remaining was um, from the department. Right, so just Senator McKenzie. Okay. Just um, so clarifying on the advice you've been given, there are no. The offset has come from the department and um, the Faster Rail Authority Agency. Uh, Minister. Yes. Thank you. Um, Minister, uh, where Senator McKenzie. Sorry, Chair. That's okay. Yeah, a, that's annoying, isn't help. it? Um, what, where will the staff be located for this authority? Will they be Canberra based? Minister. I'm sorry, I'm um, at this stage, at, um, at this early stage, those are the decisions still yet to be made. Senator. Senator McKenzie. Um, well, on behalf of Senator Cadell, who's had to leave um, this stage of the debate, um, he will be putting in a request for, given the authorities' work uh, will be between Sydney and his hometown of Newcastle, um, that it would show uh, great faith in the government's apparent newfound belief in rural and regional Australia if those jobs could be located in the Hunter. Minister, if there's no statement, if there's no, um, so the question before the chair is that amendments one, two, five on sheet one six seven nine be agreed to, reminding everybody that if a division is called, uh, it won't be held now; it will be uh, put off until tomorrow. So those of that opinion who support those amendments um, say aye. Aye. Those against say no. No. I think, think that the no's have it. The ayes have it. So um, on that basis, a division will be held over till tomorrow. Uh, sorry, uh, um, Senator Chikoni. Chair, can I just ask if it's possible whether we could either note our, and record our voting position rather than actually have a division? Uh, that's something I just wanted to, to clarify with that, you. That is possible, except I, I don't know the positions of uh, people who aren't in the chamber, because um, it would be a real division, and so I, just, I, I, I would not be comfortable calling that without having those people. Um, yes, so. So what we're going to do, um, colleagues, is move on to. I'm going to call Senator Pocock, um, and I'm asking you to move amendments one, two, three on sheet one seven five zero. And I think you'll need to seek leave to move them together. Thank you, Chair. I seek leave to move amendments one to three on sheet one seven five zero. No objection. Leave is granted. Senator Pocock. I move the amendments. Okay. Uh, Minister. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, for the record, um, the government will be supporting these three amendments. Uh, uh, amendment one goes to the selection. For appointment and the government, um, these amendments relate to ensuring the appointments to the board of the High Speed Rail Authority are a result of merit-based process, of which, of course, they will be. The minister has already made that clear in the other place, and that, and that the board of the High Speed Rail Authority has to, has to be a skills-based board, and is absolutely the determination of the government to appoint people based on merit. It's important for our, uh, on merit. Um, so the amendment two goes to disclosure of interest. interest of, uh, the government supports this amendment concerning the disclosure of interest of, boards of board members to the, minister, to the minister in accordance with the Public Government's Performance and Accountability Act 2013. And we support the third amendment. And these amendments relate to ensuring that the position of the CEO of High Speed Rail Authority are are the result of a merit-based process. Uh, thank you. Um, Senator Rice. Just to note that the Greens will also be supporting these amendments. Okay. Okay, if there's, uh, Senator Pocock. 
like to thank uh, Minister King and her office for uh, the, the way that they engaged on this um, piece of legislation. I appreciate their commitment to ensuring that all appointments are merit-based. Clearly, this is something that is expected by uh, the communities that we come from. Australians want to have peace of mind that people who get into influential positions are getting there not because of who they know, but because they have the right uh, skills and uh, leadership ability, ability to make a, a difference in those positions. This is clearly a problem that we are uh, grappling with in, in politics. A recent report by the Grad Institute found that across all federal government appointees, 7 per cent had a direct political connection, and that figure rose to 21 per cent amongst positions that were considered well-paid, prestigious uh, and powerful. This is something that I'm hearing from my community that they want to end. I welcome the government's uh, commitment to that and I, I really look forward over this um, next parliament to ensure that, that all boards have a very clear, transparent uh, process for for appointments and that the public can can see that, that 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 we are advertising that people can have input and that we get the right people for the job uh, we clearly also need a range of um, experiences something like high speed rail I think it's really important that there are people from a regional rural uh, background to have input and clearly we need more women in positions of leadership when it comes to the high speed Rail uh, Authority. A quick glance at the National Women in Transport website shows at least 36 women who are currently leading infrastructure organisations uh, or the infrastructure and transport arms of multinationals operating in Australia. So the, the talent is there, and I, I look forward to seeing who, who is appointed, and I'm sure uh, they will uh, lead this authority. Um, which is a really Im important authority for us. Uh, it's it's going to be a huge challenge, but I think uh, looking at the future of Australia is something that most Australians want to see happen at some point, uh, sooner rather than later. Thank you. Uh, so the question before the chair is that amendments 123 on sheet 1750 moved by Senator David Pocock be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The committee will, will now report progress. Um, we won't be able to, to go further with this bill at this point because of the deferred division. So I will. Report progress. I report progress. The uh, bill um, has uh, will be further consideration. The bill will be deferred until tomorrow because of the deferred division. Clark. Government business orders of the day number three: Education Legislation Amendment 2022 Measures Number One, Bill 2022, Second Reading Debate. Senator Dunningham. Yes, thank you. Acting Deputy President, and it's a delight to be asked to um, provide a contribution to the education legislation amendment 2022 measures number one bill 2022 on behalf of the opposition um, and uh, to put our position on the record. Uh, at the outset, um, it's good to go through a bit of background and context for this legislation. The purpose of this bill is to give effect to six measures that were introduced by the former coalition government and also a new measure by the government to cease the 10 per cent discount for the upfront payment of student contributions. Six of, uh, six of the elements of this bill were included in legislation introduced by the former coalition government, which of course uh, lapsed at the end of the previous parliament. The measures included were the extension of the fee help loan exemption to apply until the end of the year 2022 with retrospective effect from uh, the 1st of January. FEHOP is, of course, the Commonwealth loan program available to domestic full fee paying students to pay their tuition fees. Uh, it usually has a 20 per cent loan fee applied to undergraduate students. Uh, the students that access FEHOP generally 
study with private higher education providers, which is an interesting fact. Uh, the Coalition waived the fee help loan fee as a COVID-19 relief measure from the 1st of April 2020 through to the 31st of December 2021. And this measure provides a further exemption of the loan fee to the 31st of December 2022. And this measure encourages students accessing fee help who have been financially impacted by the effects of the pandemic to commence or continue their studies. Uh, this measure is expected to assist approximately 30,000 students, which is um, certainly no small number. The second measure, contained in the six measures I've already referenced, uh, was to support the development of micro-credential courses by extending fee help eligibility for students accessing these. Um, this element of the bill supports uh, those wishing to undertake what is known as a micro-credential unit of studying by allowing them to access the same fee help for this unit. The larger micro-credential pilot program, which was introduced by the coalition government, encourages universities to develop and deliver new micro-credential pro programs, supporting the national priority to build a highly skilled workforce through more flexible and industry-focused models of higher education. Uh, micro-credential courses, for those wondering, are standalone single unit certification courses. They're not formal degrees and they're not uh, qualifications per se, uh, but they still have an assessment component <laughs> and provide additional or complementary learning to upskill the workforce, which is, I think, very important given the dynamic nature of workforce needs uh, and, um, of course, time capacity of students and those entering into studies. The feedback from industry, from students and also from providers has shown that uh, short courses are an important study option, providing, as I've alluded to, flexibility and, of course, also fast-tracked higher education qualifications. Uh, the former government provided uh, $32.5 million to the higher education sector to develop these courses to domestic and international students. Scaling up industry-focused micro-credentials uh, was one of the seven key recommendation or recommendations rather, of the University Industry Collaboration in Teaching and Learning Review. Uh, the review findings complemented the coalition's support for the delivery of innovative higher education models, research commercialisation and reform of the Australian Qualifications Framework. Uh, this specific change supports students, typically those that are full fee paying and engaging in one of these courses to access fee help which provides them with a loan, uh, for want of a better term, so that they can access these courses and upskill or reskill to a new profession. Complementary to this change, the bill clarifies the status of enabling courses in the context of a lifetime student learning entitlement. The student learning entitlement is a lifetime limit on the amount of Commonwealth support a student can receive through a Commonwealth supported place or a CSP, um, uh, currently at seven years. An enabling course is a course to assist students who are new to academic study to pursue a higher education, for example, essay writing. This change is extremely important to ensure that students are fully equipped with these essential skills to succeed in their higher education studies without it impacting on their course attainment for PhD or master's qualifications. The bill further also makes uh, some technical changes requiring students to provide their USI to their higher education provider on or at the time of a place offer to be eligible for Commonwealth assistance. From the 1st of January in the year of 2021, as part of the government's commitments to extend the USI to higher education, students have been required to have a US, uh, have been required to have a USI, USI to be eligible for Commonwealth assistance. This measure is a technical change requiring that students also provide their USI to their higher education provider to be eligible for Commonwealth assistance. Higher education providers are required to report students' USIs to the Secretary of the Department of Education, Skills and Employment without an explicit requirement for students to give their USIs to their providers. Um, uh, their providers have had difficulties complying with their reporting requirements. This has, in turn, of course, impacted the broader policy aim for the USI to be used as a student identifier across the tertiary education sector. Uh, this measure addresses uh, the issue by clearly linking the provision of a valid USI 
to the student's provider with their eligibility for Commonwealth assistance. A further change uh, is to clarify the requirements for New Zealand citizens who want to access HEX help and also fee help. This measure will introduce a requirement for New Zealand citizens to be resident in Australia for the duration of a unit of study to be eligible for HEX help assistance and fee help assistance for that specific unit. Uh, this measure will ensure consistency across the citizenship and residency requirements for non-Australian citizens accessing Commonwealth assistance. Under the existing framework, New Zealand uh, students have been able to undertake study outside of Australia while accessing fee help, contrary to the policy intention of citizenship and residency requirements for non-Australian citizens for Commonwealth assistance. Current students will not be affected by this measure. This measure will only affect students seeking Commonwealth assistance in relation to a unit of study with a census date on or after 1 January 2023. The bill, no longer, um, the bill no longer includes the legislative changes for the Help for Rural Doctors and Nurse Practitioners initiative that provides a debt reduction for rural doctors and nurse practitioners who reside and practice in regional, rural or remote Australia. We have been assured uh, by the government that these legislative changes will be included in a separate bill, the Higher Education Support Act Amendment Measures No. 1 Bill 2022, which is to be introduced. And we are grateful to the government for continuing to support this important measure, uh, which will encourage initial employment and increase retention of doctors and nurse practitioners in those communities I've already mentioned uh, across Australia. Um, Last but not least, the bill gives effect to the government's election commitments to end the 10 per cent higher education contribution scheme, the higher education loan program, HEX HELP, discount for upfront payment for student contribution amounts from 1 January 2023. The bill removes the 10 per cent discount uh, for students who pay all or part of their student contribution amount upfront with a minimum of $500 payment. This discount has a long history initially introduced by the Hawke Labor government and amended over the years to its current iteration. It was a measure that helped students bring forward their payments should they wish to do so and reduce the debt burden they would face uh, once they concluded their studies and reached the required salary level, which in this financial year, as I'm advised, is $48,361. Contrary to the rhetoric that's often floated around this issue, the measure was not designed to benefit rich kids. Students from all walks of life and different ages and courses benefited from this measure. And in concluding, I would like to uh, reflect on uh, the Coalition's strong record in backing the higher education sector. The last budget of the Coalition government committed almost $20 billion towards higher education. This is part of our record $115 billion in total of government funding for universities between 2019 and 2024, 95.2 billion of that going in teaching and learning and $19.8 billion of that total uh, being allocated to research. In the 2021 budget, we funded an additional 30,000 places as part of 100,000 more places over the decade. We also provided $32.5 million over four years to develop and uh, pilot micro-credentials, um, as I've already referenced in uh, an earlier part in this speech. We put an additional $1 billion of money into university research during the pandemic, um, and in the 2020-21 and 21-22 budgets, we committed $277.9 million for higher education providers to offer short course places in 2021 and $298.5 million uh, for national priority and innovative places from 2021 through to 2024. Based on data provided by universities in October of 2021, around 12,586 short course places were estimated to have been delivered in the year 2021. We also have a strong commitment to regional education with funding delivered for regional university centres to help students in regional and remote areas access higher education. Our $242.7 million Trailblazer Universities program is helping support Australia's best minds to produce cutting-edge research that can be used to deliver real-world outcomes. 
The Coalition will continue to back measures that strengthen and grow our higher education sector, ensuring that all Australians, should they wish to do so, can access a world-class higher education, whether they live in the cities, the regions or remote parts of our country. Uh, the former Coalition government is very proud of our commitment to this sector, for what it's provided to those who are uh, beneficiaries of it, the futures they can derive no matter where they live, um, and I thank the Senate. Thank you, Senator Dunningham. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak on the Education Legislation Amendment 2022 Measures No. 1 Bill. Uh, the Greens support this bill, which extends the fee help loan fee exemption to 31st December 2022. It extends fee help to students who participate in micro credential pilot courses, clarifies that enabling courses will not count toward a student's lifetime limit of Commonwealth support provides that New Zealand citizens are eligible for HECS help and fee help if they are resident in Australia for the duration of the unit, and makes other minor amendments to the Higher Education Support Act. Importantly, the bill also removes the 10 per cent HECS help discount for students who pay their student fees up front. Let me be clear about our position on student fees. They should not exist. Education is a basic right. It is not a privilege. From early childhood through to school, TAFE and university, education should be fee-free, no matter who you are or what stage of life you are in. People who have gone through higher education are struggling under thousands and thousands of dollars of debt, and students have to keep signing up for more debt as they go through uni. For so many of them, the Liberals' disastrous job-ready graduates bill only burdened them with more and more student debt. And as I stated during the debate on the Job Ready Graduates Bill, when the 10 per cent discount was brought back by the coalition with the help of One Nation, this measure is actually unfair. It only benefits the wealthy who can afford to pay their fees up front. A vast majority of people cannot. And it provides nothing for the many students who simply cannot afford to make upfront payments on their student fees and are forced to accumulate a higher and higher debt. <clears throat> this is why education has to be universal and free. That's fair, that's consistent, and that's equitable for all. So we commend the government for scrapping the discount. Removing the 10% discount is supported by the National Union of Students as well as the National Tertiary Education Union. But there is so much more that the government needs to do in higher education. Higher education is a right. Higher education institutions are, are a public good. Higher education must be built on the principles of democracy and equity. And we have moved a fair way away from that in this country. Every fee hike and funding cut in the Job Ready Graduates package needs to be scrapped, and it needs to be scrapped urgently. Labor's excuse that further changes will only happen after the accord process is not good enough. There is no need for further evidence when it comes to the job-ready graduates. As the Labor government themselves said in the inquiry into the bill, job-ready graduates attacked the core research purpose of universities, would result in inequitable levels of student debt, especially for women, would have a significant worse impact on women and First Nations people to undermine the quality of university teaching and was so deeply flawed it could not be repaired with amendments. So you are in government now. Scrap it. Students, academics, staff and universities are being harmed by the funding cuts and fee hikes of the Job Ready Graduates Bill. And that's happening right now under the government's watch and will continue to to do so unless the government takes the necessary first step to making higher education in this country fairer and gets rid of the Liberals' fee hikes and funding cuts. And I urge them to have the courage to do this, not after the accord, but right now. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Senator MacDonald. Thank you very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise to, uh, to speak to the Education Legislation Amendment Bill 
because it is a terrific continuation of the, ag of the agenda of the previous government on recognising the challenges around higher education. Um, this, I just want to touch on. I'll, I'll come to the purposes of the bill shortly, but I just want to start with making some comments around uh, the coalition's program uh, on higher education that, um, that we were working on. So the last budget of the coalition government committed almost $20 billion towards higher education. This is part of our record $115.1 billion in total government funding for universities between 2019 and 2024, $95.2 billion in teaching and learning and $19.8 billion in research. And in the 2021 budget, we funded an additional 30,000 places as a part of 100,000 more university places over the decade. We also have a strong commitment to regional education, with funding delivered for regional university centres to help students in regional and remote areas access to higher education. Uh, our $242.7 million Trailblazer Universities program is helping support Australia's best minds to produce cutting-edge research that can be used to deliver real-world outcomes. And we also provided $32.5 million over four years to develop and pilot micro-credentials. Now, this element of supporting regional universities and regional places is critical. And just a couple of weeks ago, I had the absolute pleasure of attending uh, James Cook University uh, and the Business and Law School um, annual lecture there. Uh, this lecture was given by a, um, well, I'll call him a young man, given he was about my age, a young man who uh, graduated from high school in Charters Towers. Now, he completed uh, his schooling with no real under, uh, decision about what he wanted to study. Um, and so he put down a range of university options uh, from education um, uh, right through to law. And he said that when his father called out that he had got into university, when it came out in the papers that morning, he had to ask uh, his father which course because he just wasn't sure. Uh, anyway, he got into law. And, uh, and studied law in the old-fashioned way that a number of us here would remember, before computers, before uh, laptops. Um, he used the university library and the Dewey system and, uh, and um, researched, waiting for the best books to be available to complete his, his studies. Um, and he was finally able to get into a residential college at the James Cook University, which allowed him to live uh, and study without um, riding his bike through the, the hot and humid weather of Townsville uh, to complete that successfully. Now, this fellow has gone on to become uh, a very well-respected lawyer and barrister in this state. Um, he took uh, King's Council in Queensland and uh, was the first Indigenous King's Council in Queensland and is now the first Indigenous Supreme Court judge. Um, so uh, Judge Lincoln Crowley is, a, is an impressive individual by any measure, but the ability of him to be able to study locally and regionally gave him the opportunity to study a university education uh, because that would have been a big challenge for his family if he had had to contemplate going further away, going to Brisbane, going to somewhere like that. And so this support for regional education, for regional universities, uh, for universities like James Cook, like um, CQU, Central Queensland University, like Charles Darwin, these are all important institutions uh, that allow our young people from uh, regional parts of the country to have the same access to higher education that those young people who live in capital cities already have and enjoy, where they can live either at home or with family, uh, but they are not going thousands of kilometres away 
uh, in order to complete their studies. And this is a terrifically important part of an education agenda in a nation as large as ours. Uh, the six measures of this bill that were introduced by the coalition, but which uh, collapsed, uh, which lapsed. I'm sorry, at the dissolution of parliament, um, uh, have been touched on. But I do want to um, extend uh, a, a little more detail to them around the uh, extension of the fee help loan exemptions, uh, which will apply until 31 December 2022, with that retrospective effect from the 1st of January 2022. Uh, that is, of course, very important because it is now so late in the year and it's important that retrospective element be applied uh, to support the development of the micro-credential -credential courses by extending fee help eligibility for students accessing these and strengthening and reporting the requirements for unique student identifiers, another important part of of the administration element uh, of this legislation. To clarify the status of an en enabling courses in the context of lifetime student learning entitlement and to create consistency for New Zealand citizens accessing Commonwealth assistance by requiring New Zealand citizens be resident in Australia for their eligible unit of study and to make minor and technical amendments to improve the operation of the Higher Education Support Act 2003 and to the Tertiary Education Quality and Standards Agency Act of 2011. Now, what was going to be a part of this bill uh, was also the legislative changes for the Help for Rural Doctors and Nurse Practitioners initiatives that provides a debt reduction for students, uh, rural doctors and nurse practitioners who reside and practice in regional, rural or remote Australia. Uh, this, this is a critically important element, this identification of the MMS areas that this would be applicable to. Because, uh, you know, as everybody in this place knows, we are incredibly challenged by the number of general practitioners that we have in this nation. And at the Friends of uh, General Practice um, breakfast that um, uh, this fabulous bipartisan group, uh, co-chaired by Dr Gordon Reid and Dr Sophie Scamps and myself, uh, we had a, a breakfast earlier this week. And the point was made by the incoming uh, president that when she graduated from medicine, 50 per cent of her class went on to become general practitioners. Now that number has now fallen to 13.5 per cent. That is a significant structural change in the way young people are making a decision about what sort of medicine they're going to practice. And so the challenges for general practice are felt um, both in the cities but more concerningly, uh, there is a, an exceptional shortage of general practitioners into rural, regional uh, and remote Australia. And this is, of course, affecting the longer term health outcomes for people who live in those regions. It is ending up in shorter life expectancy, poorer health outcomes. Uh, and we've got terrific uh, services like Heart of Australia, which uh, Dr Rolf Gomes leads and takes uh, the specialist cardiology services, both um, CT uh, and MRI uh, services, into regional places because there are people who just can't afford to travel uh, away to the, um, the bigger centres for that kind of medical care. And it is resulting in shorter life expectancy and certainly uh, reduced quality of life. And, and so I applaud. Uh, those um, specialists who travel to the regions to ensure that regional, rural and remote people uh, don't go without. But, but this is the, the GP uh, challenge is, is broad and, uh, and so I look forward to the element that will come forward uh, with support for general practitioners and nurses because it won't just be um, medical, uh, it won't just be um, uh, higher education, uh, support. Uh, it is also uh, the sort of investment to um, 
to encourage patients to access high quality general practice care, to increase the, the, um, the amount that general practitioners who are offering that longer service, um, the, the, the C and the more complex patient care uh, that they receive, um, and to ensure that uh, people who receive uh, bulk billing incentives support for vulnerable people are all uh, supported well. And, and I'll have more to say on that uh, when we come forward with that um, second part of these reforms, which is the uh, Higher Education Support Act amendment measures, which will be introduced later. But this is a, a bill that I, I recommend to the Senate. I think it has um, broad support uh, across the Senate because it does uh, provide for uh, a continuation of a development and, and focus on higher education that the coalition had started uh, and does provide a greater focus um, on those elements of, um, uh, of micro-credential courses in particular, um, the lifetime student learning entitlements, clarification of that. And I, I do think that the, the consistency for New Zealand citizens as they uh, access higher education here in Australia will be, uh, will be well received because it is the most um, constant complaint uh, of anyone dealing with government is, is you know, when they find that things are not consistent, that there is um, uh, definitional uh, challenges, and I think that this is this is a, another way to continue a constant improvement to ensure that legislation is uh, clear um, and uh, user friendly, and makes that that outcome which we're all searching for, which is to allow our young people the greatest opportunity to study, uh, to go to higher education, uh, to complete their um, their work, and to achieve their full potential, whatever that may be, and to uh, hopefully stay in the regional and rural and remote communities to support uh, those places that they come from, uh, that is a great, a great thing to be able to do. And of course it is the regional universities that provide that ability for, for young people uh, who live in those remote places. Um, there are some incredible programs going on, hub and spoke training programs that um, that those more regional universities provide in terms of um, uh, age care uh, and nursing support. They train people in their communities uh, to be able to take on that, that higher education to provide the services that are so desperately required in those places. So, you know, it is a complex, uh, complex uh, framework, the um, education system in this country. It has to serve a relatively small population over vast distances, uh, over the states uh, and territories, and, uh, and to try and find a, a consistent model that allows for um, our, our youth to, to have their greatest opportunity as they go forward. Uh, I am the proud parent of three university studiers next year, um, and, uh, and I think it is just terrific to see um, the myriad of opportunities that are available to to young people that you know much more so than, than when I went to university and we we studied something that we we thought that we would be in for the a career that we thought we would be in for the remainder of our lives but there is now a broad range of opportunities uh, and studies that allow a level of um, uh, of additional study of focus uh, on um, specialty areas that provide a, an excellence that Australia has long been renowned for. And, um, and I've just uh, finished reading uh, previous Senator Brett Mason's book where he celebrates two great Australian academics, um, Oliphant and Florey, and the work that they did uh, as Australian, uh, Australians who went overseas, uh, who uh, progressed their areas of study uh, in a way that was previously unthought of and in fact um, were part of the, the solutions that solved the end of, uh, of that great conflict being uh, penicillin and microwave radar. Uh, so you know Australians do very well in this educational field and these are just more amendments that will 
uh, work towards greater uh, simplification of the legislation. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Minister. Uh, thanks, Acting Deputy President, and I thank senators for their contributions to this debate. Uh, the bill will improve the quality of access to higher education and support the government's commitment to building a highly skilled workforce. Our election commitment to remove the 10 per cent HEX help discount for upfront payments is projected to save $144 million over the forward estimates, saving which will help fund the government's 20,000 new university places, which have been allocated to students who are underrepresented in our universities uh, and also dedicated to those areas where we do face skills challenges. Uh, it's another step forward for fairer access to higher education across the country. The extension of the fee help uh, loan fee, sorry, the fee help loan fee exemption for a further 12 months will support full fee paying undergraduates and their providers as the sector recovers from the COVID-19 pandemic. The bill also supports the development of innovative, flexible and industry focused higher education programs by helping fee by extending fee help to the government's micro credential pilot. It improves the operation of the Higher Education Support Act by clarifying the treatment of enabling courses and unique student identifier requirements and aligning HEX help and fee help citizenship and residency requirements for New Zealand citizens across a Commonwealth supported place. Once again, I thank the senators for their contributions to this debate and I commend the bill to the chamber. Thank you. The question is now that the bill be read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to education and for related purposes. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? No. If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. Um, I move that the bill now be read a third time. Those of that opinion, sorry, the question is now that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to education and for related purposes. Government business, order of the day number four, Atomic Energy Amendment Mine Rehabilitation and Closure Bill 2022, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Macdonald, I believe, um, will be opening for uh, this particular bill. I call Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much, uh, Acting Deputy President. The coalition supports the passage of the Atomic Energy Amendment Mine Rehabilitation and Closure Bill uh, 2022. This bill is the culmination of work initiated by the former coalition government, and the coalition commends the government, the minister, for continuing this important bill. In 1999, an agreement was reached between the Commonwealth Government and Energy Resources Australia that upon the completion of mining activities at Ranger Mine Site in the Northern Territory, Energy Resources Australia would take charge of rehabilitating the Ranger Mine Site. This was agreed upon by the government and Energy Resources Australia to ensure a commitment to the proper rehabilitation of the Ranger Site. Stringent environmental standards were agreed upon as part of this agreement. Mining at Ranger ceased in January 2021 and the remediation is already underway. The current framework allows Energy Resources Australia, which I'm going to uh, refer to as ERA going forward, uh, ERA to undertake remediation work until January 2026. More than 20 years ago, it was believed that ERA would only need five years to complete the remediation uh, works and rehabilitation works on the site. As a result, the authority set out a cease of operation for mining works in January 2021, with the authority lapsing on 8 January 2026. However, following consultation with the previous and current governments, it was concluded that in order to fully rehabilitate the site to high contemporary standards, ERA would require more than the five years provided uh, to complete the rehabilitation and monitoring required. And in ERA's submission to the committee, they emphasise attempting to finalise rehabilitation by the 8th of January 2026 is not feasible, 
and will not meet the agreed objectives of stakeholders. ERA is committed to undertaking proper and thorough rehabilitation of the Ranger project area to a world-class standard. It has already commenced that work, but in order to rehabilitate the mine site to the standard, it requires further time beyond the 8th of January 2026. Now, this bill extends the legislative framework surrounding the rehabilitation, ensuring that ERA can complete rehabilitation, close out the site, continue monitoring and return the land to the tra traditional owners. This bill does not provide any authority for further mining of the site, which follows ERA's commercial decision not to pursue any further mine site extensions in 2015. Rather, this bill's primary purpose is to enable the long-term remediation and monitoring of the site. Primarily, it amends the legislation to allow the remediation authority to be milestone-based rather than time-based, keeping the onus on the responsible company to complete the rehabilitation. The authorities created under this legislation will allow for the progressive close-out areas of the mining lease. This means that as portions of the lease are considered to be fully rehabilitated, the land can be returned to the local community sooner. Brad Welsh, CEO of ERA, noticed the safeguards inserted as part of the bill, and he stated, further, the bill entrenches a number of safeguards to ensure the involvement and agreement of the traditional owners is required, including a rehabilitation authority cannot be granted unless there is first an agreement in place between the Commonwealth and the Northern Land Council pursuant to the Aboriginal Land Rights Act. The minister is required to further consult with the Northern Land Council before any rehabilitation authority is granted and before the minister makes any declaration that an authority no longer applies to part of the Ranger project area because the minister is satisfied the area is rehabilitated, the minister must consult with the Northern Land Council. Before the minister revokes an authority, the minister must be satisfied the area is rehabilitated and the minister must first consult with the Northern Land Council. And before the minister makes any variation to the conditions of an authority, the minister must consult with the Northern Land Council. These safeguards ensure that there remain proper procedures and checks throughout the extended rehabilitation and monitoring process. The Coalition supports all mine rehabilitation being completed to high standards. Australia has some of the most stringent environmental and rehabilitative standards and processes in the world and supports ERA fulfilling their obligations to properly remediate the range of mine. The Ranger Mine has served the country well over its years of operation, creating economic benefits for the country, local community and providing jobs and employment services to the local population and the wider Northern Territory. And as Ranger's operations have come to a close, the focus is on ensuring that the affected areas, which are small in size, are fully rehabilitated to ensure protection of our natural environment. The environmental requirements that were set out in 1999 are of an incredibly high standard. ERA has affirmed their commitment to upholding these environmental requirements. And as a result, through more modern appraisals of the requirements to successfully rehabilitate the site to these stringent standards, ERA have determined that the five years previously allocated are now not sufficient for the completion of rehabilitation operations and monitoring. The Coalition accepted ERA's determination and, as a part of our commitment to environmental rehabilitation, undertook processes to explore the options available to the government to allow for continued rehabilitation. There remain strict reporting requirements throughout the rehabilitative process, and these will remain with the implementation of this bill. The Department of Climate Change, Energy, the Environment and Water's supervising scientist in a submission to the committee affirmed that Energy Resources Australia is required to submit an annually updated mine closure plan for Ranger, which provides clear scientific evidence to demonstrate that the rehabilitation works proposed by Energy Resources Australia will achieve the rehabilitation objectives. The Ranger mine closure plan is publicly released and subject to detailed assessment by regulators and stakeholders, including the supervising scientist 
and requires approval from the Australian Government Minister for Resources and the Northern Territory Minister for Mining and Industry. The supervising study, a scientist, is undertaking a detailed rehabilitation verification process to provide certainty that all rehabilitation works are completed in strict accordance with the Ranger Mine Closure Plan and associated approvals. Strong environmental standards are commonplace across Australia's mining industry. Australia is a world leader in environmental practice. The resources industry employs large numbers of environmental scientists to ensure that environmental guidelines are met. Furthermore, the former coalition government made a very significant contribution to the protection, conservation and rehabilitation of our natural surroundings by delivering a strong record of achievement in the environmental portfolio. Just in our final term of government alone, we invested over $6 billion in programs, policies and measures to protect our natural environment. And collectively, all of this has led to the development and enforcement throughout Australia of some of the highest and most exacting environmental standards in the world. These, arrange, these apply to a very wide range of issues, including biodiversity, pollution, heritage, contamination, conservation, hazardous substances, recycling and waste, and in this case, mine site rehabilitation. Now, consultation on this bill has been extensive. And the coalition and the government and the government of the Northern Territory all recognise the importance of proper rehabilitation of the ranger site and ensured engagement with a wide range of relevant stakeholders on this bill. Traditional owners, the Northern Land Council and other Northern Territory bodies are supportive of the bill and have expressed their support for ERAs fulfilling their obligations set out under the Act to rehabilitate the ranger site. Throughout the committee processes, a number of stakeholders participated in the hearing on this bill. This process firmly certified support for this bill, the continued rehabilitative works being conducted by ERA. This wide-ranging engagement includes the Australian Conservation Foundation, who strongly support the passage of the bill, and their submission to the committee affirms that there is a clear alignment amongst diverse stakeholders about the need for high quality rehabilitation works and a credible timeline to facilitate this. Given this key legitimacy threshold and the need for more rehabilitation time and greater certainty, Australian Conservation Foundation welcomes this legislation and supports its swift passage into law. The committee also found that ERA was committed to utilising utilising local businesses and contractors as part of their rehabilitative work. This includes local Indigenous businesses. This forms part of ERA's plan to continue to engage with the local traditional owner groups and other representative bodies and organisations. An ERA meets monthly with local traditional owner groups and the Northern Land Council to ensure continuity throughout the rehabilitation process. This is echoed by the submission from the Department of Industry, Science and Resources in conjunction with the National Indigenous Australians Agency, which states, the rehabilitation of the Ranger project area fits within a broader commitment by the Commonwealth in Jabiru and Kakadu to support empowerment of the local Mirar traditional owners as they implement their vision to the transition of Jabiru from a mining town servicing ranger to a world-class... Senator MacDonald, to um, my friend, I'm sorry to interrupt, but 7.30 uh, we're going to adjournment debate. You're in continuation. Thank you. Senator Senator McCarthy. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Early this morning I received uh, some terribly tragic news and I wish to share with the Senate uh, my sincere condolences uh, to the families of Mr Hooson, uh, the chair of the Central Land Council, uh, who passed away unexpectedly in Darwin overnight. A young man who uh, only recently took on the leadership role of the uh, Central Land Council as chair in April this year. A very much uh, loved and respected person who's made uh, in such a short time at the Land Council, but even before that, on his uh, previous roles uh, in life as a field officer, police officer, health worker, and also uh, his work with Uniting Church uh, at Apatula 
uh, Fink in Central Australia. Uh, the, the news is absolutely devastating. Uh, my thoughts uh, and prayers do go out uh, to his families uh, in Central Australia. Uh, in particular, I mention his sister Eileen and her daughter uh, Barb Shaw and their families in Alice Springs, but also Stuart Hooson and Goody Nancy and Gadrian uh, their families in Borulula and many other families across the Northern Territory and uh, into Queensland. I reach out especially to the uh, staff of the Central Land Council but also the Aboriginal Areas Protection Authority uh, who he was with uh, in terms of a board meeting in Darwin and I know that uh, there is profound sadness and shock amongst the uh, Territory community. Mr Hooson has been associated with the CLC for many years uh, before the election uh, as chair this year. He was a member of the CLC executive committee since 2019 and had been a delegate when he was younger. He was a youth worker. He's been employed as a CLC field officer and, as I said, a police officer, health worker. And he was also a member of the Nankajara, Pijinjara, Yankajara Women's Council, Waduku, Men's Violence Prevention Group incredibly passionate about making sure uh, women and children were safe uh, in their homes, in their communities, at meetings, wherever he was throughout his, uh, his many years of dedication uh, to, to his community but uh, to the Northern Territory community. Only a few weeks ago, uh, Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, Minister Linda Burney, uh, the member for uh, Lingiari, Marion Scrimger and myself travelled to Wataka in Central Australia to meet with the Central Land Council, uh, to which uh, Mr Hooson was chairing, and all the delegates, uh, over 90 delegates, who gathered there. And it was a, a, an incredibly important occasion, as is uh, most of the meetings of uh, the Central Land Council. And I guess I reflect poignantly on uh, his leadership at that meeting, uh, his warm welcome uh, to, to all who entered uh, to stand before the Land Council and be questioned. Um, his compassion, uh, generosity and warmth uh, will always be remembered. And uh, I just say how deeply sorry I am to have heard this news. And on behalf of uh, our government and on behalf of the Australian Parliament, I just want to acknowledge uh, what a great contribution uh, he has made um, to the people of the Northern Territory in such a short time, and we're just so deeply saddened. Yo, Boydi Butter. Thank you, Senator Patterson. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy President. I rise tonight to recognise the men and women who have, for 75 years, quietly and without fanfare, served our nation. The Australian Signals Directorate this year celebrates its 75th anniversary of defending Australia from global threats and advancing our national interest through the provision of foreign signals intelligence. For 75 years, the ASD has been tasked with collecting the national secrets of foreign adversaries while protecting our own. First emerging in the Second World War, this critical national task remains as important today. In 1947, the Defence Signals Bureau, as the ASD was originally called, was officially established in Melbourne under the leadership of British Commander J. E. Teddy Pulden. But in the preceding years, the spirit of ASD was already beginning to form when the Australian Navy, Army and Air Force personnel were brought together to support General Douglas MacArthur's South West Pacific campaign by intercepting and decoding Japanese radio signals. Until then, Navy, Army and Air Force wireless units and intercept stations operated independently and without central coordination. From its early inception, Australia's signals intelligence was intimately intertwined with America and the United Kingdom in the war effort. It formed the basis of the Five Eyes network, which ensures the intimate sharing of the most sensitive intelligence continues today. Beyond the Second World War, the ASD has been, as they say, hidden in plain sight protecting Australia's national security and interests throughout the Cold War and during the War on Terror. Over the years, the ASD's capacity and capabilities have deepened and expanded, just as the threat environment has evolved and become more complex. While the ASD's primary role will always be to support the warfighter, the Australian Cyber Security Centre was established within ASD by the previous government in 2014 to boost our nation's defences against cyber attacks. 
On this 75th anniversary, it is timely for us to recognise the call of duty that once again is being required of Australia's best and brightest at the ASD. Director-General Rachel Noble has been honest with the Australian people about the threats we face. Australia's national economic and social wellbeing is increasingly the target of interference, espionage and attack by both foreign nation states and criminals. Our deteriorating strategic environment is seeing rapid military expansion, coercion, intrusion and cyber attacks on the march in the Indo-Pacific and indeed around the world. We have seen in Ukraine the impact cyber operations can have on conflict. Many military strategists believe the first shots in future wars will be fired in cyberspace, but they won't remain there. They will have real-world effects on critical infrastructure and services, which are increasingly being targeted by our potential adversaries. It is critically important that we can defend our country against those attacks and that our adversaries know that we can hit them back if they strike us first. That's why in government the coalition delivered at the most significant single investment in the Australian Signals Directorate in its 75-year history. Our $9.9 billion investment in Red Spice will deliver cutting-edge capabilities in signals intelligence, cyber security and offensive cyber. It will allow the ASD to almost double in size by hiring 1,900 new personnel. Because, as Ms Noble has said, an organisation is only as good as its people. Red Spice must be delivered in full. Anything less would expose Australia and its citizens to unacceptable threats, both on and offline. ASD's people are mission-focused and patriotic Australians. As the head of the ACSC, Abigail Bradshaw, has said, there's nothing more important than contributing to your country's national security, economic prosperity and social unity than in this cyber mission. I can't think of a better job. I couldn't agree more. Thank you. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. It's time for real ambition in this country through a treaty republic. We have an opportunity to right the historical wrongs that shape our present. Before the British invasion, over 500 sovereign nations governed these lands, each with their own laws, languages and customs. Colonists waged a war on First Nations people. They violently imposed their authority without negotiation or consent. We need to tell the truth about who we are and where we come from. Only then will we be able to heal and move forward as a united nation. Despite ongoing acts of genocide in this country, First Nations people have never ceded our sovereignty. Sovereignty is our assertion to be self-determining and to be self-governing. We maintain our sovereignty through the law of our land, through an unbroken connection to our country, our waters, our skies, our totems. Treaty is a negotiation about sharing sovereignty in this country. We've never had this conversation. Through a treaty process, we meet as equals to ensure genuine peace and justice. Treaty will not cede our sovereignty. It will strengthen it. Treaty is a formal agreement between First Nations people and the Commonwealth Government. <clears throat> Treaty protects First Nations rights and sets the terms for sovereign bodies to negotiate with the government. That's why treaty is important. It's a blank canvas. We can write it together. We could have a treaty of the 21st century right here in this country. We are only one of a few Commonwealth countries left without a treaty with its first people. Only a treaty will allow for this country to be cared for as it should be, with thousands of years of knowledge and connection. Incarceration rates, deaths in custody and child removals are all symptoms of an ongoing war against First Nations people in this country. 
treaty is an end to that war. We have an opportunity to do things differently in this country. We don't need a new king. We need a head of state chosen by the people. This parliament and our prime minister shouldn't be subordinate to someone on the other side of the world that we didn't even elect. A treaty republic will force us to tell the truth about our history and move us towards real action to right the wrongs that started with colonisation, creating a nation we can all be proud of and that would bring us together and give everyone in this country something to celebrate. The rights and responsibilities I've spoken about have been spoken time and time again in this chamber. And it comes from the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, which this parliament supported earlier this year. We could use this moment and momentum to empower our country to democratically elect our own leader, someone who represents all of us, uniting a country that has owned up to its past and chosen its own future. That unity would be more powerful than any king. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, and I'd like to uh, present a voice, a youth voice in Parliament uh, this week for the uh, champions of the voices of young Australians by giving them a voice in Parliament and, uh, and online. Uh, what do I want our new Parliament to uh, accomplish? And of course, this is a speech by Andre Dobin from South Australia as part of uh, Youth uh, Voice in Parliament Week. What do, we, do, what do I want our new parliament to accomplish? He says, I want uh, the Australian parliament to strive to better serve its constituents rather than forging its political gain. I want an Australian parliament that is productive and makes laws which make sense and actually help ordinary Australians. Not just wealthy, not just the wealthy or big corporations. I want an Australian parliament that when all is said and done, that in 20 years they will know that they did, uh, did enough to take action to stop the climate crisis. I want an Australian parliament that embodies, uh, that says, saying equality under the law in full, and, active, uh, and actively support all measures to improve fairness and justice in our society. I want an Australian parliament whose members take responsibility for their actions and decisions. And I hope for an Australian parliament that is a place of kindness towards each other. And a parliament which does its hardest to find the common ground in disagreements. Because there are many more things that unite us than divides us. An Australian parliament that truly represents Australia's interests and Australian people's voices. That is what our new parliament should accomplish. Fairness, unity, action, responsibility, hard work and kindness. Senator Macdonald. Thank you very much. And I too rise to read a submission to Youth Voice in Parliament Week. Uh, Youth Voice in Parliament is uh, this week, the 21st to the 24th of November, and uh, it is an opportunity for young people to submit the words that they wish could be read. And so I am absolutely delighted to uh, rise to read a speech from students of Cannonvale State School in the Whit Sundays, North Queensland. And I chose this submission 
because these students are not only from my home region, but because I think they've also captured the current mood of the entire nation. Ready? To whom it may concern. We are four year six girls writing to you from Cannonvale State School, Queensland. Our names are Charlie, Abby, Meg and Kiara. And we are concerned about the price of living in Australia. More and more people are in poverty and are homeless due to this matter. Firstly, housing. Houses are much more expensive to rent or buy this year as they still remain 23.3 per cent higher than the pre-pandemic stage in 2020. Secondly, petrol. Fuel prices have immensely risen over the past year. For what started not that long ago, it has surely made an impact on Australian lives. And thirdly, food prices. Food prices have arisen 11.4 per cent since August 2021 compared to August 2022. How can we solve this? Well, nobody really has an answer. However, a House of Representatives that holds 151 people should call it, should, can surely come up with an answer to this massive problem. Every kid this age dreams about moving out when they're older. So let's make that dream possible so that they can afford to. Every problem has a solution that's clear, simple and wrong. H.L. Mechon. I absolutely commend these girls for making their opinions known to us here and who can do something about it. I also commend to them that they consider not just the 101 151 members of the House of Representatives, but the 76 senators who work here in this Red Chamber. I would also like to focus on the quote they used in the last sentence, because I think it applies to the federal government's approach to helping Australians with costs of living. This quote means that the easiest solution usually isn't the best. And unfortunately, under Labor, we are seeing this in spades because Labor's simple but wrong solution to everything is to regulate and tax. Elementary level economics dictates that in a country facing an energy shortage and skyrocketing power prices, bringing more supply onto the market would bring prices down. But instead, Labor wants to regulate gas companies bringing gas to market. By encouraging more gas projects, there's enough gas for companies to export to high demand markets, maintain profits for their shareholders and enough to supply domestic users at a reasonable price. And let's not forget power prices influence on cost of living. Before the election, the Prime Minister said 97 times that our power bills would come down by $275. Instead, we're now told to expect power bills to be about 50 per cent higher in the coming two years. <coughs> Under this cavalier rush to make us pay for two power generation systems, families will be forced to classify electricity as a luxury they can sometimes afford rather than as treated as a reliable necessity, having to choose between heating and eating. And household food budgets will also be under pressure because Labor have signed Australia up to an international methane pledge that offers no details on how reductions will be achieved or how they will be measured. It will be especially tough if employers cut people's hours because the businesses can't afford the power bill and because industry-wide strike action has slashed profit margins. So thank you again, Charlie, Abby, Meg and Kiara, for your letter. I share your concern, and so do millions of people around Australia as they watch their bank balances dwindle. The cost of living is possibly the greatest challenge facing our nation but there is hope, so thank you. Thank you, Senator MacDonald. The Senate stands adjourned.